Good morning. If you're outside in the hall, get in here. Hello, everybody. Thank you, thank you. My name is Kathy Druin, and I'm one of a trio of lead organizers. Erin Campbell and Kate DeRosha are both organizers, and I can hear myself getting quiet. Is my volume where it needs to be for you guys? Because I can yell. Okay. On behalf of the organizing team, I welcome you. It's been a while. It's been a while. It is a heartfelt pleasure to invite you back after a hundred years. <laughs> Got a lot of things to run through this morning so I can get on and off the stage. How many of you are attending your first word camp ever? Oh my gosh, woo! We applaud you and welcome you. Everybody has something to give, no matter what your level of WordPress experience is. For you first timers, you're in for a ride. <laughs> Unless I forget to say so, there are lots of people tuning in from their couch their remote office, or wherever they may be through live stream. We welcome you as well. We got some housekeeping stuff, but I want to call your attention to our platinum level sponsors, Bluehost, Google, Jetpack, and WP Engine. If you have not already done so, please make your way to the sponsor hall throughout the event without their generous support of time, money, and just general camaraderie and support of the community. This event would not be possible. Please, they have swag and goodies for you, but I want you to shake their hands and get to know them and thank them for what they do for our community, okay? So, oh, one of the important things I need to tell you when we're talking about community is that not only do we welcome everybody, we support you. If you find yourself in an uncomfortable situation, we invite you to find one of the organizers or someone wearing a teal colored shirt. Our volunteers are wearing too. Thank you. I knew I faded away, but I didn't know why. And I thought they were just controlling me, which is a hard thing to do. Okay, so if you are in an uncomfortable situation and you want to tell somebody discreetly, find anybody who is wearing an organizer lanyard and we will speak with you and listen to you and address your concerns. If you don't find any of us with a badge handy, find somebody wearing a teal t-shirt. Lots of people are wearing teal today, I've noticed. Look for the ones who have the logo on their shirt, okay? Um, we, we have time and support for you. Um, I have scribbled all over this piece of paper that was written for me before it started raining in California, <laughs> which I was told never happens. Okay. Our lunch set up today will be exactly where we were with our coffee, out here in what's referred to as the town and country foyer. Okay. Now that you all kind of know where that is, that's where it is. Um, on paper, it says we were going to have a group photo this afternoon. Uh, we can't fly drones in rain. Stay tuned. 
Okay. We'll, we may do that and we may not. Wi-Fi in conferences stinks. It just does. It's a fact of life. Uh, you'll have to find a way to live with it. Um, please don't tell us more than once. <laughs> but with that said, if you don't know already, you want to connect to the network, which is WordCamp US. The password is open source, capitalize z zero. Use the O, capital O, and a capital S. It's on signs all over the place. Okay. Um, what else do I have? We have a after party planned. Stay tuned for more details. It's also planned outdoors. But not today, okay? But we'll talk about, more about that later. Oh, uh, I already talked about that. Oh, you will notice, as I look around the room, we have a mask policy. We put reminders up. We have people who will work the rooms, so to speak. So if you're one of those people, I'm cheating because I'm up here. If you're one of those people who pulls the mask down under your nose, someone will politely remind you that you need to have it on. Um, we'll remind you a couple of times. And then we'll remind you very strongly. We want this to be a very safe environment for everyone as much as possible, as much as we can control. Things are outside of our control. Any questions about that? See me. Uh, by default, the registration desk becomes the keeper of all things lost and found. So, and that's a long registration counter. Scoot down to the end that doesn't have one of the ticket printers sitting on top of it, and somebody will be there to help you with that. If you find something, that's where you turn it in. If you lost something, that's where you go look. The registration desk is a keeper of lots of things. How many of you are driving in and out but parking on the property? You're not staying at the hotel. Okay, for those people who are traveling in and parking, go to the registration desk and get a parking pass. Okay? I just did all of this out of order. Um, I'm known for talking off the cuff. I've seen a lot of people ask where rooms are. Um, we tried to do a good job with the maps, but we are continually shifting things around. If you get confused, the sessions are the easiest thing to find. We are in the sun room, okay? And because you all came in from the coffee area, you came in the back door. If I walked out here, you would be in the main lobby for registration, okay? Um, out here on that side is, no, we're not in the sunroom. We're in the palm room, right? Where, where am I? Or is it the other way around? Yeah. Yeah, because right out here over the door, it says Sun Track Sessions. You tell, I have to look at it to remember it. You might be like that, okay? Over here on that side, there is a big decal over that door that tells you that that's Palm. Uh, if you're attending a workshop, you need better directions than I can give you from the stage. Um, but because you go outside and down a hallway. But just find a shirt, a teal shirt, and we'll get you there. Um, inside the sponsor hall, if you walk through the door and look to the right, you will st see a stack of T-shirts. I don't see Tiffany in here, but they're red, and you'll know you're in the right place because it's a huge stack of red t-shirts. And I already did that. 
It says a final thank you to all of our wonderful, wonderful sponsors. More importantly, I thank each and every one of you for making the investment in yourself and in our community. Have a wonderful day. Thank you. Test. Okay, we got a few seconds. Good morning, everybody. If you're here for the sun track, then you're in the right place. As everybody trickles out, we will start with announcements. Well, she did announcements, Kathy, but I'm going to introduce our first speaker, who is Nathan Ingram. We do have a couple of announcements before we get started, which Kathy did a lot of this. Uh, we're thanking our sponsors as usual because without their generous contribution, we, this event would not be possible. So do visit the sponsor hall because it is wonderful. You get lots of awesome swag. And tonight, I'm not sure if we talked about it, but no, she did. Yeah, a lot of those announcements Kathy already said. This is, we're just going to wing it then. Um, don't forget to get your shirts like she just said. And then just do remember to use WCUS when you do a hashtag because that is our official hashtag of the event. And actually post photos and share and do use the hashtag because we're going to make an official collaborative photo album and there will be signs all around the space with a QR code that you can then follow and contribute to the photo album. And then a reminder that Contributor Day is Sunday and if you have any questions, find the organizers in the teal shirts and they can help you out. So, Forgive my voice because I um, love to talk. If anybody knows me, by the end of this camp, I will have no voice. But we are going to get started with our first speaker, who is Nathan, Nathan Ingram. Uh, his session is Taming the Whirlwind, Growing Your WordPress Business While You're Busy with Client Work. And we're going to talk a little bit about Nathan. Oh, you can hear me, right? There we go. Nathan is the host at iThemes Training, where he teaches WordPress and business development, this keeps going out, he teaches business development topics via live webinar, 
He is also the creator of Monster Contracts, proven contracts for WordPress client work. As the founder of Advanced Coaching, Nathan is a growth coach for WordPress business owners individually and in groups, helping them become more successful in their businesses. Nathan has been working with clients to build websites since 1995. He is based in Birmingham, Alabama, where he has been an organizer for WordCamp Birmingham, WP All, for several years. So everybody give it up for Nathan. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Hey, WordCamp's back, y'all. Isn't that great? It's awesome. All right, so uh, gosh, it's great to be back uh, in front of people at WordCamp. Good grief, it's been like years, it seems like, because you know, it has. Uh, and one of the things that uh, I enjoy about WordCamp is seeing faces, meeting people, and listening to other people who do WordPress stuff with clients. How many of uh, that's you? You do some WordPress stuff with clients. Yeah, okay. So I've been doing coaching for WordPress business owners, uh, and I do a lot of client work still to this day. Uh, and in all those coaching conversations, one of the things that I've learned is that we're not alone. Uh, we all face a set of common challenges. Now, sometimes the details are different, but the problems are the same. And so it's, it's often like you come into a meeting like this where you know, you're around people that do what you do, and uh, you might think, like, I'm the only one that has these struggles. I promise you, you're not. There are very few unique issues. We're gonna talk about one of those issues today that we all share as a common challenge. How many, of this, uh, how many of you this resonates with you? Uh, this is me after WordCamp US. I have found 287 ideas of things that I wanna do. And I have written all of them down. And I will do all of them by the end of the year. Does that sound familiar? Yeah, okay, and then in November, oh, I find that page full of ideas. Right? Oh, oh yeah, those are awesome ideas I had after WordCamp US, and I will do all of them as soon as I finish this project. And then January comes around, and I found that page of ideas again, right? Oh, these were such great ideas, and I'm going to do all of them, you know, someday. Does anybody else do that, or is it just me? Yeah, okay. So this is the struggle that we face. It's a common struggle, and putting some terminology to it helps. It's the struggle between strategy and execution. Strategy uh, is the things that we do that are working on our business, wh whereas execution are the things we do working in our business. Let me explain that difference. Strategy are the things you do that are growing your business, building products, uh, building systems and processes in your business, doing the big picture things that are going to help to grow uh, your agency. Uh, working in the business is actually answering client questions, building websites, managing websites, uh, and answering trouble tickets, all those things we do just in the business, doing the work of the business. Now, what I've realized is strategy for most of us is hard, whereas execution is more natural. Like we're good at doing the thing, like we're good at doing the work. That's why we started into this thing to begin with. But for many of us, the strategy piece is hard. It doesn't come naturally, it's a skill that we have to learn. So why is it so hard for us to keep strategy in focus when we're busy with all this work that our clients are asking us to do? I mean, it's a good problem to have, right? Like it's good to have all this work that's coming in but why is it that it's so hard to keep this other important piece of our business, the strategy, why is it so hard to keep that in focus? So that's what we're gonna spend the next 30 minutes or so on today, and here's an overview of where we're heading. First, we're gonna unpack this problem a little bit more. Then we're gonna develop a strategy uh, to deal with this problem, and then I'm gonna give you some suggestions for success, all of which come from me making mistakes doing this the wrong way over the years. So hopefully if I can save you any of those same mistakes, we can do that. So, to start off, we need to really understand this problem and why it is that we struggle the way we do. Why is it that it's so hard to keep strategy in focus? Uh, you know, what are you gonna do with all the things you learned this weekend at WordCamp US uh, and all the, the ideas that you have? Uh, what is gonna happen when you get home? Are you gonna have great ideas that never get implemented? Uh, the, the reason those things happen is because of this right here, and it is the whirlwind. 
The whirlwind is our, uh, is our biggest obstacle, and it's the reason why strategy is so hard to continue to do on a regular basis. So let's do a little bit of understanding and unpack this concept of whirlwind and see why it's so important for us to really uh, get a handle on this. The whirlwind is the energy and attention that is needed to run our businesses. The whirlwind is the 14 emails from clients that you find in your inbox when you hit the desk in the morning, all with demands for things that need to be done by noon. The whirlwind is the customer call that happens right as you were about to start working on your own website for a change. Does that sound familiar? Uh, the, the whirlwind is that one hour meeting with a client that turns into three and it takes up half your day. You come to your desk in the morning with the best of intentions. It's like it's finally going to be a day where I get to work on my stuff for a change. And then it lasts like 10 minutes because we made the mistake of opening our email and there's all this stuff sitting there that we have to do, right? I'll tell you, I've spent hours and hours watching courses online, sitting through webinars, going to events like this, reading books, reading articles, all full of excellent things, great ideas that would genuinely help my business. And often I've never implemented any of them at all. They made no practical impact in my world at all. And it wasn't the author's fault. It wasn't the presenter's fault. It wasn't the course instructor's fault. It's just because when I got back to the real world, what's waiting there? All the emails, all the phone calls, all the client demands. And I would always push off my strategy work because there was more of cl more of this client work to do. Or maybe, just maybe, um, I found this new piece of technology that caught my interest and I went down a rabbit hole for a whole day, right? And I lost a whole day unpacking this shiny new piece of technology. I'm sure that doesn't happen to any of you, but that does happen to me. Uh, and I just wasted a whole day doing something that really, I mean, it was fun, but it really didn't move the yardsticks for my business. Uh, so here's the issue. Strategy is important. We agree on that, right? Strategy is important for our businesses. Strategy is important but the whirlwind, the whirlwind is urgent. Franklin Covey Company said, when urgency and importance clash, urgency wins every time. And doesn't it? It does. Urgency wins every time. So what do we do? We have a choice to do strategy or urgent client work. We're always, inevitably it seems, going to choose the client work. And as, as far as our own strategy and our own goals, we'll get to it when? Never. I mean, that's, on, I mean, that's honest, right? We'll get to it. We tell ourselves, though, we get to it tomorrow. It'll be better next week. It'll be better after I get through this big project that's on our plate, right? It all, it's, we kick the can down the road. Now, here's the problem with that. Delaying strategy doesn't work because the whirlwind never goes away. And this seems to be the lesson that we struggle to learn. We say, we're going to work on this idea later. We're going to put these practices into, uh, into our world later. After I finish this, I'll get to it next week. Things will be better next month. But we forget this one very important fact. And that is, if we push this work off to next week, guess what is also going to be present next week? The whirlwind, right? As a matter of fact, if it's not present next week, if we don't have the whirlwind next week, we're in trouble because the whirlwind is our business. And if there's no business, there's no need to do strategy for it, right? So the whirlwind never goes away. And as a matter of fact, the whirlwind isn't a bad thing. It's just a fact of life of being in business. The whirlwind is your work. If there was no whirlwind, you'd be in, you'd be in a lot of trouble. The whirlwind isn't bad, it just is what it is. It's a fact of life. So when we tell ourselves, I'll get to the strategy when things settle down, we're fooling ourselves. I hope, it's because if things settle down, we got a problem. So we need to figure out how to get our strategy work done, how to grow our business in the middle of acknowledging the fact that we're always going to be busy to some degree. So this is the strategy that I call taming the whirlwind. Now that we've identified what we're up against, <clears throat> we need to figure out a plan to deal with it. And that plan needs to end up with this. We need to figure out how am I going to accomplish my goals in the middle of the whirlwind. <clears throat> if you're a business owner, we're going to make, <clears throat> pardon me, 
If you're a business owner, we're going to make the assumption that you're a smart person. I mean, you don't get into business unless you have some degree of, you know, intelligence and knowledge and even discipline to be in the position of having a business. Your challenge is probably not accomplishing your goals per se. It's accomplishing your goals with the reality of the whirlwind in the middle of your world. Now, we need a plan because without a plan, the whirlwind always wins. It just does. When strategy and execution clash, when urgency and importance clash, urgency wins every time. And we've seen this happen in our world, haven't we? It's why we struggle. So here's the plan. Uh, it's really simple when I put it up here. It's harder to execute. But it's a simple plan that will help us get our goals moving forward even when we're busy. <clears throat> it starts with a quarterly goal setting meeting. Thank you very much, Ryan. I appreciate that. Get all choked up. Back talking in front of a word camp. It's awesome. It's going to start out with a quarterly goal set, uh, session. We're going to uh, come to, we're going to have a meeting with ourselves basically, and we're going to do goal setting every quarter. That's going to be followed up by a weekly planning meeting I'm going to have with myself every week, and then a little bit of time every week that I'm going to spend executing on my goals. Now, you can start with this very small just to get it gradually worked into your world. But you can, as you build momentum in this, you're going to find that it becomes easier and easier to find more time to execute strategy. Now, if you want to do a little more of a deep dive into some of the foundational ideas for this, get this book. If you haven't seen this one yet, it's a great one, The 12-Week Year by Brian Moran. Highly recommended. Uh, good foundational principles. If you're a reader, you like business books, this is one you should read. So let's talk a little bit about quarterly goal setting and what that looks like. What I recommend for everybody is that you spend at least two hours unplugged. That means no screens. That means old-fashioned pen, pencil, and paper. Two hours unplugged, scheduled on your calendar as an appointment. By the way, I'm going to have a QR code in just a little bit that's going to give you this whole deck as well as some uh, goal worksheets. And if you know, you're welcome to screenshot the screen, of course, but you can download the whole deck in just a minute. So it's going to start with this two-hour strategy session the first time or two until you get used to doing this. It might take you four. So what I recommend to people is just schedule an afternoon or schedule a morning, whenever you work best, to find some time to do what I'm going to suggest. Put it on your calendar as an appointment. Go someplace where you personally can most easily concentrate. For some of us, that means we need to be in a very quiet setting. For others, it means I gotta be like in a coffee shop where there's stuff going on and that like really sparks my creativity and whatever. However you're wired and whatever works best for you, just go to that spot where you can focus and do some good work by yourself. Get a notebook and a pen or pencil if you have commitment issues and focus your thoughts. Take time to let the whirlwind calm down in your brain. Make a list of things you need to do and get it on paper. Now, these are our two goals in that two-hour meeting. It's two hours, maybe four at the beginning or three, but two hours, two tasks. The two tasks in my quarterly planning session with myself are I'm going to identify the issues that I need to deal with in my business, and I'm going to plan action items to start to deal with those things. It's simple, right? Two hours, two tasks, identify the issues, plan action items. Now, here's what that looks like. I need to ask myself the hard question, what are the changes that I need to make in my business? Now, they're probably swimming around in your head right now. If you're in business and you're doing WordPress stuff, if it, at any level, in any way, you probably know of a handful of things that you ought to be doing right now that would improve your business. You probably got that. But if you stop and pull away and let the whirlwind die down in your head a little bit, you'll realize that some more things start surfacing. And the idea here is, let's just get them all on paper. Write them down. And please, please use paper and pencil or pen writing them down. There, there's something, people with letters after their last name will tell you there's something about writing things down that helps. Also, if you try to do this on a screen, guess what lives behind every screen? The whirlwind, right? And if you're like me in, in any way, and you've got a screen where there are notifications, and I'm trying to focus and ding, that notification comes in, or bloop, a little bubble pops in on my email. I, ha I am compelled like Pavlov's dog to open that app and clear that notification. Am I right? Yeah, so just leave, I try to leave my phone in the car and not even take my phone when I'm doing this sort of thing. So what are the changes I need to make? Uh, 
and then I'm going to rank those in a rough order of like, what are the top two things that are going to bring the most immediate impact to my business? This is where I need to be brutally honest with myself. And if this is a struggle and you have a team, bring your, maybe, you know, get a list down and then bounce it off some people. If you're really having trouble narrowing it down to two, get somebody that knows you and can call you on your BS to look at your list and help you realize, you know, what is really the most important thing that I need to be doing here? Uh, and here's the thing. Pick the ones that bring immediate impact because whenever you're trying to start to develop a habit, momentum helps. Find the things that bring immediate impact because when you see those things happening, your business starts to change, uh, that's going to give you momentum to carry forward with the strategy. It's really important to help to build those habits. So the other thing I want to say before I advance the slides is these top two things that you identify in this meeting with yourself, two hours, two things, identify the top two things here. The two things that you identify, at least one of them is probably going to be something that you don't enjoy doing. Because if you enjoyed doing it, you would have done it already, right? So it, just be prepared that it's probably going to be something that you don't enjoy and just that's okay. It's something that's going to bring immediate impact and we're going to push through and we're going to do this. Now, I've, I have a tool that can help with this. There's the QR code if you want to zap that. That'll give you the whole deck and at the end of the deck, there are four printables. Two of them are blank. There's two, two separate worksheets. There's a blank version of each one, and there's an example uh, that's filled in so you can see how this works. For the sake of time today, does anybody know when I'm done? Raquel, what time are we done here? To... Yeah, so for the sake of time today, I'm not going to actually pull these sheets up on the screen, but uh, you, the, the examples are there. They're really cl they're plain. It's a smart goal generator is what that's called. And uh, my contact information is there. If you have questions, just reach out to me. I'll be here all weekend as well. So grab that. Those are tools. You don't have to use those. It's literally, it's boxes on a piece of paper, okay? There's nothing magic about this. It is, however, helpful as a brainstorming canvas to get your goals articulated well. Uh, all right, so quarterly planning session. Two hours, two goals. Identify my issues and pick my top two. When I break my top two goals down, I'm gonna break, uh, when I identify my top two goals, I'm gonna break those down into action items. They're gonna take me roughly two to four hours to complete. There's a reason for that, but that's part of this quarterly planning session. Okay, I've got my thing that I'm gonna do. I'm gonna get, I'm gonna finally move away from this one accounting platform that's holding me back and I'm gonna move into a different one where I can automate more and do things. Like that's just, for example, a goal. Now, how am I gonna do that? I'm gonna break that down into tangible action items, each of which is gonna take two to four hours to complete, all right? So that's the end of my quarterly planning session. I'm gonna leave that planning time with myself with my two goals broken down into action items. Does that make sense? This is not, it's pretty easy to understand. A little harder to execute, but once you get used to it, you get momentum, it starts to help. All right, so the next part of the strategy is my weekly planning meeting with myself. Generally, this takes me about a half an hour. It might take you a little longer the first time you do this, but about a half an hour every week. Now, what do I do during this time? Uh, I'm going to figure out what in the world I'm doing this week and kind of get that all squared away. But I'm going to find some time this week where I can block a time on my calendar so nobody else can schedule it on my calendar with a reminder or two or perhaps three where it's a two to four hour block where I'm going to execute on at least one of those action items that are part of my, that I identified during my quarterly goal planning. This is the place Inevitably, when I have conversations with people that maybe they heard this talk at a WordCamp one time and the next time I see them, they're like, you know, I tried this and I had this trouble. Or if I'm coaching someone, this is where the wheels fall off, okay? They're like, I had my quarterly planning session. I made my action items, but I could never seem to get them done. And my question is, did you have a weekly planning meeting? Because if you don't put it on the calendar, it's never going to get done. It, you just kick it down the road. That's how it works. That, it's human nature. Strategy versus execution, right? So every week, 30 minutes, for me it's on Sunday evenings usually. Sunday night after the house kind of quiets down, my kids are doing their thing. I look at my week, I open the calendar, I plan everything, and I, you know, I, I make sure I have that block of time scheduled where nobody else can get to it. And this is critical. It has to happen before you start the week. If you try to do this before the week, uh, after the week starts, it very, very rarely works. 
So I encourage people, and maybe this is something you do on a Friday afternoon to plan for the week ahead. Or for me, it's a Sunday evening. Or maybe early Monday morning, like you're having your coffee before you get to your desk. Do it then. But before you get to wherever it is that you work, make sure you have a plan. Because if you hit the desk on Monday morning without a plan, the whirlwind always wins. Always. It's, it's just inevitable. So the other part of this planning it's getting uh, that time scheduled on the calendar with a reminder so nobody else can have that time. It's also making sure all of the resources that I need to execute on that goal are put together. So I don't want to spend the first 45 minutes of my two-hour execution time every week trying to find where all the things are to make this, you know, to do this work. Part of my planning is making sure I've got all my links and all the stuff is in a folder in a desktop or whatever and just get it all together. So as soon as I have my time to do goal execution, I can just pop things open and start to work. Turn off the phone, turn off the notifications, go on focus and silent and just do the work head down. Does that make sense? All right. We have to do this every week because without a plan, the whirlwind always wins. Now here's how this might look for those of you that are more visual. This is a very simple way, uh, and I used to, for years, it's a little different now, but for years, especially when I was a solo, this is how I planned my week. Now, I know this is brilliant, but I had this great idea of, I'm going to break my day up into three parts. Isn't that brilliant? Morning, afternoon, and evening. That's original right there is what that is. Uh, but like, if it's not simple, it just doesn't work long term in my world. For what it, maybe it's just a defect in me. I don't know. But if it's not simple, it doesn't work long term for me. So uh, I look at my day in terms of three blocks. And for me, family is a priority. Family is always, well, unless there's certain circumstances, which I'll explain in a minute, family typically gets one of these blocks a day. And so my planning might look something like this. So we're going to give space to the whirlwind, like Monday. Uh, Monday morning, you know, the whirlwind grows over the weekend for whatever reason. There's tickets and things that happen over the weekend. And, you know, Monday is a whirlwind day. So this week, whatever week this is, Monday morning and Monday afternoon, I've just been working on whirlwind stuff, dealing with clients, answering emails, doing tickets, whatever that happens to be. In the evening, it's family time, right? Tuesday. Uh, in the morning, whirlwind, knock all that stuff out. In the afternoon, I'm going to be head down in the cave working on a client project. And it lives in that four-hour space. Family night. Wednesday morning, same thing. Oh, look, Thursday morning. This, was a spe this happened a lot when my kids were little. Uh, and so one of the great benefits of owning your own business is you get to be your own boss and set your own schedule, set your own priorities. You don't have somebody else doing that for you. And for me, it's like if my kids are having something at the school that morning and I want to be a part, I'm going to go do that, right? So in this sample week, on Thursday morning, say my daughter had some program at school, I'm going to go do that, I'm going to hang out with her, I'm going to have lunch, and I'm going to go home and get back to work, right? So Thursday morning, it's family time. But look, that night I'm going to work, right? Like I moved the family block up there, but then I'm going to you know, fix that by working later that night. So whirlwind stuff when I get back to the office, focused on projects. And now, in this week, I'm very ambitious. I'm actually planning two four-hour blocks for strategy. One Friday morning and one Friday afternoon. I might get a bunch of stuff done. Some weeks, that might be whirlwind in the morning or project in the morning, strategy in the afternoon, or vice versa. But see how that works? It's simple. You know, it's, it's never actually going to work out like this, but this gives you a good framework to start to process how I'm going to spend my time in different blocks. And if you'll start the week with a plan like this, it's really going to help because the whirlwind can be contained with good productivity habits. You can contain the whirlwind if you're deliberate about your time. So for example, one of the first ways that people get off track on this is that if they have a, a, a time in the morning set aside to work on a project, what's the first thing we do when we hit our desk in the morning? Open mail. And guess what? It's all downhill from there. <laughs> The whirlwind lives in your inbox, doesn't it? Uh, this is also a reason I'm not a fan of productivity apps where the calendar and the inbox are in the same software app because I need to have my calendar without being distracted by my email because, again, it may, this may be a personal defect in me, but if I've got a number on that inbox I can see, I'm just drawn. like It's just like a magnet. I'm drawn to open that up and start getting into it, and then my brain is off somewhere else, and I can't focus. I just, you know, Calls and emails for me twice a day. Uh, I look at the email sometime mid-morning and then another time early to mid-afternoon. Uh, and you can contain the whirlwind having habits like that. 
All right, so this is our weekly execution uh, time. We're going we're gonna to plan this on the calendar, two to four hours. The reason I say that, and this is why, by the way, I suggested you break up that goal into two to four hour action items so you could plan it this way. Uh, find that two to four hour block every week where you can execute on your goal. Now, schedule the time, don't compromise it. Maybe if it's a real, like genuine emergency, and there are really typically very few of those. Now, the difficult part of this is not compromising the time. Like say you've got your execution time planned on the calendar and it's, let's just say, uh, it's gonna be a Thursday afternoon this week. And this is the time where I've got set aside for me, I'm gonna go to a coffee shop, I'm gonna plan and work and do some things in my business. And I have a client that calls, oh, hey, can you meet with me Tuesday at one or Thursday at 1.30? This is where the battle happens. Am I gonna compromise my time that I've planned for strategy in my business and executing on that goal, or am I gonna have this client call? And oftentimes it's not nearly as hard as we make it in our heads. Sometimes though, what I've learned is, it's easier to do the client work that we know we can accomplish than it is to do the strategy work that's difficult. It's, and we tend to avoid that work. So we take the client work and we pat ourselves on the back for good customer service and we end up hurting our business in the long run. So when that client calls, you know, gosh, I'm sorry, I already have a meeting scheduled Thursday afternoon. Can we try Friday morning? I mean, I have a meeting, it's with myself, it's on my calendar. It's honestly though, it's the most important meeting I have that week. You know, for, especially for those of us that are focused on good customer service, it's really easy for us not to give our business the attention that it needs in lieu of saying I'm providing great customer service by always being available for my clients. But guess what? If you go out of business, your customer service is going to stink. How many rescue sites, if you work in the WordPress space, how many rescue sites have you inherited because the developer, poof, disappeared? I wonder why. Probably because they didn't build recurring revenue and they didn't do a strategy work in their business and they got tired of all the hassle and they just went to work for somebody else. And the client gets left holding the bag. You do your clients a better job. You, you, your clients are better served if you have a healthy business. And healthy business comes from regular strategy. Okay, so we've had our quarterly goal planning session. Uh, we have uh, done our weekly planning and we've got our weekly execution time uh, set up here. Now, what do we do at the end of this? We just repeat the process. Every quarter I go in another four hours, half a day, whatever. So for those of you that are visual, I'm gonna break it down like this, sort of a little bit of a flow chart here. I start out with my quarterly planning meeting, two, you know, two to four hours away. It's good if you can do an afternoon or a whole morning, that's great. Uh, and I'm going to identify two goals, and I'm gonna break those goals into action items that are two to four hours a piece, right? So this is what I come away with from my quarterly planning session. Every week, I'm going to have that meeting with myself for half an hour where I'm going to find two hours that week and I'm going to pull that first action item down here and I'm going to put it on my calendar and then I'm going to do the work and execute on that action. The next week, I'm going to have a weekly meeting with myself. I'm going to pull that next goal down there and I'm going to put it on my calendar with a reminder and blocked out and I'm going to execute on that goal. And I just do that week after week after week after week until my goals are accomplished. Does that make sense? It's not hard to understand. The hard part is when you are challenged on whether or not you're gonna compromise that execution time every week. That's where the real battle is. All right, so let me wrap it up with a couple of final suggestions. Again, all these come from me making these mistakes, so don't do what I do. The first suggestion is this. We gotta prioritize. You will always, always, always have more goals than you have time. You just will. That's the way it is. That's why it's critical that we are brutally honest with ourselves and we pick the two things that are going to make the most immediate impact in our business. So if, you're, if you've got a whole bunch of stuff at WordCamp US that you're learning, pick the top two and choose those as your focus. Put the rest on a sheet of paper or in some software app, wherever it's going to live, and keep them. But you've got to pick two. If you try to do more than that, you're going to have trouble. I'm going to talk about that in just a minute. We gotta focus on those things that build the most immediate impact. The reason we don't wanna do more than two is this. This is another study from Franklin Covey, the productivity gurus. They did some study in corporate America where they, they looked at teams and individuals 
And if that team or individual had uh, a certain number of goals in addition to the whirlwind of daily work, here's what they found. If you have two to three goals and still have to do whirlwind work, you will execute with excellence two to three goals. If you try to do four to 10 goals, you will execute with excellence one to two of those goals. If you have more than 10, first of all, God help you, and then also you will execute zero. But I mean, think about this. It's like eating a pizza, right? If you want to eat a pizza, you eat it one slice at a time. If you try to take a bite all the way around that pizza until it's done, it's going to take you forever and it's going to be nasty by the time you get to the end, right? It just, it, we, ha we focus better. It's the law of diminishing returns. So don't try to pick more than two goals generally, and you'll execute those with excellence if you focus on them. Now here's the downside of priorities, and this is a struggle for many of us. You'll always have more goals than time, so that means that sometimes good ideas have to be put on a shelf. Come back to them, give them a place to live. We don't want to forget about those, but that great idea is not the thing that's going to bring the most immediate impact to my business. So I have to be disciplined, set those ideas aside, and know that there'll be a place for that to live later. Okay, second suggestion is this. Separate your roles this is especially critical if you are a solo. Uh, if you have a small agency, your team is very small, you'll still have this happening. Most of us that are founders, solo, small agency, that sort of thing, we wear two hats. We have a CEO hat and we have an employee hat. We have a CEO hat, the one that makes a decision, sets the course, you know, sets the priorities, vision, mission, all those things. And we have the employee part of us that actually does the work, right? Even in a small agency, if you're the leader of a small agency, you're still probably doing some of that work yourself. So we have to separate our roles in one way or another. The CEO makes the plan, the employee executes the plan. And we have to keep those things separate. And we have to give space in our world for both of those roles to live correctly. That's why I suggest just the very practical outworking of this is don't do CEO work at your employee desk. This is such a simple thing, but it, there's this magic that happens. Like if I'm doing planning and, and for my business, I do not do it at the desk where I'm doing the work, the client work. Just don't do it. I go somewhere else. I mean, you might actually make a hat. I don't know. Whatever works for you. It just, it's a mindset change of getting outside of the employee-type work going someplace else as the CEO. Uh, I had a person I was coaching that did this sort of work at her kitchen table when she was the CEO because she had a nice view, and that's you know, the way it was. Uh, it, but just not in the same physical location. You will be shocked at the headspace that opens up for you. For me, I always did it at a Starbucks around the corner from my house. Last of all is, uh, or actually third of all, is consider a sprint week. For those of us doing client work, especially if you're building websites, uh, a lot of you know, the work is like this, right? Up and down, up and down. Sometimes you're busy, sometimes you're not. It's feast or famine. That's normal. So when the times are, you know, when we have less work and one of those dips, we're, we had one of those this summer where it, was a, it slowed down for a little bit, uh, maybe consider sprint work where you take, for example, in a week, the whole morning, I'm just going to do a sprint, and I'm going to spend every morning of that week working on this thing for my business that's going to make it better. So taking, you know, you could execute a whole goal or two in a week like this, where I'm not even checking email until noon. I'm not even going to look at it, right? Give the, let the afternoons have a place for the whirlwind to live, but always leave room for the whirlwind. But something like this could work too. You have to experiment and find out what's going to work best for you. Now, we're down to just 10 minutes, so I'm going to finish this up really quickly, and we'll take questions. The fourth suggestion is this one, and it's maybe the most important one. Taming the whirlwind is a discipline that takes time. So give yourself a break. We've been doing things probably, for most of us, the wrong way for a long time. And uh, G.K. Chesterton or somebody, this is one of those quotes you Google and everybody, you know, Abraham Lincoln said it maybe or Mark Twain, who knows. It's, there's truth here, though. Anything worth doing is worth doing badly at first. If it's worth doing, it's worth doing badly at first. If I do it badly this week, no problem. There's next week. I'll get it better next week. And we'll get better and better at this until we lock these habits into our business. It takes time to undo old habits. So give yourself a break, but keep working the strategy. Does that make sense? Look, the whirlwind never goes away. It's always going to be there. And when urgency and importance clash, urgency wins every time. So we have to find a strategy to accomplish our goals in the middle of the whirlwind. Now, here's the piece I want to leave you with. If you did this, 
If you took this strategy away and you started having a quarterly time and a weekly planning time and weekly execution time, how different would your business look in six months from now? In six months, how would your business change if you did this? And consequently, in six months, how would your life change if you did this? How much stress would be removed? What could you focus on that really matters if you put these things into practice? See, ultimately, taming the whirlwind is about creating margin for what matters in life. Because I started putting these principles into practice years ago when my oldest daughter, who has a medical condition, uh, needed me to take her to therapy once a week, I was able to say, you know what? Thursday mornings every week, I can set this time aside and take you to your appointment and be there with you. I can do that. Like, I can invest that time. I was able to give the margin that was needed. This is real stuff, y'all. Like, this creates margin that can improve your life and the lives of others around you. It can help your family. You can have time for hobbies. You can take a real vacation, spend time in reflection, building strategy for your business, doing processes. It's all about margin. But you can't do that if the whirlwind is eating your lunch every day. Thanks, everybody. My name is Nathan Ingram. I'm a growth coach for WordPress business owners. There's the QR code once again. I think we have like five minutes for questions. Thanks, Nathan. Do we have questions? Okay, I'm sure you probably answered this, but I'm a little distracted. Um, so when you're doing, going to, you know, you've got your two goals for the week that you're going to execute and you've got your blocks. So you've got your family time, your strategy time, your project time and the whirlwind time. Where, in which block do you execute? So that's the strategy time. That is right? the strategy that's time. That's your strategy time. Okay. So you take the strategy time to execute plus, you, so that's not, so you're you doing your weekly planning outside of that strategy yeah, time. That, yeah, that was not in the block. Okay. So that's, okay. The, the, the visual of the boxes was your work week. Got it. So the strategy and the, the weekly planning has to happen before the week begins. So for me, it's Sunday nights. Okay. Some, some people I've coached have done it on Friday afternoon, last thing they do before they leave. Some people do it early Monday morning, but you have to do it before the week starts or you'll never recover. Yeah. Thank you. Anyone else? Yes. I just have a quick comment because when you were showing the chart about how to block things off, I've used for years, it's called Planner Pad. I don't know if anyone's heard of it. It's awesome because you do, everything gets down into a funnel. So you write all your goals at the top and then it has it day and then even has it by time. So if, you know, because I'm a type of person, I can't have my schedule in an electronic calendar because you have too many windows open. So if I have it written, then it's always there. You can see it. But I just want to say, because how you have that chart, sometimes it helps if you have a written calendar. It's just yeah. kind of a comment. It's, what is it called? <laughs> planner pad. Planner. Planner pad. 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 Planner pad. Yeah, awesome. planner okay. pad. Right. Yeah. 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 Thanks for that. Oh, and I do have a question. Sorry. So my issue is is like i'll plan everything out i usually like to do mine on a friday because come the weekend then i'm like oh i have all these goals and then you forget when it was come monday so i always like to plan everything on friday but then sometimes i can't get the motivation i block out the time and then i sit there even though i have things written down what would be your advice on how do you motivate to actually start that planning strategy yeah good question excellent question okay so that's the part of this talk that I'm not giving at this conference. So there's some, what I've found happens a lot of times is that you're choosing the wrong time of the day to do that kind of work. And so there's a lot of thought and research that's gone into what they're calling chronotypes now. Like, you know, when, like some of us are better in the morning, some are better late evening and whatever. And learning your, there's a great book called When by Daniel Pink that gets into all this. But like for me, if, if you try to do strategy work, in the afternoon, for me, like my mind is just, I'm checked out, like I'm zonked. But that's why I do it in the morning. Uh, if I'm actually gonna execute on goals, that's the golden time. Like eight to 10 a.m., that's the best time of the day. You can't even get an appointment on my calendar until 10 a.m. It just, that's my time where I do the best work. So try, if you have trouble, like I can't get motivated, shift it to a different time of the day and see if that helps. One more question over here. 
So I love the schedule that you showed, and it's very like time block. But we're personally, I just wanted to know from your perspective, where do you find time for me time, right? To go to the gym, to do the stuff outside of your day to day, because that's a tight calendar already. Yeah, sure. So if you were to look at my calendar right now at 11:30, there's an appointment that says go walk and have lunch for an hour. Like that's that's every day, every weekday I do that. Uh, so that was a very simplified calendar up there, right? My, my actual one is a little more complicated, which I'm happy to show you. But uh, yeah, you, it's that's a that's a, a a more that's a more granular time blocking we could get into. It's just it was a little beyond what I was talking about today, just in theory. But yeah, if what I've discovered for me at least is if I don't have that on the calendar, I just blow past it and go through it, right? So it's. Like it, at, well now it's, it was 9.30 because I live in Central Time. Right before I got up here, it reminded me to go have lunch and walk, which was not helpful at all. But yeah. <laughs> it, well, yeah, and it's, well, it's also, crit, like the other part of this talk, I get into this more, but uh, we, like weekends for me, my weekends are pretty blocked out as well. Like on Saturday, that's when I f I'm focused on doing physical stuff around the house. Like I wanna like have some physical activity and by, but Saturday night to Sunday night, that is, I don't do anything between Saturday night and Sunday night that isn't recharging to me, like life-giving energy, you know. I don't do anything I don't want to do during those times. And then Sunday night, I do my planning for the next week. So in, in broad generalities, that's kind of how I fit all that stuff in. Yeah, great question. Time for one more. All right. I'll be around all Think weekend, so I'd love to chat with you. Just come up and say hi. We'll, we'll talk.
Good morning. It is 1015 and we're going to start session two. Welcome everybody. So we got a couple announcements and that is first we'd like to thank our sponsors, our wonderful sponsors because of their generous contribution. We're able to make this event possible. So do visit the sponsor hall and thank them and get some swag. It'll be gone soon. So get it fast. Um, and when you guys are tweeting or Instagramming or doing anything social, don't forget to use our hashtag. Our official hashtag is WCUS, hashtag WCUS. And we're actually going to start an official collaborative photo album. So look for signs because there will be a QR code so you can see that photo album and see your contributions if you decide to use any. And we also have Contributor Day this Sunday. If you guys are interested, it is at 9 a.m. If you do have questions, you could find anybody in a blue t-shirt and ask the volunteer or organizer what the deets are, and they will be very happy to help you. So we're going to go ahead and introduce our next speaker. So this next session is how your small business can participate in Five for the Future. And our speaker is Chris Lubkert. Chris is the co-founder of Extendify and is working to improve the WordPress site creation experience using Gutenberg. Previously, Chris did corporate development, acquisitions, and investments for Automatic. He also wears his WordPress hoodie about six days per week, which means you must live in a cold climate. <laughs> or a cold house. There you go. Yeah. Please welcome Chris, everybody. Today is day seven, no WordPress hoodie in hot and humid uh, San Diego today. But hi, everyone. Um, thanks for joining. Before I get started, I just want to ask, how many of you, is, are there folks here who already participate in Five for the Future? Can you show your hands? OK, so like a handful of people. And, and how many people know what Five for the Future is? More people, OK. Um, so as Raquel said, my name is Chris Lepker, uh, co-founder of Extendify. We are working to improve the WordPress experience to help hosts reduce their WordPress churn by helping users to be successful. And I live in Denver, Colorado, and enjoy biking, hiking, skiing, all the typical outdoor activities there. So I'm excited to talk to you all about Five for the Future and specifically you know, how, not only how you can participate, but how you can get business benefits from it as well. So uh, what we'll talk about today is what Five for the Future is, We'll talk about some of the benefits that you can get from, five, from participating, how to set a program up for success, and what some of the challenges are and how you can overcome those to, to create a successful program. Um, so what is Five for the Future? And this is, as a little bit of context, I think we all know that the, to, in order for WordPress to con continue to grow and be successful, it's taken a uh, whole lot of people from around the world to contribute to that across lots of different teams. So this bubble chart just shows the 6.0 release and it shows just development code contributions, but hundreds of people contribute to every release um, from lots of different companies, lots of different places around the world. And WordPress is supported by people both volunteering their own time and companies that sponsor people, some, either some of their time, all of their time, uh, to contribute to the project across these 19 different teams. And so Five for the Future is an initiative that asks companies to contribute 5% of their resources back to the core project uh, in order to support the longevity of WordPress. And there's a lot of, you know, the kind of main rationale behind that is to ensure that WordPress continues to be successful, continues to be uh, a, one, a great platform for people to use and given that most of us, if not all of us, have our livelihoods or some portion of our business relying on WordPress, uh, we're all, we, have a, we all have a collective vested interest in that continued success. So Five for the Future is really, you know, there's kind of an altruistic element to it um, that supports the future of, of the platform. But what I would actually like to talk about today is not, <clears throat> is not about why it's important for the success of WordPress to participate, but what are the real benefits you can get for your business by participating in Five for the Future? Because we do it at Extendify, and we do it in order to support 
uh, support the program, but we also do it selfishly because we get real benefits from that. And so there are ways to set, set up your contribution in a way that allows you to really uh, maximize those benefits. So that's what I want to talk about. I'm not here to guilt people into you know, contributing in, kind of, uh, that, in that, that sense. Uh, so in addition to obviously this warm and fuzzy feeling, you know, kind of being excited about um, contributing to a platform that powers 43% of the web, the, the benefits, there are three main benefits that we think about. One is insights. The first is insights. And this is, you know, by being close to the development, the growth of, the, of WordPress, you can learn a lot about the, uh, the platform today, where it's going in the future, and you can get real insights. It could, I, it could help you to identify new business opportunities. It could help you to better understand yeah, uh, how things work, so you can be more efficient in your work if you're developing client sites, let's say, right? You can, you can better understand uh, some of the tooling that's available and new functionality, as an example, if you're involved there. And for us, with Extendify, what we're doing is we're building an experience on top of Gutenberg, the core editor of that project, and full site editing. And so we get, you know, real tangible benefits from that. We are you know, as an example, like one of the things we want to make sure we're not doing is recreating things that will also be coming out in core. So for us, we want to focus our energy on things that are actually differentiated and build on top of the core experience. Um, and so by being close to the development and discussions that are going on, it helps us to understand where core is heading. And so for us, it allows us to see, you know, where we should be focusing our efforts. And you know, it also helps us to like to ultimately like deliver a better experience to our customers, to our users, people who are creating a site. Like there was an example just a couple of weeks ago where we were, you know, kind of our our software will essentially create a website based on a series of inputs, and part of that is you know navigation. And in the navigation, we were using the page list block, and we were realizing the page list block essentially lists every page in the, in in this block, and there's no. Uh, way as it exists today to easily choose which pages you want to edit, you want to include it. So for us, we were trying to figure out, it seemed like a fairly, fairly simple problem. We wanted to display five pages on the navigation, not all 10 pages. How do we do that? And we were starting to figure out, kind of coming together as a team, and different folks were proposing different ideas. There was an idea of just you know, using a regular list block, different kind of workaround um, that we were ident exploring there. But because our team, many, everyone on our team has, you know, contributed, has been contributing, has uh, kind of had deeper understanding of WordPress and the different options that are available, we feel there's a very logical solution that's easier for that, just the kind of adding navigational elements, and we could do that automatically um, as we're creating these sites. So it, it's a very small example in that case, but instead of kind of hacking our way around and kind of coming up with our own solution, by being close to the product and the platform, we were able to see this opportunity. Um, you know, another example, I guess, for us, just to bring this to life a little bit more, is you know, we, at one point, this was about a year ago, we were trying to decide whether we need to create our own styling options in order to deliver the type of output that we wanted to, to the customers that use our software. And you know, what we were trying to decide was, can we leverage our style components, the you know, uh, everything that was coming out with future iterations of full site editing? This was about a year ago. Um, or did we need to create our own? Like, how, wh wh how quickly was were things going to evolve? How important was it for us to have our kind of exact level of specificity to what we wanted um, versus leveraging, you know, what what what, what was going to be in core? And ultimately, we concluded that we didn't want to create our own styling elements. We wanted to um, lean as much as possible, whenever possible, into core style components that existed. And that's been, for us, like we needed that insight and that information in order to make an informed decision and feel good about the decision. And it's, it's actually been a core differentiating element of Extendify. So it's something we talk about with partners and uh, those that we work with, and so it's it's turned out to be a, a great decision, the right decision. We're very happy with that approach, and having been contributing and having people who are close, like allowed us to have the insight to make that make that decision. So insights is number one. You kind of learn things. I feel like 
you know, any, any, any amount of contribution where you'll kind of learn new things about where things are headed or how things work today. So insights is the first one. Number two is influence. And this may, you know, I don't want to oversell it. You know, you're not going to you know, tomorrow become the, the new benevolent dictator of WordPress or anything like that. You will, you know, this is something where influence can mean lots of different things at lots of different levels. But at the very simple level, it's, I feel like a lot of us have things that we wish, quote, you know, quote unquote, wish were different about WordPress. And instead of just wishing they were different, you can actually choose what you go work on and what your uh, company focuses their energy on. And you can fix those things that are either annoyances that are holding back the experience for you or your customers or making things inefficient in some way or another. Um, you have control over where your resources go. So it's not one of these things where you say, all right, we're here, we show up, what do we work on? Someone's gonna tell you what to work on. You actually choose, you know, as a company where you focus your energy. So you can focus your energy on the things that are gonna have some impact for you and your business. And for us, like we, this isn't something that we solely were advocating for by any means, but for us um, having style variations in an accessible way within the editor was really important. We didn't want to create lots of different themes uh, that people would choose from. We actually wanted a single theme and to allow people to have lots of different vari variety in choice with the styles. And so as that was coming out, it's as simple as like plus wanting, hey, we support this idea and adding another voice to kind of nudge something forward to uh, actually working on it and helping to make it a reality and helping to make sure it comes out uh, as quickly as it can, you know, and you can influence that. And over time, I think as you, as you show up, as you contribute, as you build relationships with people, you can actually have broader influence, right? I think, you know, it's amazing to me, you know, that WordPress powers so much of the web, but oftentimes decisions are made by just a handful of people who show, who, those, those, those people that show up, you know? whether it's what something should be named or you know, the design of something or you know, what features should be prioritized. These are things where over time, as you build um, your own network and relationships with people and demonstrate that you're you know, kind of committed to the success of the platform, you can have a voice in those decisions as well. So, I feel like a lot of times it's easy to sit back and watch what happens and then maybe critique later or oh, I wish this was I, back to this wish I wish this would have happened differently just showing up actually can allow you to have that uh, that influence as well so influence is the second uh, second real benefit and it can mean that WordPress evolves in a way that supports you and your business it means that you can fix things that uh, annoy you or make things less efficient for you and you can you can impact uh, where it's going and then the third benefit is brand and I'm not talking about um, you know if you participate in Five the future your logo goes on the five for the future page along with the other companies that participate uh, you know you're not gonna get millions of new leads or customers from that page that's you know that that's a minor element of the of the, the benefit here I think what I mean by brand is by being active and out there in the community, you're able to, and having your employees and kind of your entire team out there and active in the community, it can help from a recruiting standpoint. Like people see not only that your company values contribution and participates in that, they see how you work. You know, mo almost all the work in WordPress happens out in the open. You know, people can see, hey, this is a, this is a sharp group of people. These are really nice, they're funny. I, I, would, I would like, they can visualize themselves as part of that team um, being out there. And you start to kind of build relationships with others that are contributing and, and active and passionate about WordPress. You know, people who show up tend to be people who are both experienced and, and really excited about the future. So you can, you can find those people and build those relationships and build that brand that way. You can also find you know, value in dry, getting new customers or partnerships or things like that. I think there's a fair amount, for people who aren't very deep in WordPress, being able to talk about your and your team's contributions to the platform can really elevate your, your kind of status in, in other people's minds. So we, 
you know, for us, like our main partners that we work with are hosting companies. And many of them, there are a handful of them that come to WordCamps and are deeply involved, but many of them have never been to WordCamp, don't know how any of this stuff works. And the idea that they can partner with a company like Extendify and they know that we are active contributors, they feel like they can get some of the benefits, whether it's insights or support and what they need by working with us. So it helps to elevate our stature and our standing in those ways. So brand is, uh, is the second one, is the third one here. And so those are the real benefits. And I, I think this, it, regardless of the type of, ben of company it is, if you're an agency doing client work, if you're a product company, if you're a hosting company, if you just have a WordPress site yourself that powers your business, all of these things can apply in, in different ways. And it's, it's it, you know, contributing even just a small amount, you know, uh, can help you to realize some of these benefits here. So what I want to talk about next is how to set the program for success. So you have all these benefits, but it can be you want to make sure that you're contributing in a way that allows you to realize them and get, you know, kind of get, get the value that you're hoping to get. And this, uh, before we do that, we'll do a little bit of math, you know, because it's called five. I wonder if people can guess what this is, but let's see, 24 minutes a day is, is, is one option here, two hours per week, one day per month, or two and a half weeks per year. Does, does anyone know what that equals? Can people guess where I'm going with this? What percent of time it is? 5%, yeah. So we have some math majors, great. Um, so 5%, and the, my point in this is that um, there are a lot of different ways you can actually get to 5%, and there's no like one perfect solution. There's no one answer that, that works for every company in every situation. So for us at Extendify, we do one day per month today. So the third Friday of every month is our contributor day. It's on the calendar. That's when we do it. The whole team participates in that way. Uh, we're, we're, we take the approach where we have everyone participate um, in Five for the Future. If you're larger, it can be easier, for, easier to sponsor a person or half of a time of someone or multiple people. Um, but as we're, as we're talking about here, it's you know kind of think about small businesses, those that maybe not don't have the resources to hire a person just dedicated to core can get a ton of value just by having your team, whether it's one day a month or a couple hours a week. You have to figure out what works for your team and your schedule, and also what your um, what your priorities are and what you're trying to accomplish. And I think the trade-off here is, you know, shorter periods of time, more frequent, allows you to be there and be. Uh, pushing things along in a, on a, in a consistent ba in a consistent way, you know. The downside is you just have a little bit of time, so you tend not to be able to dive deeper into things. You know, if we have, you know, for us, we work in two week development cycles for Extendify, and if we had two weeks or two and a half weeks to dedicate just to core, and we kind of took that just one time, we could get a lot done. You know, I, I, um, but you then don't see anything forward, and kind of you, you have this, these long periods of time where you're not actually. Um, involved in getting some of these benefits. So I, I think that we've, I've talked to companies that do it a variety of different ways. I don't think there's one magical answer. And um, even for us, I think it's gonna evolve. Like one thing we're finding with one day, one day a month is that um, sometimes it would be nice to be able to follow up with things, you know, maybe submit in the case of uh, contributing to development, you submit a PR, there are some questions. You're, it's not practical to wait 30 more days before you answer those questions and keep those discussions coming. So naturally, we're already kind of involved a little bit more. So we may try and ch kind of try shifting to more of a hybrid approach. But depending on what you're doing, there are different ways to get there. And so some of the keys, one is planning, advanced planning, I wrote here. I think it's really hard if you just say, everyone should find some time every week or every month to contribute. If it's not planned out, if people aren't, if it's not scheduled, it can be really hard to prioritize that. There are always things that come up. And it can also make that time not very effective. So um, what we'll do is before that day, before that third Friday, we will start creating a list of issues, start talking about some of the things that we want our team to accomplish. And everyone can, everyone joins in that collaboration. We try to figure out what people are interested in, what they know is going on that they think would be impactful in one way or another to the project or help us as a company. And 
Um, by doing that, it also helps make sure that if there are questions we need answered ahead of time, we can be effective with our time. Because I think if you just show up and you say, okay, great, I'm joining them, you know, I kind of looked at the, what the marketing team's doing, here's a task that needs to get done, I'm going to do that task, but I have a question about it. So you answer, ask the question at 9 a.m., maybe you don't get a response until 4 p.m., right? And you kind of lost your time and you're not able to do that. So a little bit of planning can really help to make the time that you do spend contributing, whether it's asking that question ahead of time or just aligning the team on where you're going to focus, that can really make it effective. Um, it can also make sure it actually gets done if you schedule it out. So planning is, is one of the first keys that we think about and we do all the time at Extendify. The second is hopefully it's fun. Hopefully this is something that you and your team are excited to participate in. I think we, we find a lot of people, uh, one of the reasons they join Extendify is because they're excited to not only work on the product that we're building, but also to have time to contribute to WordPress as well. Um, but they want to, you know, it, it's so much better if you can do it collaboratively, right? If everyone just goes off and does their own thing and never speaks to anyone for a day, it can be, you know, it can be kind of a lonelier day, you know, if they're used to collaborating with people. So whether it's teaming up on certain things, I know we've done this a couple of times and many companies will do, if they do an all company contribution, they'll have a kickoff, you know, kind of get the team together either in person or over a video call or something like that at the beginning. Um, have another kind of social time at the end to wrap up or something like that. But I think there are things that you can make it social and make it collaborative. So it's not only a time for people to learn and work with others across the community, but also to, you know, for your team to have some bonding and some time to, to, to work together and, you know, be, make, have an impact together. And then the last thing is to, we, we think about um, as part of our program is to build in accountability. So this is, you know, it, it can be as simple as sharing, and this goes to the social element as well, but sharing at the end of whatever what time period it is that you're doing, uh, what people worked on and what's impactful. And we celebrate, you know, if a PR gets merged in, even if it's three days later, we're kind of sharing that and high-fiving virtual, in our case, virtual high-fiving and cheering people on and, um, you know, kind of seeing the impact that you can have and celebrating those wins and sharing with it and sharing the challenges that exist too so that you can help people to uh, be more effective as time goes on. Like that can be a really effective way to make sure that the program feels both impactful and is delivering on some of these goals uh, and objectives. So those are the, as we think about the keys to success, but it's, it's not, it, we, you know, we've been participating for a while and uh, we still have things to learn. There are still challenges that we see in our participation. We're still iterating, as I mentioned, kind of going from the one day a month to trying to figure out is there some hybrid approach where we can uh, have our time be more consistent over, uh, over any given period. Um, and there are real challenges, so it's not easy to get started. And for us, you know, and from what we hear from, from others who participate, one of them is, the way it's described here is the short-term needs get in the way, right? I think as a small business, as someone running a small business, you know, you are juggling lots of different hats, juggling different balls, wearing different hats. You can juggle your hats too, I guess. Um, but, you know, things come up. You need to be adaptable. It's, it's the, it's, it comes with, the, comes with the job, right? Like whether it's, some client issue comes up, there's some bug that needs to be fixed, or a big opportunity that just needs all hands on deck and everyone to focus on it, you know, there are gonna be things that come up. And I think you need to be okay, the only way this program within your company succeeds long term is you need to be okay with some level of flexibility, right? I'm not gonna say schedule it for a certain period of time, never break that schedule or else you're not gonna be effective. And so, like we, we will certainly have times at Extendify where I mentioned we do the third Friday of every month. Uh, some days it's the fourth Friday. Some days it's the first Monday of the next month. You know, it, it kind of gets pushed back and that's okay. You know, we have things come up just as all of you will have things come up in your business that requires you to be adaptable. And if you have a relatively small team and you know, this is a meaningful contribution for you, then you know, it, it, it's, it's definitely to be expected and you should be okay with it and, and recognize that it's gonna happen, um, that you'll be, able, you'll, you'll be moving things around. So that's, kind of, that, that's the first challenge that we see uh, and we've tried to adapt in how we structure the program. The second is not knowing how to get started. And I think this is, 
How many of you have ever been to a contributor day or contributed already? I know people participate in Five to Future, so so maybe half, almost half of the people here have, which means a lot of people haven't, and it can be very intimidating, overwhelming. You know, there are, like I said, there are 19 different teams, and it can be each one of them has you know some way that they onboard new members and have. Uh, getting started guides and things like that but it can be overwhelming and sometimes especially at the beginning it can be hard to figure out where to find your impact you know is it on the marketing team or is it doing testing or is it contributing to development is it writing documentation you may try one thing or some people on your team may try one one element or one aspect of it realize that either it's they don't have the skills for it or the interest for it they want to do something else and they'll try something else and so I think the, way, the best way I could describe this is it's going to be uh, slow at the beginning. It's probably going to feel like not as, not as impactful as you'd like, um, but you're laying the foundation for the future and ensuring that it's going to be more effective going, going forward. I don't know if you all watch Schitt's Creek, the TV show. Do you know Schitt's Creek? Uh, it's, uh, the first time I watched Schitt's Creek, I, I, I hated it. I thought it was a terrible show. The characters are very unlikable. I thought they were all very annoying. I was like, I, but my wife wanted to keep watching it. So we watched the second one. I still didn't like it. By the third one, I was hooked. And I think I'm, I've watched the whole thing twice now. I think I'm on my third time going through the entire series of six seasons. Um, and I think about that as like, you know, in that case, it took me a little bit of time to understand, you know, kind of appreciate the humor, start to build uh, love for the characters in the show. And I think that's, that's, how, that's how it'll go with, with participating as well. Like your team, the first time it happens, the debrief at the end may be, uh, I didn't get anything done. I read a bunch of stuff, I tried to do this, this didn't work, I couldn't figure that out. Or I didn't know, I, you know I, I spent all day setting up my environment, so okay, I've done that, but I didn't actually accomplish anything. And that's okay, you have to think the first few times that is that is the point of uh, of having these having these first to first few uh, days or hours or whatever it is, whatever your time period is, and you can also so ways to overcome this is you know like I said don't worry about the slow start but you can also partner with others so that's where this little bit of advanced planning comes in. I know some companies will uh, invite others to join them so have you know. You know, one of the sponsored full-time contributors from the design team may be joining for an hour and helping the design team at XYZ Company you know, uh, get an overview of what opportunities exist or things like that. So reaching out to people can be really effective or even partnering with others. So um, if there's another company that you know, like bringing that company together could you know, kind of increase the benefits as well. So I, I think it can be, it can be both in overwhelming, intimidating, the slow start is to be expected, but eventually you'll get to this point um, by the third episode where you love it and you, you kind of feel good and it feels like um, you're actually having an impact and getting a lot of these benefits as well. So I, I, ho I hope this was helpful. I think next release, you know, your company could be listed here if it's not already. There are large companies, but there are a whole lot of small companies that as well that contribute to WordPress. This is the development uh, contributions from WordPress 6.0 and I hope you can not only have an impact on the future of WordPress but also reap real benefits for your business and and help you long term as well so happy to take any questions or um, if anyone has their own experience in, in kind of participating and anything to add I, I think that that'd be awesome to hear as well but anything questions Hi, Chris. Chris Osborne from Codable. Uh, so in terms of the actual mechanics of engaging with one of the teams and actually making proposals, is there, is there a formal way in which you do that? Or is it just about engaging with a member of the team and then just talking to them about what it is that you're interested in potentially uh, contributing? Or how does that how does that all work generally? Yeah, it's a good question, and the, the the answer is there are 19 different teams, and it varies a little bit based on the team. So, one of the best ways to do that, if you have the opportunity to join a WordCamp and go to a con, con, contributor day, 
you know, this one, as Raquel mentioned, is Sunday. So if folks are around, that's a good opportunity to get connected with the team and understand what their priorities are, how you can, how you can contribute in that way as well. Um, but it, it's going to vary a little bit by team. There, each team does have, if you go to make.wordpress, you will have, you know, for the different teams, in somewhere in their documentation, how to, how to participate, how to get involved in that team. And I wouldn't think about it as, you know, it's probably not showing up on day one and saying, all right, I'm gonna, here's what we wanna do. These are our new priorities. Let's get them done. I think there's, this is where there's this kind of slow start comes in. There's real value in learning and you know, reading about what the team has been working on, joining, many teams have a, a, a periodic asynchronous kind of Slack meeting that happens where they discuss initiatives that are being worked on, what needs to get done. People can raise their hand and offer to help with things. Uh, so those are good ways to do it as well. Um, so really trying to understand like what the what the team what the priorities are right now for that team, how you can get involved. But people are also super nice too. So especially if you're coming to them saying I would like to help, people are willing to help you figure that out. And so even if you don't have any of these options or you're stuck somewhere, just reaching out to someone who has been participating in that team in some way or another can be helpful there. It's a good way of doing it. Another question, yeah, their experiences too, if others have participated. Uh, what do you think about the argument that's kind of playing out in the public space uh, about Fight for the Future having to be um, dedicated to WordPress core, especially if you're at a company that, um, you know, you, you want everybody to participate, you might have like um, project managers or marketing folks that aren't necessarily technical? Well, I think some people definitely make the art, you know, kind of describe, we do other things to help Word, help help WordPress grow, which is great. You can do other things, you can, you can have an impact on the community in a variety of different ways, right? There are different ways that all of us come together and, uh, and make, make, moving, make moving the platform forward. I do think Fire for the Future, the way Josepha and team have uh, I described it and defined it on contributing towards these 19 different teams and what their goals are, it is important for the success of the platform, right? If people don't show up and help support these initiatives, they don't get done. They literally, there's no one else to do them. So, uh, I, I think both are important. I think having people who, you know, if, if, if you think you know, having a podcast and talking about WordPress is a way you want to contribute, fine. You know, I think that people can choose different ways to, to, uh, to have an impact, but there is real value in contributing to core and there's real benefits I think that you can get as well. And I think to your question about um, non-technical teams, I think there's a perception, a pretty common ones, where you know people feel like I don't have the skills to contribute. I don't have. I, I'm not a developer. I can't be on this the bubble chart that we were looking. Um, and that may be true, but there are a lot of different ways where people with any variety of different skills can have an impact. So. That could be, you know, kind of off the top of my head, I mentioned like testing, um, which is something nearly everyone can participate in. And in fact, having people with different levels of technical expertise can be even more important with testing, right? Understanding how people who are newer to the platform, maybe not as technical, uh, see things and what challenges they see, all the way up to people who have more advanced needs and tend to, you know, uh, be more familiar. There's marketing, there's writing documentation, which could be technical documentation, it could be more, uh, it could be less technical as well. So there, I think if you, I, I, I'd be hard to imagine someone who would look at the 19 different teams and all the different things they're working on where they can't find something that is both interesting to them and something they feel like they can have an impact on. And in fact, ideally, you know, we have our team, a lot of our contribution goes to development or design, but spreading out and finding and learning and kind of having, broadening the impact and can also increase your learnings. You can better understand what's going across, across the whole community that's, that's working towards it. So there could be, you know, benefits you get from ex expanding how people are contributing as well. Does that make sense? Or you're gonna ask, is there another question you had? 
Yeah, that makes sense. And actually, we participate, and I think a lot of our um, non-technical people have found um, uh, doing captioning for WordPress TV, which is one of the teams, oh, to be okay. like uh, a valuable th thing to contribute their time to. So, thank yeah. you. Yeah, that's a good one. Yeah, yeah. Translations is another one. If your team is global and have different uh, languages that people speak, that's something a lot of people can do as well. So, yeah, it's a good example. Hello, I'm Allie from AJ Parka. Um, so just wanted to share my experience. Yeah. Um, so this is my first WordCamp, first WordPress event that I'm attending. Welcome, it's awesome. Uh, thank you. And um, so my in into uh, being a contributor really was the sign up form for the WordCamp and having to pick what I was like, going to do on Contributor oh, yeah. Day. Yeah. Um, and as a non-tech person, I was like, well, in, in my head, I, you know, I was familiar with Five for the Future. Um, but I always thought that that was really, you know, core working on the oh. releases and, and that there wasn't a place yeah, for non-tech yeah. people. Um, so it was really eye-opening when I learned about all the different teams and went to, um, I uh, chose to volunteer with the community team because that's my jam. Nice. Yeah. Um, and so it was great because I started um, volunteering, um, you know, uh, a, f a few hours a week. Um, in the two or three months leading up to this and it was just a great in to feel like already you know was participating and helping yeah. and new people before i even showed up so yeah. that was that's you know that there was other other <clears throat> other benefits as well just in terms of you know getting a little bit oriented before yeah, you know, so. that's cool, right? You make friends, right? You kind of, you know, <laughs> online friends that become in-person friends when you see them in, that's in right. real life. Yeah, yeah. It, can, it can make you feel connected to the community. Yeah, yeah and be involved. That's cool. That's great. Hey. Hi, I'm Courtney Robertson. I am the training team co-rep, and I'm a dev advocate at GoDaddy Pro. Um, as part of the training team, we help make the content that goes out on learn.wordpress.org. So uh, it is a resource that, especially as I think about the small business owner perspective maybe in this talk, um, it's a resource you can use with your clients. And so by showing up and participating with the training team, you're having input into what resources you need to help train your clients. Along with that, we host events, uh, teaching people the basics of how to use WordPress. They're essentially an online meetup and I would highly encourage people to check those out as well. If you go to learn.wordpress.org slash events, I believe in the address bar, um, we'll get you there. And then, um, or it would be listed as online workshops would be another term that you might see. Um, the other thing to take note of is that every few weeks or so, it seems that the test team, there's 21 teams and the test team in particular has these calls for testing. And it's basically a new user experience testing session that you don't need to have a lot of skills in that. In fact, sometimes it's better that you don't. Um, when, right. when you're too familiar, it's hard to remember that creating certain parts of WordPress can feel a little challenging. So those are opportunities to invite your coworkers in. That's something that I've done internally is get people involved in those new user type of testings. They, they list them as FSE call for testing. So if you see any of those being published, make.wordpress.org slash test. Look for posts that say FSE call for testing. And that's a good chance to get in and see what's happening and tests that you can go through. There's a whole series of them, some that have happened in the past. Even though those calls are done, go through it anyway if you're still working on helping staff get up to speed learning what's happening in WordPress. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, I mean, I've done I've done those personally. A lot of our team have done those uh, calls for testing, and you learn a lot because oftentimes it's testing kind of the latest functionality that's out there. So often, you know, a lot of times it's oh cool, I didn't even know this was possible. You know, reading other people what other people are doing too. So yeah, and on the learn, I mean, imagine how cool it would be if you're talking to a client and you're sending them some documentation, be like, oh, by the way, we help to write this documentation and here it is on learn.wordpress.com, you know, like wordpress.org, sorry. That like allows, you know, that's a kind of branding we were talking about and how to really continue to elevate yourself as a leader in the WordPress uh, community and help with that way. So that's cool. Thanks, Courtney.
We've got time for a couple more. Or we could end early. Good. Cool. Well, thanks everyone for showing up. Um, I, I, yeah.
Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the last session of the morning sessions. We are, it's 11.15, and we have a few announcements before we invite our speaker up. The first is, as always, we want to thank all of our sponsors. So we actually have some sponsors in the crowd. If you see some, give them a big thanks, because we could not put on this event without them. And also, don't forget to visit the sponsor hall where all the sponsors are. There's lots of swag. Word on the street, there's some good swag out there. So do check it out. And when you're doing your social shares, wherever that might be, be sure to use our official hashtag, which is hashtag WCUS. That's all it is. It's pretty simple this year. If you use that, we're actually working on an official collaborative photo album. So use the hashtag and your picture will be put into that photo album. There will be QR code signs up coming up here. Be able to uh, view the album there. Um, also, reminder that contributor day is Sunday, and you can still join if you like. If you have any questions, find a volunteer or an organizer. Look for the teal shirts, and they will help you with any questions you might have. And with that, we're going to introduce our final speaker of the morning. So, and we, the, our session is meeting your customers where they are, how businesses can thrive in a digital first world by Kiala Gaines. Kiala Gaines is general manager for payments at WooCommerce, where she focuses on ensuring merchants, that ensuring merchants have access to the payment capabilities they need to run and grow their businesses. Prior to joining WooCommerce, Kiala was VP eBay Payment Services and responsible for was responsible for the migration of 19 million sellers in 180 countries from a legacy referral model to eBay's own payment solution. Wow. <laughs> Over the last 20 yeah, there you go. <laughs> Over the last 22 years, Kiala has held roles at VeriSign, PayPal, and Intuit across a variety of payment functions including go-to market, product, partnerships, and operations. She is a graduate of St. Mary's College of California's MBA program and lives in Scotts Valley, California, with her husband and two dogs. In her spare time, she enjoys surfing, painting, cooking, and enjoying local wines. <laughs> That's a lot, and I love it. Welcome, Kiala. on now right all it took was your presence <laughs> well after that intro um, I can skip whatever I had planned to say uh, but I'm super excited to be here today uh, with all of you guys it's my first board camp so um, and as you heard I've been in payments a really long time so uh, what I'm going to talk about today will have a payments bend uh, to it so with that I will jump right in assuming that I can get the, the clicker correct here so we'll talk about the state of e-commerce and some of the themes that we see that are impacting it, consumer needs, and how we see those changing, and in particular, payments as an enabler to those. And then finally, how you or your merchants that you may support and um, help enable how they can win. So uh, probably an understatement to say that commerce is a constantly changing landscape, but I think at no point has that probably been more true than in the last few years, and we would all agree with that. Um, the lines of phys physical and digital were converging long before, um, but the rate at which we saw that convergence happen, I think over the last three years, has probably been unprecedented, to say the least. And we see that, as a result, shopping experiences for consumers have changed rapidly. And what they consider as the benchmark for what a great experience should and can be, I think, has changed drastically in that period of time. And really what I believe is that COVID obviously just accelerated this change that was already happening, but again at an unprecedented pace of change that we've never really seen before. Um, and I'll give maybe an example of that uh, in, a, in a bit. So um, the obvious physical and digital worlds have obviously uh, converged. And I'm going to put my glasses on here um, just for a bit. So consumers want to be able to shop from anywhere uh, in the world be able to have access to inventory 
um, probably more rapidly uh, than ever expected before. And for the most part, technology has delivered on that. Um, they expect to be able to shop across mobile, social, digital, physical, and even geographic channels. Those checkout experiences are expected to be what I call relevant and efficient. And while that's not sort of language that a consumer would probably use to describe why it is that they like or don't like an experience, I think it's sort of at the heart of a lot of the things that we are seeing that are increasing in popularity. Um, and buyers have more choice than ever in how they shop, how they pay. Um, options that are increasing flexibility for them and convenience are really the ones that I see gaining a lot of traction. And I'll talk a little bit about that. So throughout these slides, we'll try to kind of orient around three key points. Um, the first around access, the ability to shop across multiple channels uh, and much multiple touch points. And then the next on relevance and efficiency and then flexibility and convenience. So shopping expected to be accessible anytime, anywhere. And like I said, technology largely has allowed us to do that. Uh, we hit a few hiccups with COVID, and I think we all saw supply chains converge and delivery times take a little bit longer, and our patients changed. Um, but we have a short memory, and I think we're coming right back to those really heightened expectation levels. And again, that convergence across physical and digital. And it's not just that convergence that I think about, but I think about the flywheel effect that uh, that builds. So we all saw that wallet adoption, the use of something like an Apple Pay or a Google Pay pre-pandemic was really quite small at the point of sale. We all began to use it at the point of sale. And then what we saw was that flywheel effect that actually transcends back online into buyer behaviors. And so we're seeing this sort of um, uh, reinforcing behavior between digital and physical. And then social, the rise of social, no surprise, it's part of everyone's everyday life, but I don't know about you guys, I sort of remember five years ago, 10 years ago, maybe 10 is too long, but like at what point was commerce actually going to happen on social? And it sort of wasn't really happening. And then lo and behold, it seems to have sort of exploded and we'll double click on that one a little bit more. And then I think really underpinning everything is really mobile and that that has become the technology that has enabled this convergence of physical and digital, the rise of social and some of the other trends that, uh, that I'll talk about. So we all knew pre-COVID these were converging, physical and digital. Just how much, I think, um, obviously accelerated. 73% of shoppers now um, preferring to shop across multiple touch points. And that acceleration, I believe, is really sort of, you know, we always had early adopters, folks that were going to use multiple channels, that were going to use wallets, that were using these enabling technologies. But what COVID brought was those sort of uh, late adopters, uh, the last use cases, the folks that were reluctant to shop online. Uh, it brought the everyday spend, groceries, um, gas. It brought things that um, traditionally would not have been uh, used in an online context. And through that time, uh, muscle memory gets created, right? And so again, we have that convergence or that flywheel between offline and online helping to sort of drive those behaviors. Um, I'll cite here from uh, Digital Commerce 360, and they said, obviously, e-commerce going fast before COVID-19 hit, but the pandemic pushed more consumers to spend online, to spend online more frequently, and to spend more. And then I think what we're also seeing is that these customers that shop across channels are some of the most valuable and some of the most highly engaged. Google says that omni-channel shoppers have a 30% uh, higher lifetime value than those that use one channel. And customer retention uh, is 90% higher for omni-channel. So omni-channel may not transcend for every business and for every use case, but what probably does transcend and for us all to think about is how can we drive engagement with our customers across different interaction points and different channels for communication. Um, and for some of us, uh, and for some businesses, obviously there is that both retail and uh, and online and how we can help facilitate that more. And then where that is not applicable, definitely looking at just how we drive engagement um, across, across different methodologies. 
So we mentioned social commerce on the rise, uh, and data shows us that this is um, already at what, $45.7 billion in the US, and it's expected to grow at a compound annual rate there pretty quick. Uh, and that's just in the US. Actually, internationally, it's expected to grow much, much faster um, or much larger. Uh, by 2025, globally, it's supposed to be $1.2 trillion that'll be enabled on social. So uh, it is happening, and it's happening quickly. And um, some of the, the things that I find interesting here, I'm not at all surprised that, uh, what is it, that 67% of, or 55% of uh, social media users ages 18 to 24 have made a purchase, not surprising. I have one of those in my household. They make lots of purchases uh, <laughs> on social. But I was stunned to see one third, age 65 and plus, are also shopping on social. Um, so I found that one that one kind of surprising. Uh, a couple stats around here that I, I think are interesting. So uh, US users, on average, 30 minutes a day. Facebook, Twitter, TikTok, Instagram, Snapchat. Not collectively each, 30 minutes each. That's a lot of time. Um, Instagram says that uh, their survey, 60% of people uh, found out about their products on Instagram now. That's pretty big, 60%. Like people are not going to the mall anymore. Uh, Facebook survey, 62% of respondents said that um, they were more interested in a brand after seeing it in stories. I don't even watch stories, but apparently that's a, that's a thing. Um, so for those of us, as I mentioned, that may have kids or teenagers in the house, I think these are probably underrepresented, and it'll be really interesting to reflect back on and see if the predictions hold true or if they outpace and exactly how things evolve here. But no doubt it's moving fast. Um, and probably uh, a good indicator of how fast we expect it to move is mobile. And uh, I, I kind of date myself when I was thinking back to when did mobile really take off? Like, I remember, I don't know, you know, 2005, I don't really think it was a thing. 2012, I went back and did some research. 11% of US uh, e commerce was happening on mobile in 2012. And then by 2016, here, um, we see now these are global numbers. Um, that those, those numbers started to rise significantly. And we sort of hit this critical mass, at which point it went from being something we were afraid to do, we rarely did, the interfaces weren't great, you had to enter all of this data, um, you weren't really sure if it was secure, to now it's the de facto way, and in many, many cases, uh, the mobile experiences actually are far better than the desktop experiences. And I don't know when that happened exactly, but it used to be that the desktop experience was the better experience, and you sort of had your mobile experience. Um, and now it's almost completely switched. So um, really interesting to sort of look back on uh, that, that growth of mobile. And I think that when we look forward as to what that would be an indicator of the things to come, I, I don't know what they might be, but you know, we have crypto, we have NFTs, um, wherever Web3 takes us, there's wearables, personal assistance, voice-initiated commerce, virtual reality. Um, be very curious to see five years from now, standing up here, what those trends are, where we start to see nuggets of slow adoption and where that adoption starts to really accelerate and when it hits critical mass and just sort of becomes a new norm. So moving into what shoppers need, um, and I'm gonna talk about relevancy and efficiency, and again, knowing that that's not language that the consumers probably use, um, but I think it, it sort of is the, the root of and underpins some of the trends that we're seeing and why they're so popular. So checkout, expected to be relevant and efficient. And we know that cart abandonment has many drivers, um, but at the heart of those, it's, is the experience relevant to me as a buyer? my device, my location, my currency, the forms of payment I want to use, is it relevant to the item that I'm buying? Is it a high priced item? Is it a low price item? Is it a service? Is it a physical good? Um, has that experience really been adapted the whole way through? And when we think about um, that even a little bit further, you know, I was thinking about digital uh, or service experiences. How many people here have registered a car at the DMV? 
<laughs> and you get asked to add your registration to the cart and then to like, are you sure you want to check out? Yes, I want to check out. And then you go through and you pay. But it's a very physical item experience that's been sort of shoehorned into registering my car, which is, it should just be pay. Um, so when I think about relevancy, I think about relevancy from all of those perspectives um, and how those can help uh, actually create better experiences that, again, a user wouldn't think about as being efficient or inefficient, uh, but certainly play a role. In this data here, we see um, from Baymard Institute, and I'm sure there's lots of studies on lots of numbers on cart abandonment, but some of the themes will be the same. In this one, it was 24% of uh, the users stated they, the site wanted them to create an account, which I think we would all argue might be inefficient. 18% said that the checkout process was too long or too complicated. Again, inefficient. 7%, um, there weren't enough payment methods for them, or at least probably the ones they wanted. It wasn't relevant to them. So I think these are just some of the underpinnings for um, what relevancy and efficiency means. Um, there's other drivers, of course. Transparency is the shipping and the tax and everything presented up front to me. Um, but moving further into this notion of rele relevancy and efficiency, I've started to think about what is it uh, that makes uh, a very efficient checkout efficient. And for me, it sort of centers on these three things. And um, authentication, acceleration, and adaptation. So authentication, and this was really a key one, if we think about, again, that history of uh, mobile, when we think about PayPal during that period of time, um, many of us remember uh, that they solved a very unique problem at that point in time, which was now I could just log in. All my information would be pre-filled. I didn't have to share my payment information, and I could keep going. And that sort of converged uh, really nicely as mobile was coming up. When we add authentication to that, now that necessity to log in is potentially removed through two-factor authentication, the device, SMS, again, mobile sort of enabling this coupling together of the notion of authentication, uh, identity, with the wallet and your payment credentials. And I think it's the sort of marriage of those two things that's actually really helped to fuel the acceleration of checkout. Um, so then moving into adaptation again, is the checkout completely adapted for not only the user and their location, but also the type of item that they're buying? And then I think that obviously leads uh, to what we're seeing, which is this growing preference for mobile and digital wallets. And we've seen it happen and be reinforced at the physical point of sale, permeating online, again, creating that flywheel effect but online now, this merging of identity, of wallet, uh, pre-filling all of my data, making me feel secure. Uh, the usage is, is going up uh, quite uh, exponentially. And I think, again, here, probably underestimated. It would be interesting to see. But going from 29% in 2021 to anticipated to be 33% in 2025, that seems like a fairly small <laughs> amount of growth for what I think many of us are becoming um, much deeply embedded habits. Uh, true story. I left my wallet at home for this trip. Uh, it was a little bit of a problem with checking into the hotel. I did not have a physical uh, ID. But I had my phone and I had a picture and luckily they took pity on me and let me check in with a picture of my passport. Um, and I don't have a card, but I have you know, Apple Pay loaded and a card in there. And so if I had to, I could probably buy gas. I, def I was able to order room service. So um, I'm eight hours from home, no wallet and it didn't even occur to me until about eight hours into my trip that I didn't have a wallet with me. So behaviors are changing fast and they're changing probably faster uh, than any of us will an anticipate. Um, again here, COVID obviously played a role um, and one of the things that uh, we're seeing in some of the research is 69% of the retailers said that they saw an increase in contactless payments during the pandemic, not surprising, but 94% of those retailers expect that to continue over the next 18 months. So again, laying muscle memory, these behaviors are forever changed and that in-store proximity for mobile payments uh, grew 29%. Um, think about how hard it is to uh, change behaviors, and we see um, this adoption 
yes, they're convenient. Um, the uh, underlying that, uh, it, it's so hard to change behaviors. And I thought about when's the last time we saw like a behavior shift in payments? Uh, how many people here, EMV, do you know what that is? The chip on the card? You remember going to the terminals and seeing the little cardboard on there of like not ready yet? They started trying to drive chip uh, uh, pinned. Uh, in the US, it's just chip. In Europe, it's chip and pin. Uh, we couldn't 100% get it right, but uh, started that project in 2015 to try to drive adoption. Now you have to drive adoption through the card issuers, the hardware suppliers, the merchant account providers, the processors in between. So everybody's got to support it. Um, they started that. It was going to be a mandate. They kept rolling it back, rolling it back. It was taking too long. Uh, went and did some research. In 2016, it was estimated that it was going to take uh, another 18 months to three years to get full-scale adoption. It was finally mandated in 2021, uh, and now, broadly, everyone has it. Um, this is a thing that we all knew was bad. The MEG Stripe data was insecure. It was creating fraud. Cards were being compromised. And yet, as a country, it took us seven years to implement chips on cards. And then I look back over the last three years of how quickly behaviors changed. You go to any retailer now, their point of sale system is enabled for contactless. Merchants did a massive upgrade on all of their hardware. The hardware is all now smart. So that lays this foundation for being able to now use digital forms of payment at a physical device, again, creating that flywheel effect, but at an unprecedented pace. Um, and I'm kind of a payment geek, so I like to look back at when's the last time we saw something like this happen? We haven't. So moving into what shoppers need flexibility and convenience. And um, I talked about convenience quite a bit in terms of efficiency, but I think our expectations on flexibility are changing as well. So we saw supply chains con constrained with COVID uh, long before COVID, they've been going global. Um, increasingly, the barriers to cross-border have actually been reduced. And again, I'll take this from a payments perspective. Um, it used to be when I started in payments in 2000, what it, what it required to sell online was you had to go to your bank, you had to get a merchant account. It took maybe a couple weeks. Only some banks offered online merchant accounts because not everybody wanted to touch the risk. And God forbid you were gonna process anywhere besides your home domicile. So if you're in the US, you're processing in the US in US dollars. We fast forward to now, um, and by the way, it was incredibly difficult to do anything internationally. And now uh, cross-border commerce is uh, enabled quite readily. You can accept uh, payments in currencies all over the world, local forms of payment. Um, we have technologies that are doing things like making currency conversion on the site, localized payment options, um, all quite accessible. Uh, this does a couple things that I think give flexibility. One. Uh, again, supply chain, it's global, but our buyers are changing as well. So you've got, uh, as a merchant, the ability to sort of offset and diversify the risk of where do I have inventory and where are there buyers that need that inventory and who's willing to sort of pay the best price. And at the same time, now buyers have the ability to sort of say, I don't care if it's located in another country, it's available, it's at the price that I want, and I'm going to buy it. Um, you, you add all of those together and across border just becomes a huge opportunity that I don't think as many people are tapped into as they should be. I did a little survey before I came here. I asked um, my son and his girlfriend, uh, 18 and 23 year olds, um, do you, have you bought anything from a seller that's not in the US? Yes, they both had. Australia, England, Canada. Hmm. And like, did you have any trepidation about buying online? And I said, well, like, I want to know that the return policy is maybe the same. Okay. And was it presented in US dollars or was it presented in Australian dollars? And I got a mix of answers. And I said, what did you do when it was in Australian dollars? I looked it up on Google. So the buyer behaviors for what used to be really uncomfortable shopping from anything other than your own home currency, 
in a merchant in the US are changing, they're changing rapidly to, I like the item, it's available, I don't care what currency it is, and I don't care that it's shipping internationally. Assuming that those things can all be done uh, sort of frictionlessly and you know, it can get here in a reasonable period of time. So um, long story short, I think cross-border is a huge opportunity to drive uh, increased growth uh, for merchants and also to de-risk um, sort of that concentration of where is your buyer base uh, and how you can uh, adapt uh, as inventory uh, changes as well. And then buy now, pay later. And this one is um, an adoption, one that we're seeing really, really uh, gain traction quickly. And it's connected to cross-border because it actually started to gain popularity in countries where card use is not dominant. The buy now, pay later options that we see, and notably Klarna, um, really uh, began in Germany, uh, where the predominant way to pay is with a bank. These are not credit dominant, credit card dominant markets. Um, and so now what we see with the rise of buy now, pay later is a couple things. Uh, flexibility for buyers, it gives them a lot more optionality in how they shop. Uh, it opens up new segments, so uh, customers who historically either didn't have a credit card, wouldn't use a credit card, or in a country where credit cards are not um, sort of the norm. Um, buy now, pay later is quite literally exploding. Uh, there's definitely some negative press out there about is it being used uh, in ways that people can't afford. Very similar to what we saw with credit cards in the early years, are people getting themselves into financial trouble. Um, and there's a whole new generation of folks that, younger folks even in the US, that do not use credit cards, don't want to use credit, and yet are using buy now, pay later. Um, it's just an interesting different mental model shift for sort of something quite similar but yet different. Um, so. so new commerce models uh, is what I wanted to cover and the fact that those are actually at the heart of most of those is enabled by payments. Mobile wallet usage, uh, expediting the adoption of contactless payments, smart terminals that can take wallets, um, the linking of authentication, your payment credentials to your identity, making checkout more efficient in ways that I don't think um, most people probably decompose uh, in those ways. And then alternative payment options, giving shoppers flexibility in how they fund their transactions. Um, and this is kind of an interesting notion. So when I talk about funding a transaction, what I mean is the way that we pay using a wallet is actually not the same way that we might fund a transaction. And for anyone who's used PayPal, hopefully that rings true. Um, you can fund your balance via bank, via balance, via card. Uh, someone can send you money on Venmo, right? The way that you fund a transaction could be quite different from the way that you're actually spending uh, those dollars. And so what this builds is a, a, a deliberate disconnect between the act of shopping, which people like, and the act of paying, which nobody likes. And the further you disassociate those two, the higher you actually drive uh, conversion and repeat usage and the good psychology around shopping with the bad psychology around paying. So alternative payment options not only give flexibility, uh, but they do create a separation between the act of shopping and the act of paying, um, which is an important one. And then local payment methods, uh, again, tapping into cross-border and making sure that buyers around the globe who are increasingly uh, new, new consumer markets, which I didn't talk about, emerging markets coming online, shopping, wanting U.S. goods, and then U.S. shoppers uh, buying, uh, sourcing inventory overseas, um, making sure that regardless of that use case, that people have the most relevant way to pay for them uh, in the currency that's local to them, and uh, hopefully with an adapted experience. And then finally, pay later uh, options, and really expanding uh, buyer purchasing power and flexibility, and tapping into markets and segments where um, credit card usage is maybe not dominant, or um, not even available. So um, all of these things uh, for me are fundamentally uh, new ways of engaging with a customer through checkout, but they're enabled by payments. So how do you win? Um, for me, I think that's around enabling access, 
across physical, card present, digital, online, social, mobile, optimized wallets and experiences, making sure that however a shopper is coming to you, that they have a consistent and relevant experience. And that relevancy is about them and their personalized preferences, uh, their country, their device, um, their currency, the form of payment that they want to use, and again, the experience adapted to the actual item that they're buying as well. Is it inexpensive? Is it a service? Is it a physical good? Um, and then efficiency. How fast and frictionless can that checkout process be? And how many steps can we remove? Can we remove additional steps by, by tethering together identity and authentication with a wallet and financial credentials and the notion of pre-filling financial information and clubbing me even further, what are your preferences? My preference in the wallet, I have forms of payment that are default, I have currency preferences, shipping preferences, all of these help make the checkout process much more efficient. And then finally, flexibility. Are you offering me all of the choices that I want? Do I have things like buy now, pay later, other installment options? Um, and those are most relevant, obviously, in a, in a retail e-com scenario, uh, in a B2B use case, that might be something like invoicing. It might be something like Net30. Um, but is that flexibility uh, there and adapted locally for, for them? So uh, payment providers and the ones that you choose really do play a big role in uh, across all of these and which um, access, relevancy, efficiency, flexibility. Um, you choose the wrong provider and those things may not be available to you when you need. You choose the right provider and those things um, I think will be more addressable and allow people to adapt so that when we have um, major changes and we need to be able to react really, really quickly as we all just saw in the last three years, changes to business model, um, that you have flexible systems that permeate all the way into uh, your payment provider and your e-commerce system uh, to help you be able to grow, respond, and react and participate as the uh, changing commerce landscape continues to evolve quite rapidly. So with that, I think that I'm wrapped up. <laughs> of course, we have time for questions or comments, so if anybody would like. Yes. Hi, great talk. Hi. Um, I was wondering, do you see in the future for Woo the buy now, pay later model being an offering? And I just wanted to kind of get your perspective on how do you see payments um, playing a role in the metaverse and in the rise of that? Yeah. Um, so specific to Woo, uh, buy now, pay later is an option. Um, we support a variety of choices uh, via extension. And so there's you know, Klarna, Affirm, Afterpay. I'm probably forgetting a few. But um, they're, they're, those are choices that are available today. And we're actually seeing increased adoption of those. And like I said, on the buyer side, we're seeing uh, quite a bit of increased traction there. And all of, all of the research that I've done um, are that they absolutely drive incremental spend, higher order basket um, size, repeat usage. Um, so, And then in the metaverse, I'm going to uh, just say that's so far out of, out of my realm, but um, I do think this notion of linking of payment to identity and that in the metaverse, you're perpetually in sort of a logged in state and where you have your identity known, even if it's anonymized, but you have payment uh, and other data appended to that now, you're able to sort of transact seamlessly in a way that feels probably a lot less different, uh, a lot m more different than um, sort of the legacy e-com state of I'm going to log in, I'm gonna specifically pay. I, I think again, where we start to see a merging of financial information with identity information, we can remove steps from the process. And we're seeing some of that with like token-gated wallets and some of the, um, some of the uh, Web3 wallets where you get access to a whole new experience, but you're in a um, authenticated state already. Hi. 
Hi. Um, as a fellow data nerd, I'm really excited about this talk. You've done a beautiful job at lining out, you know, making a case of what we need to be considering while we are configuring these transaction experiences. Um, do you have any insight on the actual user testing and how organizations can work with their customers to ensure that they are getting that information back from them and getting those feedback loops to make those right choices? Specific to payments or just in general? Uh, specific to setting up the carts and the payment environment. Yeah. Um, A-B testing is, is obviously, it can be quite difficult, um, especially in a live environment for payments. Um, one of the ways that I've done it in the past um, is to throttle volume. Um, so we would take, you know, every fifth user would see a different checkout experience, that type of thing. One would have forms of payment available. Sometimes same forms of payment, but maybe they're presented in a different way, they're sequenced in a different way. Um, those things actually uh, drive more behavior shift than one might imagine. Uh, just the ordering of things on the page and what's sort of available first, um, and then, you know, Add, add additional forms of payment and, and test adoption. Yeah. Um, what is Wu doing to make the um, checkout experience more relevant and less frictional these days? Less frictional. Um, well, I think one of the things we're doing would be around um, checkout blocks and making sure that we are really what just happened there, um, uh, really simplified uh, and the best experiences. At the end of the day, the more we know about a user and what country they're coming from and you know the type of item that they're buying, the more that we will be able to present um, more tailored experiences. Um, so I think there's a balance there in how much we know about a customer. Um, and, and, uh, but that's the path that we are going down, which is how can we uh, enable either uh, you to tell us more about that transaction so that we can adapt the experience. Hi. Um, I wanted to know about the incidence of fraud and whether fraud is it would use a digital wallet is the less fraud perpetuated than maybe through credit cards mm -hmm. or buy now pay later i know that that was mentioned as well because the burden is often on the retailer to yeah. do that right it's a it's a really interesting question actually because the user is authenticated into the wallet uh, generally what you see is that the wallet and it depends on the wallet so i should unpack that a little bit but the in the case of like a paypal the wallet provider is actually um, is actually responsible for uh, the buyer side fraud there. Now there's there's a couple ways that a transaction goes bad, um, but if it was a case of um, stolen account takeover or stolen identity, right? Like I didn't make this transaction, then in that instance, the wallet provider would be the one responsible for um, for that transaction. So they do. Uh, and can add um, an additional sort of protection um, because the merchant has been sort of removed from the authentication process, if you will. Um, I'm trying to think through on an Apple Pay transaction, which really works quite different because it's just a tokenization of a credit card versus a full sort of logged in and wallet. But again, there you would have had sort of the did the user biometrically authenticate? And so um, th there is a lower instance of fraud there, not to say that it, it can't happen. Yeah. Thanks. Um, on, this, on this topic of fraud also, uh, do you have any suggestions or solutions for repeated you know, fraudulent transactions where people are trying to guess credit cards, we, we have this trouble a lot with, with the merchant accounts. Um, fraud's a big topic. Um, I think your question's specific to carding, which is the testing of credit cards. Uh, and often those are um, 
sort of scripted attacks. So you'll want to do things to um, try to mitigate um, velocity and having a lot of uh, detections and rules sort of up front of um, hopefully even being able to get to the point where a credit card transaction would be coming through. So uh, there's how you checkpoint a user through the site so that you understand who they are and their identity or device fingerprinting that's been used along the way. So I think there's how much mitigation can you do in advance of ever getting to the checkout? And then once you get to checkout, that hopefully there's some rules in place that are um, trying to mitigate how uh, rapid uh, it, a particular user, uh, is it you know velocity based on the number of times that I've seen uh, this user this device to the extent that you can tell, this IP, et cetera. A lot of times they'll be bouncing IPs. But um, to the extent that you can tell that it's the same user, maybe it's the same card number, maybe it's the same email address, there's something about it that uh, has a profile that tells you this might be the same user repeatedly, and then building in blocks so that when you see those patterns, you're mitigating them down to a very narrow band. Uh, what do you think is going to happen to the brands um, and the payment providers that maybe are built on older technology and aren't up to speed nowadays with digital wallets or, or better uh, APIs for integrations? How are they um, going to fit into the market for the future? Do you see them failing or do you think they'll, they'll adapt? The brands being like card brands like Visa, MasterCard, Amex? Uh, or no, no? So the, the PSP. So uh, an example in the UK, uh, Opeo, which was mm -hmm. formerly SagePay, that's... Um, some of their, their gateways are, are older technology. So how, how do you think the market's going to shift with those older technology, those, those brands, compared to the, the more modern integrations these days? Um, I think there's, I don't know that I 100% understand the question, but um, I think it's standalone payment brands and PSPs versus more embedded solutions. Yeah. Um, and it's gonna, it comes down a little bit to flexibility. And um, having a standalone payment relationship uh, can make a lot of sense if you're using many disparate systems or channels and you need that payment system to be able to cut across those. Um, if most of your business can be conducted within a single system, then having a fully embedded payment system that can make reconciliation and have um, full integration into all aspects of that system is actually more efficient. So it's really around, um, I think, for an individual merchant, how they run their business and the extent to which my source of truth or my system of record is really all in one place versus the extent to which it's disparate. And when it's disparate, that um, having a standalone payment service provider uh, can make a lot of sense. Thanks. Hi, great talk. So you had also talked about like um, linking your identity and authenticating like some type of payment. So I see this like with like shop pay or some other like one click checkout solutions. What's your take on like, there, there's been some successful ones like shop pay and then there's been some like failed ones like fast failed. Do you feel like um, people aren't ready quite yet for like one click checkout or where do you think that will go? I think we're seeing evidence that people are ready and, and they're using it. Um, we have uh, 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 the, the ones that we've seen that are not, um, I guess you said failed, uh, some of the ones that, that didn't see success. I think it's really around um, their channel strategy and their integration strategy. Uh, there was also quite a bit in the monetization model. So at the end of the day, it's sort of um, who's providing the service. Are they providing it at an extra fee or not? And is that extra fee then worth it to a merchant um, or a platform to integrate it? Uh, to the extent that um, it's included and it's free, I think we'll see greater adoption. Where we see adoption uh, from a merchant perspective, then the question is, will consumers use it? And I think we are seeing that consumers will use it and, in fact, um, really like uh, the ability to not have to create an account 
um, to have things sort of remembered for them. Again, that linkage of, of identity to payment credential. Um, so I, I think in the ones that have uh, not been successful, that it isn't because of the technology or the use case, and it's more a function of um, broader distribution, economics, and integration strategy. Awesome, thank you. That's pretty much it we, that we all have time for. So thank you, Kayla, and thank everyone, you. break for lunch.
Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the afternoon session here at WordCamp West San Diego. Everyone have a good lunch? Yeah. Good, yeah. If you're coming in, I encourage you to move towards the front of the room. Love to see your faces a little bit closer. So just a few quick reminders um, before we get started. If you haven't been to the sponsor hall, highly encourage you walk over there. Um, without the generous contribution of our sponsors, this event would not be possible. So right outside the door here um, across the lobby sponsor hall. Also, if you're sharing anything on social, make sure you're using our hashtag, hashtag WCUS. And then we also have a, a reminder about Contributor Day on Sunday. If you have any questions, feel free to ask any of our volunteers. So our next session is an anthropologist, a WordPress developer, and a lawyer walk into a bar with Cassandra Decker. Cassandra Decker is a data designer who focuses on driving efficiency in programs, projects, procedures, and products. She earned a master's degree in applied anthropology with a cultural and economic focus from the University of South Florida and a bachelor's degree in Spanish, English, and political science from the University of Iowa. She has, almost, she has more than 15 years of experience in qualitative and quantitative research, conducting results-based work in English and Spanish. She is the owner and principal consultant of CRD Impact, which uses community research, equitable design, and inclusive marketing practices to identify, analyze, and interpret data. By identifying disparities, resource acquisition, and opportunities, Decker develops and implements solution-based responses respectful of the voices of the communities served, all within the framework of results-based initiatives. So please welcome Cassandra Decker. Can you all hear me okay? Okay. I'm actually, I will start with the disclaimer that I'm not super techie, which is really funny to admit at a word camp, but, um, sorry. <laughs> okay. So first of all, hi, um, I'm excited to be here at my very first word camp. Everyone has been amazing. Um, thank you to the organizers and also to the very trusting people who have allowed me to hold a talk with such a ridiculous name. Uh, really do appreciate that. So um, today I want to chat with you all about the importance of building diversity within our community and in general among those who build the web and some practical steps to walk alongside those who are different from you. So if we're being honest with ourselves, we're all different from each other, right? Um, we're going to talk about neurodivergence, poverty, trauma, and then after I've thoroughly freaked everyone out, I'm going to provide a few practical steps to work with others. So I want you to, oops, I think I advanced one too many. Or I didn't. I deleted my own slides. So, okay. Um, I want you to quickly consider what's called um, your positionality. So, I had definition of positionality. Um, positionality is basically the situation that you grew up in and how that upbringing has created your own identity. So, it is usually a social and political context. Um, and then whatever your positionality is, so how you grew up, affects your epistemology, which is how you see the world. So since we all grew up differently, we all have a different world view. Um, for my positionality, I am a white, US born, small town Iowa, uh, heterosexual or straight, cis female, whose first language is English. A few limiting injuries aside, I have no physical injuries or impediments um, that would be noticeable in my day-to-day -day life or my work. I grew up within the Presbyterian or PCUSA Christian denomination that focused heavily economic opportunities for low-income individuals. 
I have two parents that are teachers, and at a very young age, it became a household run by a single mother where we experienced significant economic barriers. Um, these social and political contexts that I grew up in created my identity either through acceptance, modification, or rejection of these ideas and the situations I have experienced. So due to this positionality, my experiences, I have a certain epistemology or view of the world. Because not a single person in this world has the same positionality. All have varying epistemologies. This makes our interactions tricky, exciting, and at times so before I go any farther, I do want to make crystal clear that simply being born white and in the United States gives me a certain level of privilege. Any topic that I discuss here that is not part of my positionality or my actual experiences comes from the ability to access literature on the topic or from very generous friends who are of a different positionality and have taken the time and had the patience to share their experiences with me. Um, forewarning, I do get very passionate at times, and if I feel like a word is above like the PG-14, I will randomly use the word bunnies. So if you hear references to bunnies, there's probably another word in my head, just forewarned. So um, going forward, designing the internet. Is the internet the great hope or is it the great divide? How many people in the 90s and early 2000s remember reading information about the internet as being the great hope for challenging poverty? Does anyone remember that? Okay. So during that time, all these articles were released about how the internet could be the great equalizer, especially in low-income areas in developing countries. The idea was with the ability to disperse information throughout the world, disadvantaged communities would be able to access information and even jobs like never before. However, around 2006, 2010, people realized that those glorious hopes were not being realized. Those able to afford technology watched their opportunities flourish while poor communities, in particular communities of color, were kept from the tools necessary to access the web and therefore to access the opportunities that the web provides. So not only is access to the internet creating a divide, those who have been designing the internet, or the web, I guess is probably the more accurate way to say it, so all of us in the room, were not always closely linked to each other because we span across the globe with hugely different positionalities and barriers and experiences that are invisible and less divulged. In other words, even if we do not necessarily connect to people who are in poverty, do we even connect to people that we think we are connecting to? The first group of individuals, oh, hey, there's my positionality slide. Oh, <laughs> quick glance there. <laughs> so the very first group I want to discuss is those who have a unique yet invisible trait, those of you who are in the neurodivergent community. So those are, who are neurodivergent have a special brain chemistry that imbues them with unique abilities but can also make it very difficult to follow cultural norms. So there is both biological neurodivergence and acquired neurodivergence. So many are more familiar with biological neurodivergence, um, predominantly ADHD and if you're on the spectrum. Um, our work in creating the web, a world within a world, often attracts those who are neurodivergent. The thrill of problem solving, creativity, can be especially fascinating to the neurodivergent community. At the same time, the neurodivergent community is not well understood by neurotypical brains. Neurodivergence often requires very clear answers, sometimes even a yes or no, and certain social cues might get lost 
especially over the written word. Acquired neurodivergence is a little less known, so it occurs in two main ways, a medical situation or an emotional experience that alters the pathways of the brain. Acquired neurodivergence can be permanent or it can heal partially or fully over time. A great medical example would be a brain injury. I want to focus, however, on emotional acquired neurodivergence, especially around the topic of trauma. I will go into general trauma later and why it's so important to understand trauma in our communication during this time of the COVID recovery, but I want to touch first on post-traumatic stress disorder, which is more commonly known as PTSD. It is estimated that six out of 100 people in the United States have PTSD based on reports alone, meaning that only those who have come forth and been diagnosed are counted in this number. Many people who have PTSD are never able to seek assistance. An estimated 3.6% of adults in the United States have acquired PTSD in the last year alone. It affects women more often than men, with an estimated 5.2% versus 1.8%. The effects of PTSD vary greatly from individual to individual, but in general, having PTSD means experiencing moments that seemingly hijack your brain. Being unable to process memories, difficulties in focus, and trusting others. It's not uncommon to be scared most, if not all the time, and it's very easy to doubt every interaction that you have. PTSD is invisible and certainly makes communication difficult. So what can neurodivergence look like in an everyday interaction? So I'm going to draw on my personal experiences here. In terms of biological neurodivergence, I am going to share a, an experience with a coworker and friend who I spoke to and got permission to share this experience with you all. Um, I'm a project manager. I work with uh, the most wonderful, diverse group of developers. I'm a better person for knowing each and every one of them. They are very patient with me about my lack of technical knowledge. Uh, they teach me and sometimes they even calm me down when stressed. So um, shout out to Chris, my colleague, who is always just like, breathe, Cassandra, breathe. Their steadiness and clarity balances my passion and straight up giddiness. And while I truly love them as friends and colleagues, and I'm sure they care for me as well, we annoy the absolute bunnies out of each other sometimes. Some of them might be neurodivergent, I don't know, and it really isn't important that I know. I know that we communicate differently and that sometimes it gets messy. So my department is pretty consistently 150% over capacity. One time we had an employee from another team assist us project managers part-time. She was on a particularly difficult task of mine and I saw a comment from my developer teammate from whom I got permission to share this. Um, I am good friends with him. He is the uncle to my kittens, right? So uh, very truly one of the kindest guys I have ever known. I was not thrilled at his comment though. Um, and I sent him a message that was like, hey, why are you being so rude here? She's helping out. Can you back off a little? And he said, I'm, I'm just laying out facts. Like, how would you have said this? And I was like, okay, well, in my nice, indirect, Iowa nice language, this is how I would say it. And he completely shocked me with his answer. He said, I honestly do not see the difference. I cannot tell in the written word. I, I cannot understand emotion most time in the written word. And so this is likely neurodivergence talking. It is at the very least indirect first direct communication, which in itself leaves a lot of room for misunderstanding. Messy, right? 
Um, by the way, if you have this struggle, my friend has continued to deliver information the same way, but he just adds an emoji at the end, like a little smiley face to soften the delivery to change the tone of the text. Um, acquired neurodivergence is pretty hard to identify at times. So that, that was an example of more biological. Acquired neurodivergence is the PTSD that I mentioned earlier. Um, you can know someone for years and not know that they are navigating life while experiencing emotional trauma that has resulted in acquired neurodivergence. So um, two and a half years ago, I left a domestically violent relationship at the height of COVID. It involved leaving two small children for whom I had been full-time mom for several years. And while the strongest thing I have ever done and will ever do in my life was leave that situation, it broke my brain. My brain just broke. It stopped working. I could not stop thinking about these incidents. I could not recall memories. I slept all the time and I was looping. So I would say the same thing over and over and over again. And while it certainly has gotten much better, almost two and a half years later, it's still not the same. I don't know if it will ever get completely better. I do know that having that glimpse into a world that others experience every day has, been, has made me a better person. And I am grateful for that. Um, so collective grief and trauma and why this matters. So why PTSD matters, why neurodivergence matters, and why understanding grief and trauma matters. This is my favorite meme from Twitter, probably ever. Um, if you are listening and unable to see the slide, I will read it to you. It says, friend, while over the phone, do you think the quarantine has changed you? Me, while knitting a dress for the raccoons in my backyard? No. Right? This is a hilarious example, but it is amazing how much our life experiences change us and how difficult it is to detect these changes in ourselves, even when asked a direct question. So types of trauma, um, this is just a very quick overview of trauma. So you have what's called acute trauma, which is one example. This could be being robbed, being in a car accident, for example. You could have chronic trauma, which is more like childhood abuse or domestic violence. You can have complex trauma, which are different traumas that map onto each other and begin to remind you. So for example, say that you were in a situation where you experienced childhood abuse, and then you're in interactions where you experience workplace abuse, and they will remind each other, or they will, the, the situations will become interlinked and you will not be able to separate them. That is an example of complex trauma. And do remember that complex trauma does result in, can result in neurodivergence. So can result in your brain not feeling like your brain. If you've not had the opportunity to learn about trauma more than this, I want to suggest that you take time diving into TED Talks and literature on the topic. I really suggest that you go and take what's called the ACEs test, which stands for Adverse Childhood Experiences, because especially if you underwent trauma as a child, you might be surprised at some of the information that is provided, and it might perhaps provide you with much needed grace for yourself. If you did not have significant trauma as a child, it can help you understand another layer of these invisible barriers with those whom you interact. So we are in a situation right now, all of us in this room, where we are experiencing a form of historical trauma. We all have gone through COVID. Everyone in the world has been undergoing COVID. This is absolutely one of the largest shared experiences, I hope, that we will ever have. <laughs> Besides world peace, world peace would be great. I'd be so for that shared experience. Um, it is not the same as other types of historical trauma. 
which are usually within a certain group. So for example, the Holocaust was a shared trauma, a historical trauma for the Jewish community. We of course have slavery in the United States. That was a historical trauma whose effects still continue today. Um, genocides, etc. So historical trauma will look different as we're, ex as we're experiencing this, but we still have trauma in a way, each and every one of us. I was speaking to someone last night and they were like, oh yeah, COVID was great for me. And I was like, how did you feel about not getting to see your friends and family? Oh, that wasn't so great, right? I am personally very nervous standing here. I have not been in a group of people for a very long time. Uh, I certainly haven't done any presentations in a very long time. So I'm experiencing a type of trauma, just simply trying to reemerge into a world that I used to be very comfortable in. So um, why does this matter? Has anyone heard of trauma responses? Is that something that people are familiar with? Okay, so if you've experienced trauma, you sometimes respond to situations in a way that comes from your trauma rather than from your original thinking brain. So it might be that some people describe it as a knee-jerk reaction, like, oh, I can't believe I said that, right? I just reacted. It is more common for us in this, in this historical trauma moment to have those knee-jerk reactions. And, you know, I am watching it happen over the internet every day. Um, oh, Twitter. Twitter with the doom scrolling, right? Um, just people really getting at each other, feeling criticized and reacting. And maybe people were sensitive before, but you are certainly more sensitive once you have experienced trauma. So throughout the internet, when you interact with people, when you interact with people that you're working with or clients, um, those trauma responses are real and they exist. So, all right, this is my, my midpoint, you're freaking us out, what do we do slide. I grew up watching The Simpsons. I love The Simpsons. So this was just mostly for me, honestly, right here. <laughs> Um, it's really overwhelming when you think about all of this, when you think about poverty and racism and structural inequities. It is very, very hard to think about practical steps you can take. So I wanted to give some very, very practical steps that we can take in our community and outside of our community. And so the very first one um, is to literally check yourself. When something is happening, reflect back. Am I being a jerk? Could I be nicer? Are they being a jerk? Do I just think they're being a jerk? Just, you know, take a deep breath, reflect, check yourself. So we've, <laughs> I don't know if this was common before I was at my work. We have some kind of explosive clients right now. Um, they are very scared. I am sure that if you are sitting in the audience and you have business sense that's greater than my own, you are wondering what the economy is about to do. So, you know, we have some people who are like, I could die any minute. Let's go all in. Let's do it all. And they are like full in. And then we have other people who are like, I experienced real hardship during COVID. I am terrified. I do not want to lose my home. I want to make sure there is food on my table and I need to step back. So if you are experiencing clients changing their minds back and forth, keep that in mind that this might be a type of trauma that they are working through. Um, so colleagues, your inner, interpersonal relationships with your colleagues and those trauma responses I mentioned, I certainly do have trauma responses. And I fully admit that sometimes I have knee-jerk reactions. And I am very, very lucky that I have a group of individuals who are supportive and can, can walk me through those. I'm not saying I flip out on people, I'm just saying that it is not hard to misinterpret. It is very, has anyone in here ever been misunderstood 
if you all don't raise your hand, then you're just tired. I've just, <laughs> we have all been misunderstood. We have all misunderstood others. So just give yourself that second to just pause and think. I know we're, we're a highly efficient community. We want to go, 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 go. It is okay to pause. Um, embrace your ignorance. You are ignorant. I am ignorant. We are all ignorant because you absolutely cannot possibly have the same experience as everyone else. You are going to be ignorant in something. That is okay. That does not mean you're a bad person. Um, I really want to stress, and I, I apologize, I did not figure out how to say her name ahead of time. Um, Pecha, Pecha, maybe, is having a talk, was that close? Okay, thank you, of developing cultural intelligence. And if you're interested in that, I want to highly encourage you intend. It looks amazing. Um, and she will probably go into a lot more detail about this. But please remember, as you interact with people across the globe, that they have different cultural practices at work, within their family, within their friends. Even if you are interacting with someone who looks very similar to you and grew up in the same area and has the same religion, they are still different. You still do not know what they have been through. So you also don't know what's happening. You don't know if their cat just died or they're going through a divorce. You just don't know these things, right? Um, we actually like don't walk around with hashtags over our heads, like hashtag neurodivergent, hashtag survivor, right? Nobody, you don't know. You don't know these things. Um, so, so don't assume. Um, you can be best friends with someone, for example, of another race or culture all your life and hear hours about their experiences and you will never get it. You will just never understand. I, will, I have a very patient, wonderful friend who is a black woman who lives in Florida and she has explained to me some of her experiences and while I am horrified, I will never understand what it is like to be her. She can talk to me all day, every day, and I will never get it because I still get to walk around with my white skin and my white privilege. So I was speaking last night. It was very interesting um, with Alan, <laughs> right, Carol, um, whose technical skills are far beyond my own. He's a software. He was talking about software. And he brought up the importance of learning different software languages because if you only learn one, then it's difficult to identify what other specific languages, what, what is very specific to that language versus what is kind of universal to different software languages. And I think that's a great example of cultures and languages. The more you learn, right, the more you understand the beauty of uniqueness and diversity and also how things are different. Um, if you, are, if you are listening to this, and I, I just have to make this, this comment, if you're listening to this and you are white, especially if you're a white male, and you have felt the defensiveness flick up, um, send it to the back seat. You did not create this unjust, racist, unfair world. You do get to challenge it. You do get to look every day at others as equals, and try to rip down this unfair system and rebuild it. And especially those of you creating the web, you get to do this for others all around the world. And that is super important. So I could not um, leave this talk without talking about assessments. So some, very, some people are very data driven. They connect better with data and that's great. As an anthropologist, I have to tell you, I hate personality assessments um, with like every inch of my being, right? I feel like personality assessments are more reflective of those who create them than those who are taking them. If you ever have a consultant that wants to start with a personality assessment, maybe reconsider that consultant for the record. Um, there, there are great things to pull from certain assessments, though. So 
the two assessments that I want to suggest if you're interested in assessments and taking is the strengths finder assessment and the disc communication assess disc communication assessment. Um, when I say take the, I mean it's great when you take the the strengths finders because you're you're like, oh hey, I can put this on my resume. Someone said what I can do really easily right here. Talking points, woohoo! That's awesome. More important is looking at your strength and realize, realizing how it ostracizes other people. So how your strength makes it difficult to connect to others. And I will give you an example from my own strength finders. So input is one of my strengths, and I, sorry, I have to read this because it's not from my own brain. You are likely to archive, that is preserve, your discoveries so you can use them later. Because of your strengths, you see yourself as highly qualified to perform specialized tasks. Undoubtedly, your uncommon vocabulary distinguishes you from the ordinary person. Terrible language, by the way. Ordinary person, thumbs down. Um, adding words to your professional vocabulary indicates that your knowledge base is expanding. As a result, you can converse more easily with experts about a subject. Furthermore, you can understand what they are saying to one another. So I'm a smarty pants. That's awesome. I'm cool with that. I'm not cool with speaking in a way that ostracizes other people and makes them feel like just because they don't know my specific vocabulary that they somehow don't understand what I'm talking about. I have to be very intentional to use language that is not set only in my field. It is so easy to bring the ivory tower into your real life and wrap yourself around with people that only speak your language. Don't do that. You're missing out on so many wonderful things when you cannot communicate across the board. That's a, that's a big problem of mine. I really have had to work on that. And I have other areas that I also need to work on. And you can look through my strengths finder and you can easily find them. So if you decide to take the strengths finder, you know, thumbs up, you got some help on your resume there, right? Also look at what you might be doing to others based on your own strengths. The other assessment I like, which is a, a great one, is the DISC assessment. So DISC is just more or less how you communicate. If you're a dominant communicator, if you're an inspiring communicator, if you're supportive, or if you're cautious. I will tell you absolutely your life experiences change your communication style. I took this, this um, DISC assessment several years ago, probably like five or six years ago, and I was a strong D, so I was dominant speaker with an S, supportive. After going through domestic violence, I am much more on that CS. Black people frequently are within the C category because they are taught to make space for white people to talk and physically step back so that white people have space. So if you're white and you're speaking with a person of color, please shut up and let them talk. Give them space. It is not a person of color's responsibility to push themselves into a conversation. So, building a diverse community to reflect a diverse world. Is anyone in here into ADA? Does ADA work? No, maybe, sort of. Oh, hands, thank you. Thank you for raising your hand. So I have just recently learned about ADA. I have a developer on my team who is very kind and has even shown me things like the wave tool. Um, and he actually has spoken to me about his desire 
to, from the onset, as you are even speaking with clients to design products, websites, etc., from the very beginning, make it about ADA. Your clients are trusting you. So present the information as if it's absolutely vital. Very important, very, very, I would hope simple thing to do, um, but something that we need to become part of our cultural norms is to build things from the onset in the framework of ADA. Um, an equitable world means implementing equitable practices within our whole system. So it's not only about hiring to check a box, like the diversity box, like, hey, we did some diversity. What's up, what's up, that's great. Um, but you actually have to design a world of equality by providing tools that are meant to increase equality. And this is when I am going to slightly get on a soapbox. So um, the whole adage of like, well, I wanted to hire a woman. I had a binder full of women. Sorry, Mitt Romney, you're never going to get away with that. Um, none were qualified. I wanted to hire a person of color. None were qualified. There are whole workshops that break down the precon preconceived notions based on prejudices. And I am not qualified to give that talk. I encourage you to go to one of those talks. But if you are insistent that this is the case, that there are not qualified people of color to be hired, then you need to make a pathway. So I used to be in the nonprofit world and I was doing economic impact programming, which is a fancy way of saying using volunteers to help kids read was a big thing. And there is a company, I was in Manatee County, Florida. There's a company called ITWGSE. They are aerospace engineers for the government. And they have been donating to the organization with, with whom I worked um, for years. And they wanted to be more involved. So we created a system for them to have people rotating to volunteer to read with children. And they weren't exactly sure if they were making a difference, I think, at first. They really got into it, and that was great. Um, but over time, they built these relationships with the school. They got to know the populations. By the way, I believe, I did not look it up, I believe Palm View, the school, is about 80% children of color, mostly the Latinx, and then Latinx and black children, high second language learners in that area. Um, so, yeah, so over time, they created these relationships with the school. They started helping the school apply for technology grants. And now they have this little known funding called the Wozniak Grant, which I'm hoping I said correctly, and people are hopefully understanding a little bit maybe what that means. Um, so this school that was so horrifically underfunded has now been provided technology for children who have, you know, are, are hoping that they have meals when they leave school. And their parents are being provided with support to not only teach their children, but learn themselves. And that came from a company deciding to read with children. I think it's about seven years later, but you can build pathways. You can choose to build pathways. If you're not sure how to do it, if there's not a nonprofit or an agency in your area that can help you do it, you have my information. I would be happy to help you do it. I cannot imagine the number of lives those five volunteers who started out will change over the course of time. So, we want to drive people toward equity through education, support, and being so creative that you come up with something that people just, they want, they desire to have. Put effort into equity, 
put heart into equity and let creativity drive equity. Try to understand each other. Try to understand that you can't understand each other. I think it's easiest to understand people when I'm like, I have no idea what you've experienced. I like you. You're a human. You matter. If you're uncomfortable with this, good. I'm uncomfortable with this. I have placed myself in communities that I have no, I used to work with migrant workers. Um, I worked with a group of migrant workers from Guatemala who had um, fled to the United States. They had put their, their youngest children and older adults into, the city, into a city in Guatemala City because the village next to them had been slaughtered. So they moved everyone in, came to the United States. Some of them had tuberculosis, I think. No access to health care, food, and they would send all the money they could back to Guatemala. I don't really care what your politics are. You can't understand that. You can never understand what it's like to flee your hometown into a world that probably is going to hate you. You can't get it. So I, 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 I was with them, and I'm still terrified to step in it when I talk to other people. I am so afraid I'm going to be insensitive, and you know what? That's okay. It's okay. Because the alternative is to isolate myself and not try to understand, and that is unacceptable. Everyone in this community is so kind. I told people this was like my first word camp, and I was like scared out of my socks about speaking. Don't worry, everyone wants you to do well. You're going to be great. It's totally fine. Awesome. More people should get to experience this. We are not diverse until we have 51% people of color in these rooms. We are not diverse until we are openly ensuring accessibility. We are welcoming. I have, to, I have to say I did not work this into my talk. The trans community, we see you. We're here for you. We need to be more vocal about it. All right, this community is beautiful. Please don't keep it siloed. Please try to understand each other. Um, my boyfriend has ADHD. I have learned a lot. I have certainly, he also has a podcast about it if you're interested. Talk to me about that later. If you want to make the world a more equitable place, you can. It's hard. It's a long road. We have a long way to go. If you want to make people feel accepted and loved, you can. You can. So use your voice. Use your power of designing the web to create as beautiful, diverse, and maybe even terrifying a world as the one we live in. Um, thank you so much for coming. And please feel free to, you know, at me or email me or whatnot. So. A minute for questions, if there's any questions. We're good. Awesome. Let's hear again for Cassandra.
Hello, everybody. Welcome to your second afternoon session. Uh, I am not going to go through all of these announcements because I think you probably all know them by heart by now. Um, who's been over to the sponsor hall? Has everyone made their way over there? OK, cool. Yeah, if you haven't, it's directly across the lobby. Highly recommend you take a walk around. Um, if you're sharing on social, make sure you're using the hashtag WCUS. And now I'll introduce our speaker. So this next session is called Your Technical Support Philosophy is Losing Money and Angering Customers with Ben Meredith. So Ben is a developer and a technical support lead focused on human interaction with WordPress. He thrives on making users and their sites play nicely with developers and their products like an ambassador from one to the other. A graduate of the University of North Carolina and a lifelong Southerner, Ben lives in South Carolina as a father of three and a husband of one very patient wife. He works full time as the director of customer service and support for GiveWP, which is a liquid web brand, where he spends his time wowing customers, cracking jokes, and solving problems. When he's not working, he's likely parenting or playing some blues-infused Southern rock with his band. Please welcome Ben Meredith. Check, check, is this thing on? Hello, thank you for that wonderful welcome. Um, so I'm gonna start in July 2008. My parent, uh, my wife and I had been parents for about two months, two months and some change, and we were at a uh, yet another uh, doctor's appointment. We'd gotten it all clear when my son was born, everything looked great, but then at the two month checkup, they came and they said, something's weird. We just want to send you to a, a specialist, a, a surgeon, craniofacial surgeon, just to get a second opinion kind of deal. So there we are, freshly minted parents. Again, this is our first child, and we're sitting in the uh, waiting room or the, the exam room, whatever, waiting for the surgeon to come back. And she walks in the room, and she had one of those smiles that sort of betrayed bad news, right? Something bad was coming. And so she launched right in. She said, your son has acute craniosynostosis of the posterior temporal suture. And I remember thinking, cool. <laughs> I have no idea what these words mean, right? You know, it's glazed over, you know, trying my best to have a poker face. I remember glancing at my wife, like, does she know what that means? I have no idea what that means. Well, the surgeon caught that cue from both of us and, and continued, said, you know how when you're born, your skull's got those soft spots. There's one in the front and there's a couple on the back where the, the bones need to grow together. Well, one of those spots is called a suture. And one of those spots specifically on the back end of your son's head has grown together prematurely. And so we need to go in and fix that. Now I'm going to fast forward and totally change gears to July of, 20, or July of this year, uh, 2022. So my wife was dropping off or picking up rather, kids from school. The car started making a funny noise. And she calls, we had a, a road trip planned for like a week later. So she calls our regular mechanic and says something along the lines of, hey, do you have any spots for me to come in and check out what's going on with the car? And they were booked up. They're like, no, can't get you in. And so she's like, oh, that's fine. I'll just swing by another car shop and, and see what's going on. So she stops at, a again, a new mechanic, never, never been there before. And she tells him what's going on. The mechanic goes outside, climbs under the car, comes back out, all, you know, typical mechanic, covered in grease, and says something about rotors and something about $400, and then turns and looks at the person, his coworker, sitting behind the, the desk, says something in a different language, and they laugh, the two of them. And then he turns and looks back at my wife and says, we can fit you in today. Now let's fast forward, actually rewind this time, to July of 2019. I was a senior support technician. That picture's really small, so you might not be able to see it. Senior support technician for GiveWP, the donation platform for WordPress. And we get a ticket from a person, and they said, we just sent out an email to 2,500 plus people, inviting them to donate on our website. And when they click on the link, they get this. There's been a critical error on your site. So we're getting flooded with people who we want to be donating and instead they're telling us they can't donate and they're freaking out about it. What do we do? Technical support is a conversation between you 
as technical support people and the people that you're talking to. And, and like a good conversation, it's primarily all about how well you can communicate one with the other. And so there's two ways you can engage in a conversation. You can either be actively engaged, interestedly engaged, uh, or you can be flippant, you can be uninterested, and you can be disengaged. I call that second option, and for the rest of this talk, I'll be referring to it as that. I call that second option old school support. And I'm going to make a bold assertion. Old school support is killing you. I don't necessarily mean literally, but in a metaphorical sense, absolutely. And if you run out of customers and you run out of money and then you run out of food, maybe it could be physically killing you. But old school technical support, this mentality of, um, and I'll describe a, a few of the, the things there, but what, in, in the old school support mentality, what's the purpose of the first person you talk to in technical support? To talk to the second person, right? Can I talk to your manager? You are clearly incompetent and just the person who answers the, the first row of tickets. I need to talk to somebody who can actually fix the problem. And that's a rampant thing. And I, I will argue it's something that we all kind of uh, subconsciously do. Um, but there's, it, it creates a hostile environment and leads to dissatisfaction really on both ends. Dissatisfaction for the customer, dissatisfaction internally. Your team does not enjoy their job as much uh, because they spend a lot of time um, making people upset. Um, and I think old school technical support is really built on three faulty premises. So first, the first faulty premise. Uh, some of you are old enough like me to remember Steve Jobs. There he is around the same time with his friend Bill Gates. Uh, but Steve Jobs standing on a stage in 2007 and holding a device over his head that no one had ever seen before. It was called the iPhone. And, and I can remember one of the points that he had during this talk uh, of launching the iPhone was, it doesn't need a manual. And again, if you're old like me and you can remember around this time when you got a cell phone, it came with a manual. It was thick. It was like bigger than the phone in some cases. And it was written in like five languages and it taught you how to set the clock and how to set an alarm on the phone and how to configure the snake game. And you could do like a little welcome message when the phone powered on that like encouraged you for your day or whatever. Um, and so cell phones came with manuals. So Steve Jobs was standing there and saying, this product is so good that it doesn't need a manual. It doesn't need technical support. So that's our first, first faulty premise of old school technical support is that you can make a product so good that it doesn't need technical support. I would invite all of us to go to the San Diego Apple store and let's check in on the Genius Bar, see how long the line is and see if there's anybody there that needs technical support. See, it's a lie that you can make a product so good that it doesn't need technical support. And we'll talk in a minute about how it can bleed into or what that looks like. But I think it's super important to recognize that that's a lie, that there's no such thing as a product so good that everyone will know how to use it intuitively and they'll never submit a support ticket. They're never, they'll never be unaware of how to use the product. So that's our first premise, that uh, first faulty premise. Second faulty premise. This is essentially that we take our, our product or whatever it is that we make, service, product, plug-in, theme, whatever it is, and we have these buckets within the company. There's like the sales bucket and there's a marketing bucket and there's a development slash product bucket and there's maybe finance, whatever. There's all of these different buckets. Well, we view, well, the faulty premise here is we view uh, support technicians as essentially in the development bucket, but they're not good enough to be at the top of the development bucket. They're, they're like junior, junior, junior developers. Like, they're developers that if they were better at their job, they would have a development job. And so instead, we just stick them into the development bucket and we're like, answer tickets, ticket guy, ticket girl. D go, go over there and answer our tickets. And there's, it's very easy, and I, I would argue very prevalent, that we view technical support in that same lens. Like what you do, when you read the title of my talk, your technical support philosophy is killing you, you're like, I'm not real technical, so this talk it might not be for me. That might be why the room is half empty. It might also be that COVID has kept us away from each other and the hallway track is really appealing uh, at this conference. Um, and so it's been really fun reconnecting with folks. But that's what, essentially what we do with our technical support teams is that we view them in the same lens, the same category as product development. 
They're the people that mess with the code. And I'm going to argue in a minute that that's definitely not. But first, if it was maybe a little offensive to call uh, tech support folks like nerds that aren't even good enough to be good nerds, I'm going to maybe cast us in slightly better light. Again, I'm talking about myself here. The third premise is that tech support is exclusively holding the hose firefighting, right? What we do in tech support is we're the hose holders. There's a fire over there. You point the water at the fire until there's not a fire and then make, make the fire go away. Well, when you're done, you turn off the hose and you're done. That, that's how we view our technical support teams. And it's a faulty premise of old school technical support is that that is exclusively what we do. We just point the hose at the fire until there's not a fire and we make it go away. And I would argue that, so again, our three premises, first, you can make a product so good that it doesn't need technical support. Second, tech support is like Bush league development. Um, that's a NASCAR reference and it's a dated one at this point. And I'm from the South, so I should probably explain. Junior, junior, junior developers was a better way of saying it. So the uh, first point, you can make a product so good it doesn't need technical support. Second point, develop or technicians are essentially developers that aren't good enough at their job and then third is that tech support stops when you no longer need to hold the hose and point it at the fire and so i would argue that all of us have subconsciously internalized that and those are big words so let's unpack them a little bit <coughs> excuse me when i say subconscious i mean we don't think about it like I, i'm not actively thinking the people on my support team are just developers who aren't good enough at their job. You're not actively thinking that, but subconsciously on some level, I think all of us do that and it works itself out in specific ways. So we're gonna look back at those same three points through the lens of, okay, how does it come out? If I have subconsciously internalized that, or even sometimes consciously uh, internalized that, let's look back and see how, how that works itself out in our real day-to-day -day life. If you've internalized the Steve Jobs premise of you can make a product so good that it doesn't need technical support. Now, every time you open your inbox and there's 20 in there, that's 20 little indictments on your product, right? That's 20 people saying, man, if you guys could make a better product, we would, we'd really like that, you know? And, and you'd start to take it personally. So inbox zero becomes the goal if I've internalized that first premise, right? I, I want to make the support tickets go away because they're all judging me. They're all telling me that I'm not good enough at my job or that our product's not good enough. Um, and so every touch point is a bad thing. And I would argue, um, and uh, we say this, I say this all the time with my team at GiveWP, is that every single support ticket is, a, is somebody saying that they care enough about your product to want it to work exactly how they want it to work. So did you see how I reframed it? Instead of your product is bad, it's now your product is worth being angry at. Nobody emails angry, angrily about products that they don't like. They just stop using them. They get a refund and they move on if it's a paid product or they just move on if it's a free product. So if they're mad enough to email you about it uh, or frustrated enough or whatever, every email that you get from a customer or a user is an indication that you're doing something right. And man, that makes going to the inbox a lot better. When you see 25 tickets or 100 tickets piled up, you can say, there's a lot of people out there using our stuff and they care about it a lot and let's go and make those people's day. Otherwise, man, you, you're looking at mental health issues for your support technicians um, because if every ticket's an indictment, every ticket's a problem with you or your product, it's really, really weighs on you to open the inbox in the morning and to see that little number up by the inbox of how, how many tickets there are. And you start doing things like obsessing over time to first reply, or you obsess over metrics like how many replies you can get per day, because the whole goal is to get to inbox zero. Let's get, make these people go away so that my job is done for the day. Uh, and that, that becomes that. So the second premise, if they're just code folks that aren't good enough at their job, to get a real coding job, what that looks like, the way that works itself out is heavy lines around scope, where you're like, we don't do that. They, they email with a ticket and they're like, the, your product is not playing nicely with XYZ plugin. And you go, well, we, we don't fix XYZ plugin, sorry. 
and you draw a heavy line around scope because after all, I just told you that these are developers, but they're just not really even cream of the crop developers. They, they, can't, they can't even fully make our product. Why do I think they could fix XYZ plugin? And so it, it starts with heavy lines around scope. It starts to look like passing the buck when people do have a problem. As soon as I can isolate it down to, oh, this is a problem in that third party solution, that's what you're gonna say when in old school support. You're gonna say, sorry, gotta go to your host. Your host is blocking the HT access file and that's causing a problem. We can't help with that, bye. <laughs> you know, and just you're sending them away. And that eventually will result in disengaged technicians. So your support techs get really tired of telling people we don't do that. Um, and they start to look for other work. They start to look for ways to become a real developer because we've subconsciously told them that they're in this development bucket and they just need to keep working, keep working and someday you'll have a real job. Um, and so that's how that's gonna work itself out. And then finally the firefighter premise. Um, if you've got a bunch of firefighters and their, their whole focus is on just pointing the hose and putting out the fire. Once the fire's gone, I'm good. That person, that technician's not gonna care at all about refunds or about customers going and using different products because they, they took their fire with them. They're like, sweet, <laughs> one less ticket. I don't have to answer that person because they left. And so what you're doing is you're creating, your, your isolation, you're creating isolation internally with your teams. So now the, the things that the marketing team or the, the sales team or finance really deeply care about, you're incentivizing your support team to not care about because you haven't taught them to, um, to care about that thing. You've told them that they're just a, a hose pointer. You point the hose, stay over there till the fire's gone. When the fire's gone, go back in your little bucket and be happy, <laughs> you know? And so what it does, old school support creates enmity. Enmity is just a fancy word for friction. You know, it's creating enemies, uh, enmity. It builds three teams or more, essentially. So you've got your support team or your product in, in one team. And then you've got the theme in the other team. If it, I, I support a plugin, so for the sake of this illustration, the plugin is here, the theme is another team, the host is another team, maybe some other third party plugin is another team, and the user is stuck right there in the middle, not on any team, kind of waving a white flag going, will somebody help me? Old school support creates teams. And I'm from the South, again, so I wanna teach you a phrase that, that will help here. And what we wanna do is we wanna create uh, a team that is composed of all y'all. So y'all is like two people. All y'all is all y'all. And so what, what we wanna do is create a team of all y'all. And so the all y'all is the, the other plugin, the theme, the host, our team and the customer, that's all y'all, on one team together. On the other team is the problem, right? What they're emailing about, what it is that they actually have an issue with. So we want all y'all on one team against the problem. And so that, that creates a better solution for your customer because now they don't feel like you're saying problems with the theme. They're, they feel like you're saying, hey, theme, I got a problem here, I think we can resolve it together. And then you, all y'all <laughs> on the team are gonna be able to help uh, fix the problem. And so that's our better philosophy. And uh, for the rest of the talk, I'm gonna talk through kind of what it looks like uh, to create that team, that all y'all team that draws the parties together and aligns them against the problem. But what it'll result in is happier customers. It'll result in a uh, better work environment for techs, uh, support techs love being a part of solving people's problems. Um, Vortex love beating a really tough bug. They love being able to fix the problem. And it'll, it'll cause people to gush about you online. If you don't believe me, go look at GiveWP's five-star reviews. We got people that just absolutely love that it felt like we went really above and beyond. And honestly, we, we didn't do much more than isolate a problem with the other theme or whatever. It's just the way we treat people when they come into our support inbox is different. And so I'm not telling you, you need to become a theme support 
technician or a host support technician. You just need to be a gatherer that gathers in all those other people. And at the root of that is a concept that we refer to as just being an ambassador. You heard it in my uh, intro. I view myself as an ambassador between my company, my product, and our customers, our users. And so it's ambassadors instead of adversaries. That's the whole goal of good technical support is to, to get us all on the same team so that we can, we can help solve the problem and, and go through that. So I'm gonna, for the rest of the talk, we'll talk through what some characteristics of ambassadors and put a little bit more, uh, I know it, this is a philosophical talk. I hope to put some action points in there, but the real goal is I want us to think differently about technical support. I don't want it, like I, we can talk tactics and I would love to, I'll be over at the Stellar WP booth following this uh, talk and I, I would love to talk tactics with you, but the most important thing that you can learn is how to think differently about your technical support team. So first of all, ambassadors are empowered, like they have actual authority. The concept of ambassadors, if you're not familiar, is a government sends someone to speak on behalf of them into a foreign country. So they have the full power and authority of that foreign country that is sending them to speak on behalf of them. And, and, that, and also to speak on behalf of the, the country that they're being hosted in back to their country. So it, it's a full empowerment. And so your technical support team, the people that you are having answer tickets, even the first line of tickets, need to be actually empowered to speak on behalf of your company. Like they, they need to be able to say, you know, when someone comes with a feature request that we know is outside of scope, they need to be able to answer that confidently. And the only way that happens is if they actually have been, you've given them the right to speak on your behalf. Um, so if you're a manager, if you're a supervisor, whatever it is, whoever it is that's answering the ticket needs to be able to speak on behalf of the company. And if they can't, you need to tear down whatever structure that is that's keeping them from being able to do that. And it takes time. A brand new support technician is not gonna be able to speak with their full chest about what the, the problem is and, and how, how our company is handling it. But over time, you need to be working to give them that full empowerment. And it doesn't happen right out of the gate. Related to that is they're connected. If internally you've got systems where your support techs or whoever it is that's answering that first line of tickets, where they aren't able to get to the answers that they need for their customers, you gotta get rid of whatever that internal system is. And it doesn't have to be every single support technician is connected to the development team directly. You know, managers, whoever it is, but they need to be able to find the answers when they need them to be able to get them to the customers. And if they can't, they're not gonna be able to be an effective ambassador. They're not gonna be able to effectively solve the problem. They need to be connected to real decision makers th so that they can convey that message, speak on behalf of that company. Next up, ambassadors are problem solvers. I gave a talk uh, at the last in-person WordCamp US um, that goes into this more, so you can go watch that. Um, and also tomorrow in the Palm Room, Michael Woods is giving a talk that would be really helpful for this and Micah's fantastic. So go see that one as well. But the, the point of this one, the, the main point here is technical support is not development. It's technical troubleshooting. And so you're not asking your technical support team to be debugging JavaScript or doing the things that developers do. You're asking your technical support team to be able to reliably isolate the problem replicate the problem and then communicate that problem. So their role is not debugging, it's not technical in that sense. It is just getting whatever's going wrong on the customer site to also be going wrong in this other site that then I can pass along to uh, our support team. We use WP Sandbox uh, for that on our team. I'll get it, I'll isolate the problem, get it fixed. This problem is happening right here just like this and then I pass off the credentials to that WP Sandbox to my team and say, go, go work on that. Here's, here's the problem. And all you have to do is one, two, three, and it's, it, it creates that problem. And so, again, I could do a whole talk. It was a lightning talk in 2019, but I could do a whole talk on technical troubleshooting, and this one isn't it. But ambassadors do need to be able to solve problems. 
but I don't want you to hear that ambassadors or that technical support reps need to be your high level coders because that's just not true at all. Next up, ambassadors are winsome. Ambassadors are the kind of folks that you like to go out and have a drink with. They're people that you can hang out with, you can talk to. They are respectful and kind and winsome uh, folks. And so um, I think it all starts with your tone. We do all email-based support. So um, there, there is in our customer success department, we do have some phone calls and things like that, and the same principles apply. But the people that I deal with every day, it's all about written text. And so I spend a lot of my time harping on tone. In fact, Matt Cromwell and I, years ago, sat down together and created what we call the tone guide. And you can uh, find links to that if um, I, it's like benlikes.us forward slash tone. I forgot to put it in the, the, <laughs> the slide. Uh, but the tone guide, the goal of that is to help us to have a clear picture of when we need to improve our responses. And so really quickly, I'm going to run through that. I've got a few minutes to do that. We use an acronym called CREW. The reason that the points that I'm going to share with you is in this order is because it spells a word that way. I suppose we could have done REC without the K on the end, but we decided to go with CREW uh, because it sounds nicer. Um, is your support a REC? No, I can fix it. No. So we asked the question, is it CREW? So I'll type out a draft that I'm ready to send, or my team will type out a draft that they're ready to send, and then they will ask the questions of it. Is it crew? And so the, the first question to ask of it, is it confident as opposed to apologetic? We have a, a positive and a negative for each um, of the four points. Um, I catch a lot of flack every time I tweet about this, so hopefully I'm catching flack online as we speak. Uh, we don't apologize for stuff. Really, not much at all. I don't apologize, even if it's a bug. <laughs> like. We shipped a bug and it's breaking sites. I still don't apologize for that. Um, first of all, because it's WordPress uh, and the people in this room know that WordPress is distributed software, right? It's, once it's on your server, it's not my software anymore. Like it, there's, there's a weird dynamic with open source distributed software where if I do apologize, I'm so sorry for this bug, now I'm sort of taking a little bit of responsibility for them not testing code that they put on their production site. It's, it's not really my fault. And again, I catch flack for it every time I tweet about it, but we don't apologize. I do apologize when like, I promise them four business hours of response time and I'm replying to them on hours. I, I'll apologize for that. So sorry for the, the slow reply here. Um, but the main reason that I don't apologize is because it doesn't do what I would want it to do. What I want it to do when I apologize is demonstrate empathy, demonstrate that I, I care, like I'm a, I'm a real person that cares about the fact that they're having a real bad day because of something that I'm at least in part responsible for delivering to them. Um, but when I apologize, it comes across as sometimes, a, a lot of times in my experience, it comes across as um, kind of weak um, admission that, oh, I'm so sorry. And it's sort of like with uh, the, the apology when I wanted it to make it seem like I, I'm competent and I can solve their problem, it comes across instead as like, oh, I'm so sorry. And they're, they're like, I don't want you to be sorry. I want you to fix the problem, fix the problem. <laughs> like, I, I don't need anybody to hold my hand right now. I need somebody to fix my website. And so that's, that's generally my philosophy personally. And I say it like I'm real hardcore and I never apologize. And that's not the case. I do apologize but I certainly don't lead with apology because what they need to hear from me out of the gate is that I'm confident you've come to the right place. We can fix this problem. We're going to solve it for you. And so that's the C. We also sometimes add calm in there, calm confidence. Um, just like with parenting, when your kid scrapes its, his or her knee and they come to you and they're freaking out, what they don't need is for you to have a temper tantrum with them or roll around on the ground with them. They need calm, confident, we, we, you've come to the right place, buddy. We're gonna fix this up. We're gonna uh, wipe, wipe the blood off, put the Band-Aid on. You're gonna be good to go. Your customers need to be treated with confidence and calm. Uh, second up, results driven or results oriented. Oriented didn't fit on the slide like I liked it, so I went with driven. Results driven, not argumentative. If you were to make a list of all four of the points of crew and order them from things that Ben is best at to things that Ben is worst at, uh, the R is the one I'm worst at. I'm, I love to argue, like I love it. And I don't just love to argue, I love to win. 
arguments. Like, uh, my personality is the type where it's like, you come at me with some half-baked logic in a support ticket about something, and I'm just going to tear you up. Like, I, I love arguing. And so Matt, who was very patient uh, to hire me in the first place, but then even more patient over the years to help me to see that even though it's fun to argue, it, dev it doesn't work. It doesn't help solve the customer's problem. And even if you win the argument, you're going to lose the customer. And so we have to focus as support, technical support, on solving the problem, the result of the problem, get their problem fixed, and ignore the insults or whatever. So if I get a four paragraph uh, email from a, a person and paragraph one is about how terrible our product is and paragraph two is about how slow the support time is and paragraph three is about how ugly my kids are and paragraph four is about the actual problem with a uh, workable error code in there, I've got to ignore three out of four and answer that fourth one. And uh, trust me, trust me, if you don't ignore even one line of defensiveness slipped in there, you've derailed the whole thing. Now, now we've got to have a conversation about how my kids aren't actually ugly. Like, you know, like we, we've got to fix the problem and you've got to ignore the insults and you've got to just go with it. And what's fun is that uh, there's a, a Bible verse that's like if you answer somebody uh, with kindness, it's like dumping a, a heap of coals in their lap. It works. When, when you're kind and when you're respectful to people, a lot of times they'll come back and be like, I'm so sorry. that uh, I was under the gun and my boss was chomping down on me and really mad. And I'm sorry that I said the things I said in that first email. Sometimes they don't say it, but I know it's there. I know it's there. So you've got to, you've got to resolve the problem. You've got to be just relentlessly results oriented. Um, and if you're not, you're just taking extra time you didn't need to take. And then the E, educational, not overly technical. This goes back directly to that first uh, story that I started with of acute craniosynostosis of the posterior temporal suture, which was the diagnosis that my child received at uh, two months old. Um, I don't know what that means. It's not helpful. In fact, studies have shown that the bigger words you use, the less intelligent you are perceived to be in conversation. Because it's not about how big the words you use are, it's about how well you are able to explain yourself, how well you're able to educate the people that are listening. And so, the more educational you can be, the better. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean you need to, you know, dump it all down to like a third grade level vocabulary, but it does mean that you have to make sure that you're being understood and that jargon is most of the time not helpful. Now, when people reach out with, uh, you know, say, a developer reaches out and they're using terms like API or jQuery or whatever, sure, we can talk back to them, but even the most knowledgeable, knowledgeable developer at this conference still doesn't understand how GiveWP specifically works and what the decisions we made when we developed GiveWP. And so I can still be educational to that person um, and speak to them on their level. But the point is, the more technical you get, the better you better make sure that you are educating that customer. Because if they walk away going, a lot of words, I don't know what any of them meant, um, but my website's still not accepting donations. Like, that's all they care about get the the problem fixed and and avoid the jargon and then the last point this one was uh one that was explained to me back when michelle uh, frechette who works now with the stellar wp team give wps in the stellar wp uh, organization within liquid web and back then michelle was on the team give with me and she helped explain to me um, that thankfulness especially as an opener in an email is essentially noise. i think that went out essentially white noise. Um, thankfulness is uh, it's, it's the equivalent of your call is very important to us. Please hold while we get you to the next available representative. Like if my call was important, you would have given it to a human. You would not have given it to that machine. Like that's, that's at best worthy of ridicule. And thankfulness does the same thing, especially as an opener. Thank you for contacting GiveWP support. It's very important to us. Like, it, it's just, it doesn't work. But welcoming, being welcoming does. And so sometimes we'll even personalize that welcome. A lot of times I will lead with, 
you've come to the exact right place. Like, I've seen this before, and we can get this resolved for you, no problem. You're being welcoming. Or, like I said, you can personalize it. Uh, a, a organization that helps with autism reaches out, and they're having trouble with their donations. It's like, man, that's a really great website and a really great cause. I really love what you're doing. Let's get you back to raising money as fast as possible, and then go in. Pro tip, don't fake it. Don't pretend to be excited about the cause that the website that is emailing you, just skip straight to welcoming. Like, don't, don't be like, I really like that organization if you don't, because we don't like lying to people, but we do want to help them with their problem. And so uh, leading with welcome instead of leading with thankfulness is uh, a real pro tip. So that's the, um, the CREW acronym. Um, and so, like I said, we use it like a sort of a checklist. Uh, a mental checklist. When I get done writing a draft, before I click send, I just ask it the question, is it crew? Is this confident? Did I apologize in here for something that's either not my fault or it's not going to lead them toward resolution, which is the R? Like, let's, it, am I driving toward revol resolution instead of revolution? Uh, we're not driving toward revolution at any point. Um, resolution. Um, am I driving toward resolution or am I defending my team or myself? If I am, just take it out. Is it educational? Is it welcoming? And so we ask all of those things. And that brings us back to the, the crux of the whole uh, talk here, is that uh, the point of good technical support, excellent technical support, is that our technical support technicians are ambassadors. So we've got to teach them to communicate with excellence. So ambassadors are the ones who, um, can deliver the news, whether it's good news or bad news, uh, to your customers, to your users, in a way that moves the whole situation forward um, and helps to do that. So let's return to our three stories. This uh, error message uh, story is actually not just one story. We get this one a lot um, when people reach out and they're frantic about um, what's going on on their website. I've just sent a thousand people to my website and it's not working. And so the, the answer to that is what we've already talked about today, is treating it with respect, treating the customer with respect, treating the issue like you understand it. Another thing that I harp on all the time is show the customer things, don't tell the customer things. I completely understand is a pretty worthless statement. It's like saying calm down in the midst of a fight with your spouse. It is what needs to happen. It's probably not going to help it to happen for you to say it. Um, so I completely understand. Don't say I completely understand. Demonstrate that you completely understand. Oh, so the fact that your site is down means that's top priority. So our first priority is to get that site back up by any means necessary, whatever we need to do. Then we'll deal with why it happened. And you take them back and you've helped them if they've got a backup, if they got their host can help them with that. Again, you're making an all y'all team of everybody involved and let's get this site back up and treating them with respect. The end of the story with my wife at the mechanic, she actually sat down and said, yeah, sure, go, go ahead and, and fix the problem. And she sat down and it just, she just stewed over it for a few minutes. And she was like, that's just not right. So he, he looked at the mechanic, looked at the girl behind the counter and they were laughing at me and it just doesn't feel right and so she literally stood up and went outside the wheels were already off of the van and she's like I forgot I have a thing that I gotta go do I don't want to do this now and had them put the wheels back on the car and leave and that's what your customers are doing some of them don't wait till you that you've pulled the wheels off of their website metaphorically speaking but when you are unclear in your communication when you are treating your customer like a problem or you're not your customer doesn't trust you that is what they're doing they're leaving sometimes they'll tell you most of the times they won't and then finally this story I'll skip straight to the punchline so he got diagnosed with acute craniosynostosis of the posterior temporal suture you have to practice that by the way um, uh, he got diagnosed at two months at four months he had surgery where they literally removed the occipital bone which is that back of your skull took it off they flipped it over and they put it back on um, and it opened up the suture um, to do that and again skipping to the punchline there he is uh, he's a varsity athlete as an eighth grader he got a varsity athlete award and we are super duper proud of him 
Unfortunately, genetically speaking, he's going to have a ginormous head because he looks just like me and I have a ginormous head. But uh, I am a super big fan of Laura David, and that's the name of the surgeon who did the surgery. That's the real story here is that Dr. Laura David, Wake Forest Baptist Medical uh, Center in Winston-Salem, North Carolina, um, what she did by the way she treated me and my wife is she got a fan for life. And she, anybody that wants craniofacial surgery, I'm telling them about Dr. Laura David because she treated me with respect. She was educational. She answered so many questions um, as we asked all of these questions of her. She even advocated for us uh, with the, uh, the insurance company when they said they weren't going to authorize the less invasive surgery. Um, she advocated for us and then she came back to us and said, hey, they're not gonna approve it, so we're gonna do the more invasive surgery, but don't worry. I'm really good at what I do. I've done this hundreds of times. You're gonna be fine. Um, and so that's what you can do for your customers by simply treating them, or treating your tech support team like ambassadors that are sent out to your customers. And so our goal is to create raving fans. Uh, and I think that technical support is the best way that you can do that um, on your team because they're the folks that are in the trenches every day talking to your customers. And so my name is Ben Meredith. I'm the head of technical support at GiveWP. We are a stellar WP brand on the li within Liquid Web. Thank you so much for your time today. I would love to answer any questions you got. I finished a little early. Hold on a sec. We want to get the live stream to hear your question too. Hi, sorry. Um, how, how easy has it been to reach out to other companies, theme developers and things like that to get that conversation going and get on the same team? Uh, it varies. I mean, there's some companies out there that, uh, that are great and, uh, but the key is how you reach out to them. Like if, if I, if, if say I've got a problem with a, a theme and it's doing something, it's not playing nicely with our plugin and it's causing problems. If I just reach out and say, hey, there's a problem with your theme, that's old school support, right? They're, your theme is breaking GiveWP. They're gonna feel just as much like I'm building a wall between me and them as the customer does that I am. And so we will go that extra step if we, if we get access to the theme, uh, if we can, if it's a free theme or if it's a premium theme, we'll have the customer send us a zip or whatever to get all the way down to an isolated problem that is clear. And then the way I reach out to the theme is, hey, we've got a mutual customer who's doing this and this and this, and here's their website and here's a, a sandbox site where we've got the same thing happening with just our theme, our, our plugin and your theme. and it's all about building that bridge and making sure that like deliver it to them in a way that they can answer without having to do much work. Oh yeah, you're right. On line 35, we're doing this and we should be doing this. And if we just added a filter there, that would fix everything. Will that work? And so it's, it's really being collaborative with that other team um, and not, not just passing it off to the customer. Now I will send the customer because a lot of times with just like with our customers, there's not a direct line to me from like our website. It, it has to go through priority support or whatever. And so I will give the customer a script that says, the GiveWP team said this, you know, what can we do? And I'll, I'll give them exact, the exact words to say, cut and paste this into a support ticket on their site so that they can hear it directly from me. I don't know if that, does that answer your question? Other questions, comments, snide remarks? Uh, does your company have uh, your this support, your technical support, integrated into their overall marketing plan? And then, and like, as a as a way down. And how did? And if so, or if not, how do you guys use your support language outside of word of mouth to promote your products? Does that make sense? Good. So you're asking if the support team 
like if the fact that we do good support is part of our marketing yeah like how, is it do you, is it an expressly a part of your marketing or and then also do you leverage it in your marketing yeah i mean yeah there's a picture of me on the website and how great our support is so i mean it you clearly you know what you're working with um but no we do uh, it is in the marketing materials that uh, that our support is uh, we we advertise the the two to four business hours first response time and the three to five days uh, on average that we resolve uh, customer issues and our happiness ratings and things like that as appropriate is definitely in there um, but it's more so I would say it's bet the best marketing happens internally and and I love making my team and myself aware of how we can help the rest of the team so if a customer comes to us and they've got all of our plugins except for this one that makes lots of money for them and helps them in a really good way well I should I should probably mention that now I'm not a sales team and our team is not a sales team so priorities one through five are resolve the issue and then after that man it, another great way we could help you is this other add-on or whatever and, and upsells or whatever you want to call it but yeah we do we do mention our support um, as a part of pre-sales calls and as a part of uh, that for sure. I don't know if that answered your question. We've got a question over here. Hold while the microphone makes its way to you. That's right. Um, how do you discipline like yourself and your team to stop and go through crew? Because <laughs> one of the things that me and my business partner on uh, business coaching side of things, we we try to remind ourselves and we tell people to use the acronym HALT. Mm -hmm. don't, don't do anything when you're hungry, angry, lonely, or tired. Right. <laughs> right. But you know, we tell ourselves That's this solid. and we tell other people that, but we don't always follow it. Yep. Right? So how do you discipline your team to yeah to that, that that is an excellent excellent question because it and that's that's really the answer is in the question it's a discipline it's a practice the crew is not like something that we put together it's like matt and i were like we're really good at this so let's put it out there it's actually we struggle with this um and so how can we be better at moving that and so one of the things that we do is post-mortems so anytime there's a negative rating uh, whether it's a one-star review on uh, the repository or on Google or wherever, or it's a, a negative rating of our individual support technicians um, within the uh, support ticketing system, we'll do a postmortem and we'll say, what, which one of the four crew points did we miss here? Because you can almost always, even for the reviews like the Tech, support techs hate this, but it's like you'll you'll get a review and it's like the support technician was wonderful. However, your product doesn't do A, B, C, and D, so therefore, one star. You know, it's like oh, you were rating me, you weren't rating my product. You know, but I, I firmly believe that even that review, there's probably a point in crew that could have fixed that or maybe prevented that. Now, obviously, there's there's no way of knowing it, and you're doing it. Uh, after the fact so but it's always a super helpful way for us to look through and see okay I led with um, jargon here or I, I didn't clearly explain this thing you know like I, I was wasn't educational or the um, uh, am I done done all right so I'm, I'm done I didn't clearly explain the thing or whatever so postmortems are a huge part of that um, so I think that means we're done I just got the zero over here. So thank you all again for having me.
Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to your third session of our afternoon section. Um, I know it's that time of day where everyone's a little tired. Does everyone know that there's plenty of coffee out there? There's some surprisingly good brownies if you haven't had them. Really good. Highly recommend. Let's let's do a quick pop quiz. Um, what is our event hashtag? Anybody yell it out? Yes. Hashtag WCUS. And what day is Contributor Day? Sunday. Yes. Awesome. Thank you for looking alive. Appreciate it. Um, so our next session is titled, Where is WordPress's Place in the Website Creator Economy? with Ben May. Ben May is a managing director of The Code Company, a technical WordPress development agency based in Australia. The Code Company works with media companies in the US to deploy large, complex WordPress platforms. So let's please give a warm welcome to Ben May. Thank you. Thank you. So if we're trying to answer the question of where WordPress's place in the creator economy is, I don't think we need to uh, to work out what WordPress is, but I wanted to dive into what the creator economy actually means. The term's been around for a long time and doesn't really represent anything new. It's that very broad, encompassing term of people who create digital content and make a living from that. So that's used to be called an influencer, but now it can be anything from a blogger to a TikTok uh, to a str uh, Twitch streamer and more. Because it's such a broad and encompassing term, it's really hard to evaluate the size of the market of the creator economy. But people who have tried to calculate this have placed it at a 100 to $200 billion a year industry at the moment. And with all these people coming in, there's no shortage of platforms and tech companies, uh, investors that are trying to build products to get a part of that, uh, but also to innovate and to optimize the systems that these creators are using to do their day to day. But what's more relevant to, I guess, WordPress and the work that we do is uh, what I would call like the editorial creator. And that's the phenomenon we've seen more recently in the last couple of years, where people at traditional media companies are getting up and leaving and going out alone to set up a newsletter or a subscription site or something like that. The reality is with the way uh, these platforms are becoming increasingly easy to use, the barrier to starting a media company or any kind of online publishing platform like this is becoming increasingly easy. And that's why I guess it's interesting because this could potentially be the, just the new standard of how media businesses get started, uh, starting out as a creator uh, and then growing out from that point. So it's really the next generation. Um, and I guess the reason I'm interested in this space compared to the day-to-day, -day, which is working with much more larger, complex uh, media and publishing work, is during the last couple of years, like everyone, found ourselves with a bit of extra time uh, being grounded uh, and not being able to travel. So unlike some who learned how to make sourdough, I thought I would get involved in this sort of creator space and figure out what are these people doing? What are they motivated by? Um, where is the technology platforms? Um, you know, what are they using? How are they using it? Uh, and then obviously, where does WordPress fit into that whole equation? And hopefully learn something out of that process. So for the purpose of the talk, I think it's useful, like anyone who works in projects, to have a couple of personas to frame the conversation. And the first persona, which is the most common one we see, is this popular journalist who has a, a prestigious job, they're the food writer for the New York Times or whatever it is, and then one day they just decide that they're going to go out, and, out on their own, set up a substack, and uh, quit their nine to five and, and go it alone. They've usually got some sort of social following, um, and they can take that audience with them and sort of start off on day one with an existing brand and reputation and credibility. And the second persona is kind of similar, but I guess it's almost the evolution of the first one. And that's the small collective. So it's still a group of people who have come out of a, a well-known institution, set up their own thing. Um, they're typically uh, still coming from a big background with a big audience, but unlike an enterprise or a sort of corporate media company, they're still acting and behaving a lot like a startup. They're still figuring out how do you make money in today's age with media and publishing um, and sort of are moving a lot faster and a lot more sort of agile than uh, where they may have come from. So the simple requirements for a content creator, sorry, for a creator or an editorial creator is you obviously need to publish content, whatever format that is, whether it's written, audio, video, whatever. 
they need to make money, uh, and that comes in a few different forms, whether that is selling uh, and then managing subscriptions of some sort, uh, maybe they'll go down the path of advertising, so that's corporate uh, uh, commercial options and things like that. Or they'll sell digital products, uh, things like ebooks, courses, gated content, so on. And then the final part that a lot of these creators are uh, really embracing is the building and supporting a community that holds this all together. Uh, the idea of a creator is it's a much more one-to-one -one relationship with the audience rather than sort of a name at a big traditional masthead that doesn't have that kind of intimacy. So building and supporting the, uh, the community is a really important part of their retention strategies. And that may, be the take, uh, may take form of like the comment section, forums, pro like private messaging, things like Discord, and so on. Unofficially, these are like the trendy platforms I see a lot of people going down if they were going to go down and create a uh, new uh, media startup um, specialty SaaS. So these are kind of like the platforms you see that are designed exactly for this, uh, this sort of edge case. So Substack uh, has sort of really made its name in the last couple of years and gets an awful lot of coverage uh, on sort of it being one of the big catalysts of this newsletter revolution that's happening, uh, or at least being reported on happening. Beehive is another that was founded by uh, a few of the people who used to work at Morning Brew, who have been sort of one of the big uh, winners out of the last couple of years, uh, delivering newsletters and making them cool again or, or sort of um, reinventing that process. And then you have things like Memberful, uh, Patreon, where they have sort of like CMS light tooling. Uh, Ghost has obviously been around for a long time. They're an open source platform. I've always known of Ghost and I've never really dug into it too much. But in the last couple of years, they've really doubled down on building their product around this sort of digital creator space. Their marketing and product really uh, fits that space nicely and uh, is a really low friction entryway to using um, an open source product to do this sort of thing. And then obviously the last category is like no code, low code sort of page builders, your web flows, square spaces, and so on. So these platforms obviously are really easy to set up um, and get going, which is one of their biggest advantages. The entire UX, so the whole back end, everything that the actual user, uh, like as in the, the editorial person is working on, has been designed just for that workflow. WordPress often gets compared as like the Swiss Army knife, so it's kind of the, um, you know, it, it has to support everyone's workflows in different ways. So these products are designed just for what they need to do and make it really easy to do that. And often they have this low or no cost upfront model. So you can sign up for a, a, an account. Maybe there's a subscription fee or maybe it's like a rev share model where when you start to make money, they start to take some money as well. But I think a lot of these platforms inevitably hit a point for these sort of creative businesses that want to grow and, and um, scale that the, the nature of the restrictions on a platform are gonna cause them to inhibit growth at some point. And the way I kind of try and visualize that is thinking that you, if you start on day zero, uh, you're gonna get a tremendous amount of value from any one of these sort of products that you use, and you're essentially paying nothing for it, so it's this really great trade-off for you. But at some point, and whatever that time is, the cost is gonna start coming up, and it may not be a direct cost that you're paying, but it may be a rev share that they're keeping from you. Um, and the value is going to subjectively be going down because if your business is growing and they're trying to do more things, these platforms, the restrictions are going to start to be more present and um, start to be a bit more frustrating. So you're going to perceive the value of what you're getting for the cost that you're sending out to be lower. The challenge is always to figure out when that cross is going to be. That might be 30 days. If you're you know, three journalists with 5 million followers on Twitter, that, that cross could be in the first 30 days, but if you're looking at maybe a part-time side hustle kind of thing, that cross might be three years time. So it's figuring out when those sort of things are gonna converge. Setting up one of these products <clears throat> is pretty simple. It's, it's gonna be buying a domain if you need one, uh, registering an account, and then most of these products have done really well in onboarding because again, they're designed for one sort of edge case. So your onboarding will take you through and it'll set up all the things you need to set up to be able to start publishing content. Maybe you need to connect Stripe if you're going to take payments, things like that. So what does WordPress look like? There's a lot more steps involved, especially if we think back to those personas in the beginning. They're not product people, they're not tech people, they're not devs, they have no engineering background. So this is a very common thing and anyone who's worked in WordPress for any period of time kind of knows the friction of the working with WordPress will, will bring in. 
So you try and imagine explaining these sort of steps to a non-technical person and the sort of rat race they can go on trying to figure all of this out and hopefully not getting any step wrong along the way because it could potentially uh, you know, create further problems as they're setting other things up. So with all of that, why would you bother with WordPress? Um, I think for us, obviously, the WordPress agency, we believe in, in uh, the promise of WordPress and, and the benefit for, for businesses. So I think selling this sort of WordPress stuff to these creators uh, is really understanding what they're trying to do. Is it a, are we talking about a creator that is doing like the side hustle thing and they've got very low objectives and they're just going to be happy with that? And then maybe that's where a SaaS product works really well. But on the other hand, if they're going to be spending $100,000 a month on audience acquisition, they've got growth, ac uh, growth objectives that the product that they're going to land on needs to be sort of comparable for. I think people who work in tech also overthink or skip the basics. Um, we've been working with someone recently, and you sort of gloss over the really basic things that you take for granted in a day-to-day. -day. Uh, they're doing you know, quite a large um, uh, product in this space but they can't do things like simple email sequencing and stuff like that. So these are things that we would typically not even think about to, to do or be able to track conversions because the restrictive nature of the SaaS products don't allow you to uh, tie in the analytics the way you want or to do the ac uh, audience acquisition and analytics the way you want. And then obviously trying to be objective as possible, but at the end of the day, if, if we're talking to somebody who is considering using a platform like this, there's some pretty big risks um, and trade-offs that they're going to have to make inevitably using something like that. <clears throat> so a lot of these are reasons you could use for WordPress in any context. I think in the case of media uh, creators and things like that, flexibility allows you to uh, build workflows and um, customize your application or your product to suit your audience. A lot of uh, these creators are obviously got the entrepreneurial kind of spirit if they're going to leave a nine to five and go out and build their own thing. And what's really great about watching this space happen is that they are figuring out new ways to monetize their audience, how to capture first party data, build products and things like that. So flexibility, I think, is really important if you're talking to someone who's got ambitions of, of growing. Customization uh, in terms of visual appearance. Uh, most of these platforms will give you half a dozen options to configure, but at the end of the day, it's going to look like every other Substack or every other Beehive or every other whatever else that you're using. Ownership uh, for everyone who works in WordPress already, I think, is pretty strongly about having access and ownership of your own data, ownership of content, first party data that you're tracking on your audience, comments, analytics, whatever that is. Um, is a really compelling thing for people who get worried about that. <clears throat> Access to your own data, again, is really important if you want to move and migrate to another CMS. Um, it, it can't be understated. If you're building your, this product, the content is your product, to have it locked in a vault that you can't access or, or partially access uh, is a huge deal and, and in any other situation wouldn't fly. Censorship also is something that comes up once in a while with um, platforms. It's obviously a very touchy uh, area of, of where censorship and where platforms and VCs and, and investors need to draw lines on things, but definitely has been a concern people have raised um, about why they've wanted to leave platforms like this. And then obviously on interoperability between plugins and systems, uh, plugging in WordPress to some other system that may be really valuable to the, uh, to the product that you're trying to build. So how do you overcome these challenges uh, in WordPress? I think the first thing is this concept that's been bounced around for a while of like the WordPress light distribution. Um, <clears throat> there's not really an answer to it, but uh, on post that I say I had a podcast about it a couple of months ago. Um, and it's a similar thought I've had for quite a while of how do you build a sort of really tight distribution of WordPress that lets these kinds of users that want to be able to spin something up really quickly and push them through a, a journey to ultimately be able to do it in as few steps as some of the platforms can do. But it's just good to think about, I guess, conceptually with these other ideas that I have. So when we're doing these kinds of projects, and this was sort of some of the stuff we did over COVID, was did about 12 uh, sort of platform migrations away from different CMSs, substacks, and stuff like that for these sort of newsletter subscription editorial creators. And that's firstly to make WordPress feel more like a platform. And so we do that by leaning into that no and low code mindset. 
So, you know, using things like page builders, full site editing, whatever that looks like. Um, you know, as a developer originally, my preference is always custom development, custom engineering, uh, custom functionality, everything writing in, in, in you know, a text editor. But I, I think in this audience and these personas, again, that's not something they're looking for and having the maintenance requirement of an engineer to be able to adjust functionality, features, whatever it is. And that's sort of a trend WordPress is leaning to already. Um, so it's not the best outcome, but I think uh, it, it's that trade-off of being able to do more in the browser and less uh, with custom code. Uh, WordPress admin is a constant, I think, in anyone who does client services work with WordPress. Uh, it's pretty overwhelming at the best of times, uh, and the visual hierarchy is just all over the place. The, what you're looking for when you're setting a site up uh, and when you're using a site when it's live and running uh, are two different things. But you know, a site that's gone live six months ago is still to see the appearance menu or the comments menu or the tools menu. Like These things are irrelevant once you're in a day-to-day -day, um, movement. So how do we get the menu to feel more uh, contextually aware of stuff that is frequent? And that's like stripping it right back to what an editorial team needs to see. They need posts, they need pages, comments. Like This is the stuff they're living in day-to-day. Everything else, and when we've done this, some of it's had to be pretty ugly to make it work because it's not a real nice way in core to do this, but to just push everything else out of screen because for most people, uh, once they're in there, this is all they need to see, not that ginormous list of 700 menu items. Making plugins feel more native, I think, is a challenge, and I don't think there's really a simple answer to any of that. but. WordPress obviously has a pretty consistent design pattern. Uh, when you're in the admin, through the block editor, uh, it's all fairly consistent until you start adding plugins. And when you're using the most common kind of ones, like we'll use Yoast and Newsletter Glue and things like that for, for these sort of projects, they're now using their own design schemes. They're using you know, different forms of tabs and icons and things like that. So all of a sudden, you're sort of scrolling through a page and you've now got almost three or four different things, it feels like, in the same place. So. One of the ways we've sort of been able to make that a little bit better without trying to manually rewrite all the styling is thinking about how do you avoid duplication of steps. So if you're using, again, the newsletter glue example and a paywall at the front end, um, you would have to go through here and say, all right, well, this is a you know, paid article. Uh, I don't want people on the website to be able to read it unless, it is, um, unless they've paid. Conversely, though, you're running a newsletter system that has paying subscribers and free subscribers. In this situation, by default, you would have to go and then manually say, I'd also send this to only the premium list. So they're just these little steps that happen over and over again because they're kind of two plugins all under the one umbrella um, for the editor's experience. And what we did is we worked with Newsletter Glue and they un uh, let us add a bunch of hooks and filters in. So when we're doing these kinds of things, uh, we know that if it's a paid article, it's going to go to a paid list and things like that. So we can kind of cut half this UI out of the screen altogether. Uh, so from an edit editor's perspective, they can just say, yep, this is a premium article or this is a free article and not have to kind of manually do it in multiple steps because other than it just being clunky, uh, introduces risk of um, uh, you know, uh, human error and things like that. Uh, so the subscription engine part, so they obviously have to choose whether that's in e-commerce or subscriptions or recurring uh, revenue. There's a few ways to architect this. The two schools of thought are obviously running it inside WordPress using your WooCommerce's, your paid membership pros, things like that. Or there's using like SaaS integrations, something on the cloud that runs all the billing engines and things like that. And I think if you think back to what is important to the personas of who's using this, editorial, not product, not tech, um, the second you add payment, uh, payment systems to a WordPress site, it goes from being something that's really important to now being mission critical. Something like a content site is really just uh, lead capture at this point until you add a billing system. Uh, and the sort of trade-offs you have to make, uh, if it's content, I have no issues in saying, let's use Word WP Engine's auto updater. It's going to do some screenshots. It's going to make a pretty calculated estimate of doing updates and keep the site up to date. But there's no way in the world you would want to recommend that if you've got a custom billing engine or uh, a payment engine in there as well, because that thing's not going to understand the nuance of failed subscriptions. There's also bottlenecks. We did some work last year um, where they were sort of almost at a theoretical limit of single parallel processing they could do on their site. And any time there was a release, they had to figure out a way to pause it only short enough because if it was paused for too long, it would never be able to catch back up again because it could only process one subscription at a time. And as it was growing, it wouldn't do that. So our preference is usually to use SaaS uh, products, things like 
at the low end, like Memberful or Pico, uh, up to your Recurlies and Chargebees and Chargeifies and all these other tools. Uh, so you build your API connections between and let it do all the heavy lifting. It's going to deal with all the security, PCI compliance, uh, all your reporting and number crunching uh, of, of analytics and data and things like that, especially at scale. If you've got 50,000 active paying subscribers, trying to run that off a back end of a shared hosting platform isn't going to result in any fun for anyone. Uh, and they're also going to manage all the plumbing between all the different tools that you don't have to worry about. So that's how we sort of think about that. And then if you are going to go down that path, back to that chart of when the lines converge and, and use something up you know, building your own to start with. It's the premise that there's never going to be a perfect time to do a migration. They're always going to suck. Um, and that's because these platforms, while they tick a box and say, we give you access to everything, they don't have to make it incredibly easy for you to leave. Uh, to use Substack as an example, you know, they will give you a full export of the data set, but you're going to get a zip file with one CSV file with all your emails in it and then a directory full of HTML files, which is not an easy way to migrate that into a CMS especially if it's uh, been iterated on over a period of time. Um, when we've done some of these large ones that just couldn't be done manually, uh, we've had to build WPCLI functions that will basically scrub and scrub and scrub the data because there's inline CSS, there's inline JavaScript and call to actions. It's pretty messy and trying to reverse engineer static HTML files against the production site so you can grab the schema data to then build it in WordPress. It's technically a data migration, but it's not a very pleasant one to do at that point. So it's being realistic that it's going to be painful whenever it happens, um, and it's just going to have to happen. And then that's the, so the summary, I think, is that this creator world and these new versions of media companies are definitely uh, here to stay, and they're growing. The industry is continuing to add you know, different versions of this. We're seeing new incarnations of how people are starting. Um, the platforms uh, that, are, that uh, uh, are definitely interesting, and, and there's definitely learning of what they're doing well, what they're not doing well. But how does WordPress uh, remain competitive in that space, either as a something out of the box or through people who implement WordPress, um, you know, so that it can continue to sort of serve that purpose uh, for, for businesses that are trying to do more than just sort of the status quo uh, and, and the sort of heavy amount of lifting and thinking that sort of has to be done at the moment to get to that point. Uh, so that was my sort of uh, talk. Uh, yeah, thank you. We do have some time for questions, if anyone has a question for Ben. So you, you've been working on migrating the creators that are starting on these other platforms and bringing them into WordPress. What yep. types of people have you seen the most that are making those migrations? Like from what uh, industries have you worked with the most? So I mean, most of these are <clears throat> in some sort of specialty niche, and I think that works really well for um, anyone who builds an audience really organically. So uh, some of them are in like in politics, some of them are being just like local news. So like the hyper local news thing is like this other trend that's sort of really been bubbling up over the last couple of years as well. Um, actually, there's been a few politics, I think. Um, and others have just been like uh, sports. So the, the, the industries themselves or the verticals have been a bit all over the place. I think the, the catalysts behind a lot of them have been, we've just, we can't grow anymore the way we are. Um, when you get into sort of more serious, like when they become a business and they start thinking about it as a business, you know, if you're doing audience acquisition, you're spending money on Facebook or LinkedIn or Twitter to like get people to sign up. If you can't like build the funnel with analytics, you're basically just throwing money at a wall. And you know, we've worked with people who are spending 20K a week like in, in trying to build subscribers. And when someone screws up something in the analytics and it's, they've just they've, they have no visibility. So it's like these things of when do you realize you have to graduate out of sort of like consumer tools to like business tools. Um, and that's where like migrating those sub stacks uh, as an example of they've just sort of hit all of them in different ways, but hit theoretical limits. Um, some of them have been like, I don't want people, I don't, I don't want to be in the same place as somebody else who's also on the platform, like, you know, somewhat more ideological arguments, which aren't business arguments as much, I guess. Um, but it's been, it's been a really mixed bag. Um, but they've all had sort of the same pain points and, and workflow that they're trying to achieve. Yeah. Ooh. 
one of the issues we've seen is uh, membership numbers and users on WordPress. How do you deal with really large membership sites that start to grow into the tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands? Do you move those off WordPress to a third party like uh, IDAM solution? How do, how do you handle that challenge? Yeah, obviously, and obviously the, the, the reason that becomes so challenging is not necessarily the size of the users, but it, 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 you start having uncached traffic and, and big, large chunks of audience on there. Um, I mean, there's two ways people like two ways these are being done. So there's either like complete client side SaaS products, which I'm not the biggest fan of, but they certainly achieve that sort of objective really quickly, where they'll be doing single sign-on through some sort of identity system, and then basically it's like a leaky paywall. You can just like kill JavaScript and bypass that altogether. Um, I think if so, to slightly contradict the point about using like page builders and off-the-shelf stuff, if you're getting into a site where you've got 100,000 paying subscribers, you probably don't need to be doing like a $20 theme. You can probably, like, the economics of it change a little bit. And that's where if you can sort of start to work through like proper cash management and stuff like that, because ultimately logged in users still uh, have the same experience other than access to, there's only two cache states. It's not like econ of 100,000 unlogged in users um, all doing different dynamic requests. So we've had luck yeah, being really clever about like state management with, or cache state management um, to prevent that. There's still, like, I still like the simplicity, like the anti-complexity kind of thing of them being natural users in, in WordPress, managing that through API, through REST API. So, uh, you know, if you're using a system that says someone's, you know, they're dunning, they've, they've failed payment, they've expired, whatever, just having a simple webhook ping us, uh, we verify that it's happened, and they know that, and the other system knows that it's happened. Um, otherwise, yeah, you go down that sort of identity management system, which we've done a couple of times, and these are probably not really even creators now, but just more general, you know, big membership media sites. Uh, and, and sometimes they're ones that are like now bordering into headless stuff. So almost Next.js is dealing with your identity management and state management through something like Auth0 or, or something like that. And it's almost completely abstracted from WordPress at that point, um, other than going like, yeah, full native application and trying to be really clever about cache management so you don't have everything, yeah, natively blowing up. So based on what you've just said, when is the right time for, with your experience with the large media companies, when is the right time to start looking at headless for a creator company or a media company? Is there a checklist or what's the process behind thinking this might be a good solution? Yeah, I, headless is a funny one. I've got a lot of thoughts on it, on headless in general. Um, I think part of the general sense of, there's a lot of people who are wanting to jump straight into headless for any reason at all. Uh, the simplest site, we can take, let's go build it in a totally decoupled architecture. Um, we've worked over the last two or three years on some like uh, probably sevens and, and, and higher figure projects where we've gone down outside of our recommendation down this headless approach. And the sort of most disheartening thing is when they are so overly engineered, uh, they have such big teams to power these things, to build them, and then you finally get to the launch and they are working worse than a $12 off the shelf theme uh, from a performance perspective. They're buggy, they're, you know, um, they're creating infinite issues in, in AWS and auto scaling and stuff like that. So I don't think no one should ever do headless ever. I think there's a, the sort of pendulum swings of like this is the latest and greatest, everything should be headless. We talk most people out of headless will come to us and say, oh, we need this. And then you'll talk through the reasons why and they're just doing a WordPress site, like, and they think it's faster, and it's like, well, it's nothing to do with how it's rendered, it's the fact that there's 800 different ad tech providers or analytics things that are running, and that's all gonna be on the headless site. So people's motivations sometimes get a bit skewed. Um, I think the main thing when I would say that it makes sense is when you're pulling in multiple data sources and significant amounts of data. Um, if it's like 95% WordPress, it may just be simpler to like bring that data into WordPress and store it there and then push it all out the same way. But if you are genuinely pulling in like a full e-commerce system, a full content system, if WordPress isn't the majority anymore, that makes a lot more sense to go like a, a fully API-driven headless approach. That's my typical sort of thing. That was my other idea of a talk for WordCamp this year, um, was to whinge about headless for half an hour. Um, but that's my, that's my sort of simplified thoughts on, on the headless uh, argument. <laughs> Uh, 
so we talked about sorry <laughs> substack uh, creator economy i'm wondering like how it would look like to migrate a social media creator like somebody from tiktok or uh, somebody who is i have the instagram reel as their core business because um, like the feature is one part uh, like we can have a newsletter glue we can have woocommerce take care of payment but the the thing that i'm struggling with social media platform is the network effect hmm. and even if we improve editorial experience say we we bring something like web stories that google did or some other tool even better media library or media management tiktok like the duet creation anything that we do in wordpress the network effect is something that i cannot get my head around like uh, any ideas any thoughts on that like yeah i think that's why the newsletter the newsletter revolution thing has been happening um because you're never going to be able to recreate the experience of the tiktok experience on a website like or even a you know pwa or like or google stories or whatever else um So I think that's where like Twitter buying review a couple of years ago and now like natively bringing into like the Twitter experience a lot of people have like to subscribe to my newsletter. Most people aren't even using review, they're just using it like to get the email address and then like API push it into whatever other system they're using, Substack or something. Um so I think that the the popularity of the email argument is that you're still getting someone's email address um to try and build that relationship because anyone yeah who builds on a rented garden could have that taken away at any time. Um that's one of the challenges of any platform if they go in a different direction, um you're kind of kind of stuck uh with your whole business model, I guess. Um so it's yeah, I think the people who have been doing that well are trying to create something that's useful or or meaningful to like you know if they're a fashion TikToker or whatever else, how do they bring some kind of good content to a website that they can kind of peel away or shave away some of that audience build some direct relationship some of this never going to happen i don't like i don't think you're going to ever recreate the virality of a tiktok getting like 100 million views in a week or something and getting them all to go to your website and subscribe to the newsletter i don't think it's going to happen but it, you either do nothing or something and i think that's probably the best way to to try and at least own a bit of that audience and have that first party data i think um because i don't think building a social network on wordpress is going to be as exciting as uh using tiktok or instagram or or whatever else one one up the front so, so i've found that wordpress is far superior to say squarespace or wix but if i have a client and all they're doing is selling i've had a lot of issues with woocommerce And sometimes I'll just say use Shopify if that's all you're going to do is sell. Yep. Yeah, I mean, I'm kind of in the same boat like we years ago we sort of thought where where do we want to, like we sort of were just a more general no. We were generalist specialists in WordPress like we just did anything in WordPress like anything that was complex we could figure it out. And e-commerce and and WooCommerce was one of those ones and we ended up working with like a fashion brand in Australia and they used to be like on the homepage of WooCommerce like they were really big WooCommerce site. And I think that experience kind of put me off doing e-commerce like in PHP and MySQL ever again um because it is just it's a there's definitely reasons to do it and people who specialize in it but it's not a what I saw value in doing um and just like you said not having to worry about plugins or issues or the compatibility between things and then that compatibility with the front end and then like you add a Twitter widget and somehow the JavaScript breaks the checkout experience like just that kind of world is for for someone who's doing something really simple to do that and that's kind of the same comparison with these platforms like um uh Substack is incredibly simple like it looks like something I would have made when I was in high school on a weekend like it's just literally two screens of a UI and like a text box like it's really simple but it does do a really good job at like if you just want to write like a newsletter and send it out and not think about anything and you're not sort of having ideas of grandeur of where it needs to go the kind of a fine trade off so i'm more than happy to tell people like you are the rule it out cuz i don't have the budget or even if they think they should spend the money it's like you should probably go simple spend it on building an audience and then maybe come back when you can actually get a return um because spending all your budget on paying us to build something bespoke is not really going to result in any better of an outcome for a business perspective um 
So yeah, I think that's why we always have this leaning to SaaS stuff because it's kind of just all abstracted as a black box. Don't have to worry about it. Don't have to worry about yeah having 500 orders all happen at once and crashing your site. It's all just it's somebody else's problem. I think it's a pretty good value exchange to not have to worry about that. Questions? All right, let's hear it again for Ben. Thank you, Thank you Ben.
Great. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to your final session of day one. How's everyone's day one been so far? Pretty good? Nice. Awesome. Glad to hear it. If you've taken any cool pictures or videos of the event today and you want to share it on social media, if you tag it with hashtag WCUS, it will become part of the official collaborative photo album. And there are QR codes around, too, if you want to check that out. So you're welcome to do that. So our last session of the day is extending WordPress with slot, using Slotfill with Ryan Welcher. Ryan's a regular contributor to Gutenberg with a focus on developing tooling such as the WordPress scripts and WordPress create block packages. As a developer advocate sponsored by Automatic, he works to remove barriers to adoption for developers working with Gutenberg and WordPress. So please give a warm welcome to Ryan Welcher. Thank you. Hey everyone. Well, this thing's working. Perfect. Just gonna get my cool. Uh, cool. So thanks for coming, and I appreciate um, you all coming here. And I'm clearly not Jonathan, so I apologize for that. But uh, I'm glad that I could fill in in his stead. So today we're gonna be talking about extending WordPress with with Slotfill. It's something that I am super passionate about, and I enjoy it, and I talk about it whenever people will let me. So before I do. Just to introduce myself real quickly. My name is Ryan Welcher. I'm a developer advocate sponsored by Automatic, where, as my bio said, I work to remove barriers of adoption for WordPress and Gutenberg. I've been a developer for since about 2004, and I've used WordPress since about 2009, give or take. I'm a regular contributor to the Gutenberg project and to WordPress. So, so what is Slotfill? At a super high level, Slotfill is an extension paradigm that allows developers to add elements to existing UIs in WordPress. <laughs> It's, uh, it, it does so by allowing us to register plugins containing content, or what we're calling fills, to be displayed in a specific location or, or slot somewhere in a UI. Um, items are rendered outside of their element tree, and so this is very similar to React Portals. If you don't know what React Portals is, it doesn't matter, but this is just sort of, it's a similarity. Um, currently there are 12 locations or slots available. Um, a couple of them are experimental, so I probably shouldn't show you, but I'm going to show you them anyways, and uh, well, yeah. And slots are location-based. Uh, so while they differ in implementation, they can be sort of philosophically compared to the uh, actions from the Hooks API, uh, in that they are, they're, they're source order dependent, so they're rendered in the order that you register them, and they're obviously register, or sorry, rendered in a very specific location. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> so let's look at a, a very simple basic slot fill system. So it consists of three components. The first component is called the slot component. And wherever this component is rendered, any fills that are associated with this uh, component will have their content rendered in the slot lo location. Um, the component sets three props. We have the name prop, which is the name of the slot, a fill props object, which is an object of properties that any fills that are, are targeting this slot will have access to. And then we have a bubbles virtually, it's a Boolean that basically changes the event bubbling behavior. Um, yeah. Uh, so this is what a very basic slot would look like. Uh, it's imported from the WordPress components package, and then there's all the props I just talked about. Uh, the fill component is the next part. So this component is used to provide content to a slot. Uh, the, this component can be rendered anywhere inside the UI, even in a completely different or like element tree in React, which is what makes this so, so sort of powerful. Um, it accepts a single prop, and that's name, and that's the name of the slot that this fill targets. This is all gonna make a lot more sense in a minute, I swear. <clears throat> and so the last piece, oh, sorry, here's, a, here's an example of uh, what that code would, would look like. So the last piece of the puzzle is the slot fill provider component. This is the magical glue that connects fills and slots. Basically, it wraps the UI, and its job is to detect any slots and any fills somewhere in its child, or sorry, inside of it or any of its child components, and then move the fill content to the slot location. Um, uh, yeah, and it has no props. So a basic slot fill system kind of works like this. An application or a component is wrapped inside a slot fill provider. A, a name slot is rendered somewhere in there, inside the application. A fill with the same name is rendered somewhere else. And then that fill content is rendered in the associated slot location. So here's a, oh, and here's kind of like a code representation of what that looks like. Um, it's, uh, so does this thing work? Does my little pointer work? We've got the slot fill provider up here, followed by the, my awesome app that I've built, and then inside I'm, I'm rendering a slot, and then later on a fill, and then when that would render, the contents would render in the slot location. This is sort of like another graphical representation. Again, we're wrapping our 
UI inside of a slot fill pr provider. We're exposing a named slot on the right hand side and on the left hand sorry left hand side on the right hand side. We're um, uh, exposing to or sorry we're adding two fills and then the slot fill provider would, would take over and move the fill uh, contents into the slot location in the order in which they've been registered. So <laughs> how does WordPress do it? So everything that, that we've seen and talked about so far is kind of a closed system. All the JavaScript we have access to, we have to build this, this is React, so we need to build, process, all that sort of stuff. Well, as extenders and developers of, of WordPress, how do we get access to this? Because we can't just rebuild the block editor every single time we want to add code to it. So the way that we extend it is um, by using these two new pieces that are introduced by WordPress. The first is a, is a function called, reg called register plugin. And its job is to provide the entry point to the system. And then it accesses this sort of like global list of array, this array of registered plugins. And the second piece is another component called the plugin area component. And its job is to reach into that list of registered plugins and then render them in, in, internally. And, it, and, and then that's how that works. So let's look at the register plugin function. It's part of the uh, WordPress plugins package. It has two parameters. The first is a name, and it has to be, it's a string and it's a name, and it has to be a unique name among all plugins that have been registered. And the second one is a settings object, which has three properties. The first property, render, is the only one that's, that's required, and that's going to refer to a component that will be rendered. And inside of that component, we can have one or more fills. There's icon, which is optional, and it's used to define a visual asset to be associated with this plugin. Some fills will um, inherit an, an icon from your register plugin call, others won't. And then the third is scope, and it's only there for completion sake because we don't use it for anything right now. Um, and in fact, you shouldn't use it. You should never define scope unless you're doing something custom with the plugin area, and I'll talk about that in a second because your, your plugins won't show up. So, oh, and this is a simple example of register plugin. <clears throat> so the plugin area component is sort of the last piece of the puzzle. And like I said, it, it, it renders all the register plugins inside a hidden div, and then it has two props. It has scope, like we just talked about. Um, and uh, any, if you define a scope for a plugin area, then your register plugin calls have to also uh, define that same scope. And then there's an on error function that just handles errors. And so this would be what that looks like. So the WordPress slot fill system is a little bit more complicated, so you just have to bear with me and just trust me that this is kind of how it works. <laughs> but uh, so a slot fill provider wraps the editor provider component. The editor provider component is like a component that gives us a block editor. Inside of it, we've got a layout component where a bunch of slots are exposed. Fills are registered using the plugins API, and then fills are rendered in the hidden div by the plugin area component, and then fill content is rendered in the appropriate place. Uh, this is sort of a pseudo code for how that all looks and feels. And then um, this is a bit of a graphical thing again. So we have our register plugin that adds to the list the plugin area down in the, in the bottom right, um, renders those fills, and then the slot fill provider will take over and render the content in the appropriate slot, wherever that is. So, <coughs> excuse me. So, so far, so far, everything we've seen has been the basic slot the very basic components. So that's not how the slot fills are actually made. They're actually uh, not just simple components, they're named components that usually contain other functionality and have inner components. In this example, um, you can see how the plugin post status info slot fill is structured. And if you notice that the slot is exposed with the fill itself, and that's where we get the name slot fill. I, I'm making that up, I'm assuming that's where we get the name slot fill. Um, yeah, so once that's been, um, built, now we can then ex expose this somewhere in, in, inside of the UI. So this is actually the, what the post, um, in this simplified example of the, the plugin post status info slot is exposed inside the post status component. Now this component is, is where, the, where you see all the stuff about your post. Now I've truncated a bunch of the stuff in there uh, because there's, it wouldn't fit on a slide. So, uh, but just take my word for it that that's how it works. And then, uh, so when we register a fill, we can then import the plugin post status slot fill from the edit post package and then wrap whatever we want to appear inside that, that slot um, in the plugin post status info. And once that renders, it would look a little something like that. I've, oh, I should probably leave these, if you want me to leave the slides up a little longer with, with the code for pictures or whatever, just let me know, I'm happy to do that. Um, cool, so currently there are, like I said, there are 12 slots available. 
Um, so uh, I'm, I'm going to go through them all. <laughs> and uh, so we've already seen the plugin post status in info one in the last slide. So the next one I'll, I'll, I'll talk about is the plugin pre-publish panel. So this one adds a panel to the pre-publish sidebar that, that you get when you hit publish the first time. Um, it takes three props. We have an optional class name. We have a title. The title is what will appear in that panel. If you leave the title off, it, the, the header will not display. And then there's an, an initial open flag that will tell you whether or not the, um, the panel itself is open. And if there's no title provided, it's always open. So the code to render that would look like this. We're just pulling in the appropriate slot fill up here for the pre -publish, the plugin pre-publish panel. I'm going to get sick of saying that by the end of this, for sure. Uh, and then we're just wrapping our, our, our content in here. And then when that renders, it looks like this with my little avocado down there at the bottom. Um, the next one is plugin post publish panel. So this is ex almost exactly the same. It just happens after you've, you've published in that sort of like, hey, yay, you published post is live screen. So you can add it there. Um, the, the props are all the same. Again, we have class name, we have title, and we have a initial open. The code for that looks a bit like this. Um, the only difference between this and the last code slide is the name of the, uh, the um, slot fill. And so that's pretty common when you're working with slot fill because it's so, because it's so location based, you might, I mean, it's exactly the same code under the hood. It's just in a different spot. So there's a bit of a lot of sort of, re, of re, repeating things. Um, yeah. And then some of that renders it, it would look like this. That's my custom panel with the avocado down there. The avocado is a running theme for this. This is a developer advocate. I don't know. Whatever. Uh, next one is plugin more menu item. This renders a menu item in the plugins group in the more menu drop down, which is a, a real hard thing to say, but it's in that three button drop down. And, um, and it can be used as a button or a link depending on, on the props pass. So it, it accepts the H an href prop, and when this is used, it's used as an anchor instead of a button. It supports an icon, um, it supports an on-click, which is just a function that will be run when you click on it. And then the uh, bottom one there, it will take any additional props that you've passed to it, and it will actually trickle them through to the underlying component on, on underneath. That's why I have this sort of spread operator there. <clears throat> so an example here would be, I'm going to add an item that, that links out to the uh, slot fill reference guide on the block editor handbook. And I'm adding target and, and rel, and those are not props that this slot fill supports, so those will be um, trickle down into the, the button, basically the button un underneath, and then we add some text there, and then when that renders, it looks like that. And if you click on that, it'll take you out to the right place. Next one is plugin block settings menu item. These names are fun, so <laughs> you just have to get used to them. Um, it adds a new item in the block settings menu on any allowed block. So this is how you would add something to a specific block in their menu. So it, um, it takes four props. The allowed blocks prop is an array of blocks that this will appear on. If you don't add this, it'll appear across all blocks. There is some logic around selecting multiple blocks and, uh, and whether or not it, 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 uh, it, it displays. I believe if, if you have three blocks selected and one of them is not in the allowed block list, then this won't, will not show up. Um, that's kind of an edge case. Um, then we have, we have icon, we have the label that, that will appear, and then we have the on, the on click again. So this is an example of that. We have the allowed blocks. This is going to add a, add a button to the paragraph block with a very long label. And then when you click on it, it will alert clicked. So the most useless code example I could possibly come up with. Um, and so that's what it looks like. So I've clicked this, this button or here, and this shows up down here. And if I click that, it will alert. Uh, plugin sidebar. I'm sure everyone in the room has seen this. If they're, if they're not sure what it is, you've definitely seen it before. Uh, this renders a sidebar when activated in, in the right hand, top right hand corner by the publish buttons. That, that's where, where you would see this. Um, it, the contents of this fill will show up inside of the uh, sort of sidebar that's, that's opened when you click the button. So this needs a name, which is an, an identifier for this sidebar. Um, we have a class name. We have a title that's, that's displayed at the top of the sidebar. We have an is, is pinnable Boolean that will say whether or not you can actually pin it in, in, in the top there, and we have an icon. So the code looks like this. Uh, I'm giving it a name, a title, and my avocado I icon again, and then a little bit of content. And then when that, when that re uh, renders, it, it, it looks like this. So this is something that I'm sure everyone has seen before. There's tons of plugins. This, I think this was, this was one of the first slots that, that was available. So many, many, many plugins. I think Yoast was one of the first ones to really use it. Um, so yeah. Um, there's plugin sidebar more menu item. This one is, is I think it's a bit old um, because 
This only works with, with the slot filled that I just showed you with the plug-in sidebar. So if you don't, and you get one when you register the plug-in sidebar, what this does is this adds a button to the more menu uh, a dropdown that opens up a sidebar. That's really what it does. So the, the two um, uh, props, it's the target, which is the name of the sidebar, of the plug-in sidebar that you wanna open, and then uh, again, an icon. So in this example, I'm doing both. I'm adding the plugin sidebar down here and giving it a name. And then this is adding the, the button that will target the same name. And then that shows up here. So if I click this, this sidebar will expand. Yeah. Okay. Document setting panel. This is my personal favorite <laughs> of all the slot fills. I guess this is my favorite. It's a weird thing to be, have favorites for, I guess. <laughs> Renders items below the status and ability panel in the document sidebar. So um, this takes a name, a class name, a title that will be displayed, and then again, an icon. Um, the uh, code looks like this. Everything we're doing always in imports from the edit post. I, I, I should mention, and I didn't earlier, but I should mention this, that the slots appear in the package where you find them. So in this case, we're, we're looking at everything in edit post. So that's where all of these slots are exported from in the package. Um, yeah, so when this is rendered, it looks like this. And we have a little component there. So this is the, the experimental one that I'm gonna show you. Um, it's in the block editor handbook, so it's, it's not a secret or anything, but um, I will say, please use this with, with caution. It's experimental. Experimental things can change and break all, all, all the things. Um, but this allows replacing the, uh, the dashboard uh, button to go back out, out of full screen. It has no, no props. The code looks like this. So you can see we're importing the experimental dashboard stuff and, uh, and aliasing it and then rendering this out. And when then, when, sorry, we're adding this full screen closed mode, full screen mode closed button or component. And then when that renders, it looks like this. So I've replaced the WordPress logo with an avocado. And use with caution, please just use with caution. Uh, cool, so there's currently three slots available in the site editor. I'm not gonna put you through going through all of them because they're exactly the same. The only thing you have to do is pull them out of the edit site package instead of the edit post package. Um, yeah, so that's it, more, we need more slots. We don't have enough slots. Well, we can get more slots if you help us get more slots. So if you have <laughs> any use case for a new slot in any lo location, I'd highly, highly recommend and encourage you to go to that link, create an issue and, and, and talk about it because these are the extension points that every developer uses and every, every developer needs and we've only got 12 and compare that with what we used to have back in the classic editor experience when the, you know, something like 8.6 million. Um, yeah, so okay, now I wanna talk about some fun things that you can do with, with slots. Of, wow, I'm really, uh, I'm really motoring here. I'll have to slow down a little bit. Um, yeah, cool. So we're gonna create our own slot fills. So there is a function that will help you do that. You can use this function called create slot fill. And it, it, it takes a, a, um, a parameter of a string. And basically what that's gonna do is return to you a fill um, component and a slot component with matching name uh, property. So it's just, it's just a helper function. So a basic slot fill example would look a bit like this. We're gonna import our uh, create slot fill. We're going to create a slot and a fill with a particular uh, name. And then we create a new component called uh, basic create slot fill. So the best, okay, the best practice here, that, that was totally planned. The best practice here is uh, to name the component the same as what you're naming it up here. It's just the way that is. There's no rhyme or reason to it. That's just what's, what's being done. And then um, it's going to get its children and then we're gonna wrap the children inside of the fill component. And then we just add a dot slot property to our component and add the slot component to it. And then we export it. And that's really all, all you have to do. Uh, oh, sorry, I guess I should have probably gone through it that way. <laughs> and yeah, so for the next bunch of slides, just assume I have a settings screen that is gonna be rendered. So this is how we expose the, the slot. So we've created our slot, we're importing it, and now we're exposing it inside of our settings screen. And then we're gonna register a plugin, um, which is going to use that custom slot that we've made, and it's going to wrap this, um, this, this string, which I don't know why I have it in back text, there's nothing in there, but anyways. And then when that renders, it'll look like this. So this is my settings screen, this is a panel, right? So <laughs> what if we have fill props? So fill props are, can be, um, any slot can use them and they can be pretty powerful. So if you like, you know, this isn't much of an example, but what if you say, had, you know, if you were localizing some data that was like the user data and you wanted to say, hello user, and then you wanted all of your, 
your, your fills to, to reference that. It's, maybe that's a bad example, but that's the one I'm going with. And then, uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to use the same slot fill, or the slot, and then add some fill props. And then in our, in our um, inside of our register plugin call, we're going to create this function because this, the props get passed to the, the contents of this. So you get a function that has props and then you can say props.message. And when that renders, it'll look like this. Hello, my, or message, hello slots. Um, you can customize the fill structure. So with this particular one, the fills are all gonna be wrapped in a button. Um, and uh, yeah, and so again, this is my settings screen. This is all very much the same. It's just the name of the slot that, that's uh, changing. Um, and then when we register our plugin, we can use multiple instances of, of the slot fill to create multiple buttons. So in, in here I have three buttons, and then when this renders, it's going to render me three buttons. So this, is, this can be very powerful if you want to control um, what goes in a slot fill. Like for example, the document setting panel one, it's wrapped inside of a panel in the panel body. So you just put the content in, you don't have to worry about it styling it properly and getting the appropriate components in there. Uh, custom slot structure, so we can we can customize the the slot. So the slot will wrap all of the fills. And so in this case, I, I'm I'm um, what I'm doing here is, again, we're getting all the fills passed to our function, and we're just checking the length of it's there. We're going to wrap all the fills in a code block, and then otherwise just return null, so it doesn't return anything. And then when I use it, I just expose the slot as normal, and then this will be rendered inside of a code tag. And then when it renders, it's rendered inside of a code tag. So. Um, yeah, uh, so we can customize both slot and fill. This is a really trivial example, but in our fill, we're wrapping everything in an LI, and in our slot, we're, we're, we're wrapping it in a UL. So we're building out a un unordered list, which is <laughs> kind of silly again, but you can see how combining these would could be very, very powerful if you're building out a very that you need to deal with. Oh. Oh, my Hello, check, here we go. Um, yeah, and so, okay, so we're, we're ex exposing our slot again, and then um, we're using the uh, custom slot fill to create these list items, and then when it renders, it renders like a list. So, yeah. Uh, okay, cool, so this is a fun one that I did. This is a slot fill outside of the editor, and so what I, what I, I did this a little while ago, um, and it was, it's a, it's a dashboard widget that uses slot fill. And so we're gonna, I'm just, just gonna take you through it. So the first thing that we do is we're just gonna register a, a dashboard widget the way that we normally would. Here, the only th out th thing I, I'm outputting is just a div with an ID that I, I can target uh, with React. Um, then I create a custom slot fill. Again, it's a very simple one. Um, some extraneous markup in there apparently. And then, uh, uh, yeah, so when that's done, then I add the slot fill system to the widget. And I do that by creating my dashboard widget. So you see I'm taking the slot fill provider and wrapping the whole thing. I'm adding a little bit of markup in here. It's just a title and then I'm exposing, exposing the slot and then I'm creating a, a custom plugin area with the scope of dashboard. This can be rendered anywhere. You, you don't see it. It can be rendered at the top of the app, the bottom of the app, as long as it's inside slot provider, it doesn't matter. And then just down here, I'm, I, I'm using um, React to render this to the dashboard widget. So I should note though, I'm, I'm only using WordPress packages. The WordPress slash element package is a wrapper for React. So I pulled render from that package. I'm not using like a different version of React or anything. This is all straight out of WordPress. And then <clears throat> once that's in place, I, I can register a plugin. And then I uh, am, am scoping it to my custom one. And uh, this is my Is, that's my favorite GIF on, on the internet. It starts out with like, oh, what are you showing me? And then it becomes, okay, uh, cool. Uh, okay, and so at the end of all this, if you, there may not be a slot available for you. You may not be able to extend the thing that you want to extend. So what you could try is you could try actual React portals. And I, I wanted to show this code by George uh, Mamadashvili, who I think he's sponsored by GoDaddy, and he is super duper smart, and he, he okayed me to use this. He's Mamaduka all over the place. But this is an example of using React Portal to add that little smiley button into the editor. So it's super, super cool. I just wanted to, sh to share that. And uh, oh, if you want to steal all the code or any of the code, from this, anything you, you've seen is in my repo, so that's the link and that's a QR code to get there. Um, feel free, grab it and re and review it and tell me how horrible I am at, uh, at writing code. So I'll, I'll leave that up for a couple of minutes, or a couple of seconds, I should say. So.
Let's get a good grab a drink of water, looks like. All right, everyone got it? We're good? If it doesn't work for you, come get me and I'll just I'll email you the link or something. Or snail mail it to you. I don't know. I'll figure something out to get it to you. Cool. And so that's it for me. So um, thank you. And if you're looking to find me, you can find me as Ryan Welcher Codes on Twitch, YouTube, and Discord. I'm at Ryan Welcher on the Twitters and in most Slack channels as Welcher, Ryan Welcher, Welcher Ryan, variations of my two names. Um, yeah, so any questions? Happy to try to answer them. Um, in slot fills, the example I actually made a couple of fills and I was interested on your thoughts in ordering them because if they return null, yeah, they move to the bottom next time they rent return something. So, do you have any thoughts on ordering? I do. I have. I have. I have a lot of thoughts on ordering. Um, I have a PR that actually orders them um, that I started a couple years ago. <laughs> that I would love to get in place. It's uh, um, because I don't. I think source order personally is an atrocious way to handle uh, controlling how your code runs, right? It, it's like back in the day of like procedural, like I, I used to write a lot of flash code. I don't know if anybody else wrote flash code, but it was like you write that the stuff at the top of the page ran before the stuff at the bottom of the page. And that's, that's just not, a, not, a, not an efficient way of doing it. So there are some discussions around it because I, the, yeah, so, so that doesn't an answer your question, but I feel strongly about being able to order them. Um, yeah, unfortunately. So, <laughs> anyone else? Oh, cool. Yes, it's it is it is, and it's it's it wasn't. I didn't get any pushback on the concept of it. It was more around the implementation of it, and I think it was just more of a question of like, well, should, we should give users the ability to to manage the order before developers can. You know what I mean? So like, if you read, well, it's it's sort of like being able to like. So let's use the example of the. Um, of the document setting sidebar, right? So we've got stat we've got all those panels, and, and you can't order them. In the classic experience, you could set that order based on user preferences. So I understand that's maybe where we want to go with it, um, but I have to I gotta light a fire under somebody, probably me. So anyway, sorry, Adam, go ahead. Okay, cool. So um, a couple questions. I'm gonna combine them all into one. Yeah. So the first part, the the last thing you showed, the portal uh, mm -hmm. implementation. Does that mean that uh, like we can literally put slot fills anywhere we want in the editor? Well, not slot around? fills. Specifically, not slot fills. Right, but portals. You can technically, if you can figure out the way of getting it, like finding the right classes and all that stuff, and making sure that it, the class actually exists and all that. Yeah, it's it it is technically possible. I think there's a there's a certain plugin by Google who might know about this that did that with something, uh, an AMP, AMP plugin? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so it is possible. It's going to be a hack, but much like the way uh, you know, actions and hooks were kind of in the classic experience, experience of enough people hack it in a certain way, we usually end up with a hook for it. So mm -hmm. maybe, that's, maybe that's one approach to getting things in, kind of a gorilla approach. Anyways, you should give so, more. So the other question is about um, removing things from the editor. So currently, uh, it's easy to add things in slots, but there's really no way other than like CSS hiding to remove elements. Um, Ye well, yes and no. There is, but you have to know the name. You have to know some things about it. So my question, though, is do you think there's an approach where we could be registering core elements with slots, and, and then you could just unregister them the yeah. way that we hook things in in core? I, I think so. Like, there are, there are internal slots used, as you probably know. So like, if you're building uh, blocks, if, it, if you've ever used inspector controls or advanced inspector con controls inside of your blocks, that's actually a slot fill. So there's a bunch of internal slot fills that are being used. but you can you can unregister a plugin, for example, but you unregister everything to do with that plugin. You can't. There's no way to like. So let's say that you have a plugin and you register four things and you want to get rid of the third yeah. thing. Can't do it. You can't. You can't get access to it in that regards. You you can get a list of registered plugins and you can you can unregister the plugin that you want to get rid of, but it gets rid of everything. It's a, it's kind of a sledgehammer approach to so it. Not on a per slot. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. You can't do that, unfortunately. Thank you very much for this. There was one um, piece of code, the, the beginning, and it shows up throughout your little avocado in the slides mm. around yeah. the custom icon. And yeah. that's something where I've been a little stymied in the past by the documentation around how to get a custom icon. Mm -hmm. Is that something that, like, is that a sort of a known documentation deficiency or am I just looking in the wrong place? Um, that's a good question. 
I think in the sense of what I was doing with the custom SVG, it's probably a bit of a known, it's probably a bit of a documentation issue. It will work. Um, the way that I did it, and I can show you the code, is I, I, there's this awesome tool online where I took an actual image and dropped it in and turned it into React components. I'm actually rendering it in that way. I'm not, it's not a true SVG where I have to like get it into Webpack and all, all that stuff, or it's not, it is a true SVG, but it's not that. So yeah, it's, I think it's a bit of a documentation thing. Hi there, thanks for this. Um, no I'm not a developer, so I hope this question is relevant, but if we get out. were just, adding- just get out. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> um, if we, if, so if we're adding additional uh, options within the editor for some kind of control, are the options available through the WordPress API if we have a headless site on the front end? Through slot fill? Yes. Uh, no because this is strictly for the UI of Gutenberg. So it, yeah, there's no, there's no data layer available for what we're, what we're talking about here. As far as I know, I don't believe there is. I mean, there is for blocks. You can get stuff for blocks. You can get stuff for many things, but no, no, this is strictly for the UI. Yeah. Now, if, if for example, you're a slot fill introduced to means to say add a, a custom post type, you could get the data from that, but you can't, couldn't get the actual slot um, and it wouldn't be any, it wouldn't be any good unless you were like it wouldn't be any any good to you. You can get the list of all the registered plugins, but unless you're doing this with it, it's not much use to you. It's a good question though. It's a great question. Hi, with uh, the UI modification, can you modify what you store in the blocks per se? Not what you store, but you could. So there are slots, like I said, there are slot fills available in uh, it, um, in the block API, like inspector controls, events inspector controls, things like that. If you can add, you can add your own to your own custom blocks and let, have people use that. And then, but it, unless it's setting attributes for, for your block or doing some other side effect, like setting meta or whatever it is, it won't really affect the block itself. It's, it's quite literally just used for UI elements inside the block editor or the site editor or whatever editor you're, you're in that actually has uh, slot fills enabled. So. Any other questions? All right, let's hear it for Ryan. Thank you. Thank you.